the COVID-19 public health emergency, members can participate to, in today's hearing either in person or remotely versus, via online video conferencing. In accordance with the updated guidance issued by the attending physician, members, staff, and members of the pre uh, press present in the hearing room are not required to wear a mask. For members participating remotely, your microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphone every time you wish to speak. But note, once you unmute your microphone, anything that is said in WebEx will be heard over the loudspeakers in the committee room and subject to be heard by the live stream and C-SPAN. Because members may be participating from different locations at today's hearing, all recognition of members, like for questions, will be in the order of subcommittee seniority. Documents for the record can be sent to Austin Flack at the email address we've provided to staff, and all documents will be entered into evidence at the end of the hearing. The chair will now recognize herself for an opening statement. Americans today are facing extraordinarily high gas prices at the pump. The average price of a gallon of regular gasoline one year ago was under $3. Today, the average is over $4 a gallon, and in some places, it's nearly $6 a gallon. These prices are straining our constituents' budgets and their patients. Today, we will hear from the heads of some of our nation's largest oil companies, companies that are making record profits, which will hopefully shed some light on why Americans are paying record high prices for gasoline and what they can do to bring those prices down as quickly as possible. Now, this committee understands it's a complicated issue. It's often stated that oil is a global commodity and its price is determined by the global marketplace. Surely we don't dispute that. But the price of oil alone is not what is alarming most of us on this panel. It's the price at the pump. When Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine began on February 24th, the cost for a barrel of oil was $102, and the price that Americans were paying at the pump was $3.70 a gallon. But today, the price of oil is again back to $102, but for some reason, Americans are now paying $4.20 for a gallon of gas. This chart shows the recent disconnect between the price that companies are paying for oil and the price that American consumers are paying at the pump. It shows that as Russia's invasion of Ukraine began, both the price of oil and the price at the pump began to rise. But it shows that on or around March 7th, the price of oil peaked at, at nearly $130 a barrel, while the price of gas hit $4.20 a gallon. But then it, shows, then it shows that while the price of oil has dropped significantly from the peak, the price that Americans are paying at the pump has not. And this is what I want to know from our witnesses today. Why? We understand that oil is a global commodity whose price is determined by the global marketplace. We understand that the COVID-19 pandemic threw that global marketplace into disarray. And we understand that Vladimir Putin's senseless, vicious invasion of Ukraine has further reduced the world's oil supply as more and more companies are unwilling to buy Russian oil, and rightly so. But here's the thing. If the price of gas is driven by the global market, why is the price of oil coming down, but the price at the pump is still near record highs? If it's an issue of supply and demand, wouldn't that be reflected in the global price of oil as well? Something just doesn't add up. Some of our witnesses today have stated publicly that their focus is not on helping American families or on fueling America's economy. It's enriching their shareholders. It's that type of focus that led these six companies alone to collectively report over $75 billion in profits last year. When oil companies are honest about why they haven't increased the supply of oil, they say it's pressure from their shareholders, not government regulation that's holding them back. And one of our witnesses today even told the media that it, that it wouldn't matter 
if a crude were as high as $200 a barrel, they just simply weren't going to produce more than they already planned to. But you know something? It's not just about the shareholders. The American people who we represent provide the industry with more than $30 billion a year in subsidies, while the oil and gas companies report record high profits, and while American families are forced to pay record high prices at the pump. Frankly, this committee is not going to sit back and allow this system, which forces American taxpayers to pay oil companies out of both pockets, first at the pump and then through tax breaks to continue in its current form. The Biden administration announced last week it's taking several substantial steps to help alleviate the price that Americans are being forced to pay at the pump, including by releasing a million, up to a million barrels of oil per day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And now it's time for Congress to do whatever it can to help alleviate the pain that too many Americans are feeling at the pump. If this crisis has showed us anything, it's why we as a country must work to break our addiction to oil as quickly as possible. And it's reinforced the urgent and existential need to transition to a more sustainable energy future for the sake of our economy, our environment, and our national security. We must work as quickly as possible to go to that clean energy future. I do want to thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I now want to invite them to be part of the solution to lower gas prices and now. With that, I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair DeGette, for holding this hearing. I believe surging energy prices and their impact on American wallets is an important topic for this subcommittee but the majority is laying the blame for the problem at the wrong feet. When President Biden points to Vladimir Putin or big oil or other scapegoats as the culprit, I'm reminded of the words of the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to that man standing behind the curtain. Rather than deflect blame, President Biden should consider his own culpability for higher energy prices thanks to his relentless pursuit of policies that discourage domestic energy production, driving gas prices up to levels not seen since Mr. Biden was vice president. Over the past few decades, innovative and responsible development of the American resources yielded a reliable, affordable, secure domestic energy supply. This supply drew on all the resources of our country, oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydropower, and renewables. Unfortunately, today we face an entirely different landscape. Since President Biden took office, the prices of crude oil and many other energy commodities have risen to the highest level in more than a decade. As a direct result of President Biden's anti-American energy agenda, prices have rapidly risen for more than a year. On day one, the administration made clear that it would do all that it could to shut down America's energy production by canceling the Keystone XL pipeline. Later, the president imposed a moratorium on fossil energy development on, on federal lands and increased pressure from financial regulators to halt fossil fuel investments and he has no plans of stopping his assault on the energy industry. Even while gas prices skyrocket and allied countries cry out for new energy sources, President Biden continues to announce new taxes and initiatives that are designed to shut down domestic production. One of the first actions of the Biden administration was a ban on new oil and gas leases on public lands or in offshore waters, signaling a desire to restrict growth of domestic energy or oil production and did so almost immediately. The administration made it clear that federal acreage is not open for business. It is impossible to generate confidence or investment in production today when future production is clearly being blocked by this administration. President Biden's rush to green agenda involved, in, involves a whole of government approach that advises multiple federal agencies to play some part and making it more difficult for oil and gas production. For example, the administration has pressured companies to halt investments in fossil fuels. There is no denying the fact that the Biden administration has promoted an increasingly complex and challenging regulatory environment for energy companies. While President Biden should have been working to encourage domestic energy production, he went to OPEC to ask for more oil. Since that failed, the administration is reportedly considering lifting sanctions so the anti-American regimes in Iran 
and Venezuela can increase their production. It has become painfully clear that, the pre that President Biden's anti-American energy policies emboldened Putin, and in my opinion, helped to invite the attack on Ukraine. The words and deeds of the White House expose a fundamental misunderstanding of the operations of an industry it seeks to dissolve. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Biden stressed the short-term need to increase oil and natural gas output and expedite liquefied natural gas, LNG, project development. The oil and gas industry does not operate well on short-term proposals, however. Due to the nature of the industry, companies like the ones before us today need long-term certainty. A temporary green light to produce oil from the Biden administration will not undo the damage and the layers of red tape and aggressive anti-fossil fuel policies driving gas prices to new highs. Given the interconnection of the global economy, depressing U.S. energy production also affects our trading partners. Thus, Biden's restrictions in the U.S. forced our allies to depend on Russia and other dictators to power their economies. We need to look for ways to increase our domestic production and export capacity, such as increasing our LNG exports to help our allies break free from Russia. We need energy policy that promotes energy security, while also taking advantage of America's abundant, reliable, and affordable energy resources. In a time when it has never been so expensive before to live in America, we need real solutions to disperse the geopolitical shock and provide certainty to the global market. With that, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. I look forward to discussing the current barriers the oil and gas industry face and gaining your insights into suggested regulatory or legislative actions we need to take to restore American energy. Thank you. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Let me thank uh, Chairwoman DeGette. I don't think that we could have a more important hearing than the one that you're chairing today. And we're here to get answers from the big oil companies about why they're ripping off the American people. At a time of record profits, big oil is refusing to increase production to provide the American people some much needed relief at the gas pump. Instead, they're buying back their stock at an estimated cost of about $40 billion this year. Big oil is lining their pockets with one hand and taking billions in taxpayer subsidies with the other. Meanwhile, the American people are getting ripped off as these companies choose to keep production low so that their own profits stay high. The American people are understandably fed up with these prices, and we're here today to demand answers from Big Oil about when they will finally start providing the American people some relief. As oil prices rise and Americans are hurting, the six oil companies testifying today made more than $75 billion in profits between them last year. It's also likely these companies will make an even more money this year. In fact, on Monday, Exxon announced that its first quarter profits may be more than $9 billion. That's higher than last year's first quarter profits of $8.8 .8 billion. And all these profits while Americans are getting taken for a ride at the gas pump. Even in the face of a devastating war in Ukraine and a bipartisan agreement to ban the import of Russian oil, several of the companies testifying today told their shareholders that they would rather make money off high prices in the market than invest in additional oil production. If these companies really wanted to do something about high gas prices, they would put their profits to work by increasing supply. Right now, the oil and gas industry has more than 9,000 approved but unused drilling permits, and they should focus on using them. The problem is not a shortage of permits or land. Big oil is choosing to keep supply low, prices high, and their pockets lined with the hard-earned dollars of struggling American consumers. And the game big oil is playing is unfortunately nothing new. For decades, American consumers have been subject to the whims of global petro dictators and the oil companies that benefited from doing business with them. Foreign adversaries like Russia's Putin can make prices unpredictable and unstable, and big oil is profiteering from our continued reliance on this volatile global commodity. Now, Republicans continue to push the same old oil above all policies, ignoring that these policies have led us to greater dependence on this volatile commodity. And where has all this gotten us? The United States now produces more oil and gas than any other country in the world, but Americans are still subject to the actions of the big oil companies. 
And Democrats have a different plan. We're focused on actually reducing costs for American consumers at the pump. And today, we also demand, or we're also involved in enacting 21st century all of the above policies that will give consumers real options, not just a 1970s choice between oil, diesel, and gas. The best way to protect Americans from oil price spikes is to curb our dependence on oil and transition to renewable energy, which is more stable, affordable, and generated right here at home. So Democrats have worked hard to bring real energy security to the American people. We've devoted billions of dollars to the weatherization assistance program to reduce energy costs for homeowners and the low-income home energy assistance program to offset rising energy costs. We've invested in electric vehicles to give consumers a choice and make high gas prices a thing of the past. And just last week, as, as mentioned by Chairwoman Degette, President Biden announced an unprecedented release of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to help drive down prices for American consumers. So we've done our part, or we're doing our part, to try to produce or have more oil available on the marketplace. But now it's time for big oil to take some action to reduce the pain at the gas pump. Produce more oil. Produce more with the wells you have, the 9,000 permits that uh, you're not using. I look forward to hearing from each of the witnesses today about how their companies can help the American people instead of lining their own pockets. And I certainly don't want to hear from any of them that that's not our responsibility. You know, we're, we're just companies trying to make a buck. If anybody says that to me, I'm going to say that's, you know, that's unbelievable if that's your attitude here today. You can make a difference, whether it's more production or somehow, you know, reducing prices, your wholesale prices. I don't want to hear uh, that, you know, we only do the wholesale prices. This is all done at the retail level. It's a lot of garbage. The bottom line is you set the, the wholesale price, and that's the biggest part of the real to retail price. So don't tell us that you can't do anything about it. You can do something about it, and we expect to, you to do that. Maybe it's a matter of patriotism. I don't know what to call it but something must be done on your part. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to be very clear with the American people. This hearing is a deliberate distraction. We're not convened to address the pain you've been feeling at the pump for more than a year. If that were the case, Energy Secretary Granholm would be here to discuss how we can work together to flip the switch on domestic American energy to drive down the high cost of gas prices. Today is purely political. President Biden needs cover for his war on American energy that has caused gas prices to skyrocket. First, the administration tried blaming Putin. They called it the, the Putin price hike. But anyone who's been filling up their tank since last January knows this is not true. The average gas price when President Biden took office was $2.38. And it climbed over a dollar a gallon well before the invasion. And the American people are too smart and have not fallen for this. So the blame is shifting to the industry. This isn't a new tactic. Just last year, Energy and Commerce Democrats held a price gouging hearing to blame the increased prices Americans are facing across the board on corporate greed. Another deliberate attempt to deflect from the negative effect of the Biden administration's policies and their own record spending. The American people didn't buy it then and they're not buying it now. President Biden and the majority Democrats should accept responsibility. This is not the Putin price hike or the result of companies suddenly deciding to make money in 2022. This is the Biden price hike, and it's been a steady climb since he took office. Energy is foundational to life. When energy prices go up, so does everything else and every part of our lives. Thanks to President Biden's skyrocketing energy prices, Americans are suffering across the board for everyday expenses. Why isn't this administration reversing course? High gas prices are a feature of this administration's policies, not a bug. President Biden seems to want high gas prices for Americans to feel pain every time they fill up their tanks. Democrats have never made driving down gas prices a priority. Why? Because they want to usher in a green revolution. If you're wondering what life is going to look like under the Green New Deal, you're getting a small taste of it now. It's not reality, and it's not something that people can afford. 
Oil and gas are going to be needed for decades to come. Instead of accepting this reality, they continue to shut down American energy. Sadly, this should not come as a surprise. In March 2020, candidate Joe Biden said, quote, no more subsidies for fossil fuel industry, no more drilling on federal lands, no more drilling, including offshore, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. President Biden put, a place, and put in place a moratorium on new drilling. In May 2020, candidate Joe Biden pledged to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. He delivered on day one. And there are countless other examples of this administration's war on domestic American energy. This radical agenda is hurting our national security. Not only will the Democrats rush to green force America to be reliant on China, it also weakens our geopolitical leadership. We must return to the pre-Biden days of energy independence. We must lead the world in energy production to help our allies encounter our adversaries. Instead of ramping up production here, President Biden has begged OPEC and Russia to drill more oil, considered lifting sanctions on the brutal Maduro regime, wants to reinstate the Iran nuclear deal, told suffering Americans to buy an electric vehicle, and depleted our strategic petroleum reserves. Republicans are focused on solutions to drive down gas prices. I'm co-leading the American Energy from Russia Act to flip the switch on American energy and unleash production. This legislation would remove barriers to LNG exports and unlock America's energy potential by requiring leasing and permitting of energy and mineral development on federal lands and waters. It would also immediately approve the Keystone XL pipeline, force the DOE secretary to have a plan to increase domestic production before allowing any more non-emergency SPR withdrawals. We must also build energy infrastructure in America, like pipe pipelines and LNG export facilities. We need to focus on domestic mining and critical minerals production. That's how we secure our energy future, guard against foreign dictators, and bring prosperity and optimism to America. America's Americans need relief, and we stand ready to deliver results. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, now ask unanimous consent that the members' written, op written opening statements will be made part of the record and without objection, so ordered. I now would like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing, who unfortunately will be appearing remotely. Mr. David Lawler, the Chairman and President, VP America, Inc., Mr. Michael Worth, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Chevron Corporation. Mr. Richard Muncrief, President and Chief Executive Officer, Devon Energy Corporation. Mr. Darren Woods, Chief Executive Officer, ExxonMobil Corporation. And Mr. Scott Sheffield, Chief Executive Officer, Pioneer Natural Resources Committee, co Company. And Ms. Gretchen Watchins, President, Shell USA, Inc. Lieutenant General H. R. McMaster, Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution, Stanford University. And I do want to thank all of the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee today. All of you know the committee's holding an investigative hearing, and when doing so, we have the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do any of you have objections to testifying under oath? Please state yes or no. 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 Let the record... No. Let the record reflect the witnesses have responded no. The chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be accompanied by counsel. Do any of you desire to be accompanied by counsel during your testimony today? Please unmute and state for the record. No. No, Chairwoman. No. No. By the way, I can, no. I can see all of you on our screen here, so that's good. So now I'm going to swear you in. And so if you would, please raise your right hand so that you may be sworn in. Do you swear the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please unmute and state. I do. I do. I do. I do. 
Let the record reflect the witnesses have responded affirmatively, and you're now under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. And at this time, the chair will recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. Before we begin, I want to make wit the witnesses know that there's a timer on your screen that will count down your remaining time. Mr. Lawler, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Pallone, Chairwoman DeGette, Ranking Member McMorris-Rogers, Ranking Member Griffith, and members of the committee. My name is David Lawler. I am the Chairman and President of BP America and a resident of Denver, Colorado. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate the committee's attention to the hardships that families and businesses are feeling due to the rising cost of energy. We share these concerns. We are committed to continuing to help meet America's near-term energy needs while also continuing to transition BP to a low carbon future. BP has a 150 year history in the United States. We employ more than 12,000 people here and maintain a larger presence in the US than in any other country. Before continuing with my testimony, I want to acknowledge the crisis in Ukraine. We are witnessing an act of aggression by Russia that is having tragic humanitarian consequences for the region. Our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine and all of those impacted by this crisis. BP will continue to support those affected in Ukraine and the wider region. At the same time, we are helping ensure that the energy supply remains secure. Given that Russian oil and gas is deeply integrated into Europe's energy system, the price of oil, gasoline, and other refined products are driven by international markets. Energy markets are complex and global in nature. That means that products like refined fuel reach in consumers through several different We aim to be net zero across our operations, production, and sales by 2050 or sooner. BP also set several near-term targets and aims along our path to reach net zero by mid-century. And BP is in action toward this transformation. In 2021, we invested $2.2 billion in low carbon energy sources, up from 750 million in 2019. Globally, over the past two years, our pipeline for renewables increased more than four times, from 6 gigawatts to 24.5 gigawatts. We plan to continue investing in low-carbon energy sources in the years ahead. By the end of the decade, we aim to invest 4 to $6 billion per year. This means roughly a third of our capital expenditures will be in low-carbon energy. A large portion of these low carbon investments are being made in the United States. This includes a $1.1 billion initial investment in a partnership in Equinor's two wind leases located off the coast of New York and Massachusetts. Between them, we aim to develop 4.4 gigawatts of low carbon energy. That's enough to power more than 2 million homes each year. BP aims to steadily increase our investment in low carbon energy while continuing to invest in resilient hydrocarbons here in the United States. BP's Gulf of Mexico business exemplifies this approach. In the Gulf, we're producing some of BP's highest value energy anywhere in the world. This year, BP aims to safely start up Argos, a fifth production platform that will increase our production in the region by 25%. Our U.S. onshore oil and gas operations, BPX Energy, a business that I lead, is driving down emissions while safely producing oil and gas in Texas and Louisiana. 
BPX plans to spend more than $1 billion to install a state-of-the-art infrastructure network that will significantly reduce emissions from our U.S. onshore operations through electrification. In uncertain times, one of BP's primary roles is to maintain the safe, secure supply of the energy on which societies depend. The importance of this role has rarely been clearer than in recent weeks. At the same time, BP will pursue our emissions targets and aims while continuing to increase our supply of energy from low carbon sources. Thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Worth for five minutes. Chairs to get and Pallone, ranking members Griffith and McMorris Rogers, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Mike Worth, and I'm the chairman and CEO of Chevron. We're living through a critical and unprecedented moment in history. Over the last six weeks, we've watched the events in Ukraine with grave and growing concern. Russians at, Russia's actions have cost many lives and displaced millions of people from their homes. The senseless violence and loss of life are heartbreaking. We appreciate the efforts of leaders across the globe to find a path to end the hostilities, and we support a prompt and just diplomatic resolution. In addition to the toll on human life, the crisis has also led to a surge in commodity prices, particularly with respect to energy. that is affecting people around the world, including here in the United States. This has added to the tremendous pressures that our economy and citizens were already experiencing from a global pandemic. At Chevron, we understand the hardship that rising energy costs have posed for so many Americans. From higher prices at the pump to increased rates for natural gas, heating, and electricity. And as the global landscape continues to evolve, we're focused on doing our part to provide Americans with access to affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy. I also want to be very clear about where Chevron stands. We do not control the market price of crude oil or natural gas, nor of refined products like gasoline and diesel fuel. And we have no tolerance for price gouging. In his remarks last week about the release of supplies from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, President Biden stressed the critical role that companies like ours have to play in increasing domestic supply of oil and gas. At Chevron, we're committed to doing our part to contribute to this goal. We're pursuing the responsible development of oil and gas while also investing to advance a lower carbon future. We're answering the call for strong domestic energy supply by focusing on Chevron's core strategy, leveraging our strengths to deliver lower carbon energy to a growing world. Chevron has already committed to increase our capital spending this year by more than 60% compared to 2021, with approximately half of that increase going to oil and gas production and the other half to renewable fuels and lower carbon energy. This is expected to grow our production in the Permian Basin here in the United States from 600,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day last year to over 1 million barrels per day by 2025. As we make these investments, Chevron is focused on innovating to meet the energy demands of today and tomorrow. We're increasing American energy production and we're also producing energy that is ever cleaner. That's why we've committed $10 billion between now and 2028 to lower the carbon intensity of the energy we supply. We also remain mindful that energy security is national security and that maintaining American leadership is important for the world. We intend to continue working with Congress, the Biden administration, and the whole of government to achieve our shared goal of delivering affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy to American consumers. Recent events underscored the importance of our industry working collaboratively with policymakers on these critical issues. Whether it's accelerating programs for new energy exploration or streamlining the permitting process for the development of critical energy infrastructure, we believe there are a number of policy steps that could bolster American energy supply 
and place us on sounder footing for the future. I look forward to a continued dialogue on these important issues. I've been truly inspired by the American people to respond to today's challenges with extraordinary resilience. And I'm optimistic about all that Chevron is doing to meet the world's needs for affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Moncrief for five minutes. Chair DeGette, Pallone, Ranking Member Griffith, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the current state and importance of U.S. energy production before you today. I'm Rick Moncrief, CEO of Devon Energy. We are at a moment of crisis given Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Devon Energy is an independent exploration and production company headquartered in Oklahoma City. Founded in 1971, Devon employs more than 1,600 hardworking people with operations in Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Wyoming, and North Dakota. In January of 2021, we completed a merger with WPX Energy and are proudly producing more American-made oil and energy today than at any time in our 50-year company history. Devon is an upstream company. We find and produce oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids. We do not refine or sell refined products. We invest heavily to recover these resources and then contract to sell them at prices dictated by a complex global commodity market. We do not set or have significant influence over the price of our products. Multiple factors impact the price of any global commodity, and over the past two years, we have seen extreme volatility. As the COVID pandemic all but shut down global economies, demand for our products decreased drastically, and the market price for crude oil plummeted. In fact, in April of 2020, crude oil futures actually went to a negative $37 a barrel. As economies began reopening, markets adjusted, and we at Devon adjusted and began increasing production again. The events in Ukraine have now added upward pressure in the markets. Overseeing prices level off, uncertainty still continues, which creates volatility. And I don't believe we're out of the woods yet. The shifting to our operations, Devon operates on private, state, federal, and Indian leases, and must follow numerous stringent uh, permitting processes before we can begin production. One of the permits we must obtain is an APD, or an application for permit to drill. The APD only covers the drilling and completion activity that will be done on the lease itself. We also must obtain additional permits for rights of ways for pipelines, roads, water disposal, electricity systems, and a host of other activities that will occur off the lease. Under normal circumstances, in the Delaware Basin, our practice is to plan on getting from APD to drilling in five to six weeks if there are no infrastructure or permit issues to slow progress. Additionally, the process to drill and complete a well and bring it to full production may mean that a significant number of weeks transpire before a well reaches its full potential. Now with the significant delays due to global supply chain constraints and quite honestly a shortage of workers, the time is substantially increased and is now closer to six months. Even with these challenges, Devon's net domestic oil production increased to a new record high in 2021, reaching an average of nearly 300,000 barrels of oil produced each day, making us one of the largest oil producers in the U.S. Now, to build upon this momentum in 2022, our plan is to increase the rig count from 14 that we had in 2021 to, to 19 today, which is where we're at, representing an investment of approximately $2 billion. This level of activity is expected to bring more than 300 new producing wells online and bolster our productive capacity. I can assure you that at Devon, we are pragmatically investing in our business for the long haul, and we have an, a responsibility to more than 660,000 shareholder owners to be prudent and thoughtful. As a publicly traded company, a significant component of Devon's owners consists of pensions that represent government employees, teachers, police, firefighters, and nonprofit organizations. We're also owned by many hardworking individuals through their retirement plans or brokerage accounts. Like other sectors in the market, our shareholders expect us to operate in a way that delivers a return on capital invested 
while providing additional value in the form of cash returns. We're focused on achieving these objectives while pursue, pursuing environmental and operational excellence, including strong targets to reduce our carbon footprint. What's required now is a thoughtful, collaborative dialogue between policymakers and the oil and gas industry, pragmatic solutions that ensure our nation's energy security and leadership in the global marketplace must be fostered by clear and consistent regulatory policies. We know that oil and gas will remain a critical energy source for decades to come, and Devon is proud to produce it safely, responsibly, and with care for the environment and our stakeholders. Thank you again for the invitation to address the committee and further this most important discussion. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Woods for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman DeGette, Ranking Member Griffith, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and members of the committee. I'm Darren Woods, Chairman and CEO of ExxonMobil. I welcome the opportunity today to discuss fuel pricing with the community. But first, speaking on behalf of all of ExxonMobil, I want to emphasize that we stand with communities around the world in deploring Russia's aggression and the devastation it has inflicted on the people of Ukraine. Within days of the invasion, we started work to exit the Salkin One project. We've operated in Russia's Far East since 2003 and announced that we would make no new investments in Russia. Here in the United States, the impact of the invasion is also being felt. American families are paying more at the pump, increasing the cost of living that is already rising as a result of inflation. Even before the invasion, of Ukraine as the world emerged from the pandemic, we were seeing a growing imbalance in glo uh, global oil and gas markets. The invasion has further demonstrated how quickly and dramatically markets can be disrupted and how that impacts the everyday lives of Americans. Many of us will recall, recall the Arab oil embargo of the early 1970s, the long lines and rapidly rising prices. It was a disruption caused by a sudden and significant drop in supply when around 2 million barrels of oil a day were withdrawn from the global markets. The opposite occurred during the early days of the pandemic. A sudden drop in demand sent oil prices crashing to the point where they were actually negative. Many in our industry sustained huge losses to the point many went out of business, all cut back on their investments. This reduction in investment laid the foundation for our current market and supply challenges. Today, Russia provides roughly 10% of the oil needed to meet global demand and about 30% of Europe's natural gas demand. A loss of this volume would be much more significant than the impact of the oil, Arab oil embargo and would represent the largest supply disruption in the history of our industry. Unfortunately, there's no quick fix, but in the near term, the answer is straightforward. If we want to reduce prices, we need to increase supply. Our industry needs to make substantial investments just to maintain constant production levels. Without investment, the volume of production declines roughly 7% per year. That's why even during the depths of the pandemic, when oil prices collapsed and ExxonMobil lost $22 billion, we continued to invest to increase supply. That was not without risk and was often criticized. But ExxonMobil's focus on the long-term fundamentals and continued investments are today delivering more supply to Americans. In the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico, for example, we expect to increase production this year by 25% over 2021, which was up 25% versus 2020. Outside the United States, we're also increasing production through a number of projects, including a world-class development in Guyana. In fact, we expect our total oil production this year will be the highest in 15 years. In addition, with new technologies and innovation, we can increase supply to meet the need for reliable and affordable energy while helping society achieve its ambition for a net zero future. ExxonMobil is committed to meeting the need for energy while also developing solutions to lower emissions and address the risk of climate change. Our low carbon solutions business is advancing projects with the potential to significantly lower emissions in the hardest to decarbonize sectors of our economy. 
And while we do not own or operate any gas stations here in the United States, we know that today's high prices at the pump are hurting Americans. The impact of high energy costs underscores the importance of reliable and affordable energy supplies. Finally, no single company sets the price of oil or gasoline. The market establishes the price based on available supply and the demand for that supply. Continued investments in new production is the only way to achieve balanced markets and more affordable prices that bring real relief at the pump. Government has a critical role to play here. Policies need to provide certainty and improve predictability. Consistent, efficient, and effective policies will help spur further investment in U.S. oil and gas production. Access to reliable and affordable energy is essential to modern life and underpins economic and social progress around the world. ExxonMobil is proud to contribute to this progress by reliably supplying the energy the world needs, strengthening global energy security, and playing a leading role in the energy transition. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Sheffield for five minutes. Chair DeGette, Ranking Member Griffith, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Rogers, and distinguished members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Pioneer was one of the first companies in the U.S. to publicly speak out against the invasion of Ukraine. The company and its employees have pledged over $20 million for humanitarian needs. But Pioneer and other U.S. oil and gas companies are doing much more to help Ukraine and protect the U.S. The oil and natural gas that we produce have proved to be a geopolitical asset for the U.S. It's also the critical offset to Russian gas in Europe. Without U.S. natural gas delivered as LNG, Europe would have even greater difficulty standing up to Russia. Pioneer is the largest producer and most active driller in the Permian Basin, which is considered the largest oil field in the U.S. Over the past decade, our company has invested $45 billion to quadruple production to over 600,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. Pioneer is solely an upstream company. Our products are purchased by refiners and utilities. Pioneer operates exclu exclusively on private lands, does not refine its oil and gas commodities, produce gasoline, or operate retail gas stations. Pioneer is a price taker. We do not set the sales price of our products. Prices are determined by international markets based on global supply and demand fundamentals. Over the past 10 years, growth from the U.S. shale revolution has added over 8 million barrels of oil per day and 90 BCF of natural gas per day in this country which has provided jobs, increased energy security, reduced energy cost, and significantly reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Past shale production growth proved to be based on a destructive financial model. We overspent and overborrowed as an industry and contributed to the oil price wars of 14, 15, 2019, 2020, which led to hundreds of bankruptcies. As a result, the industry's returns were dismal. We ended up at the bottom of the S&P 500 in stock performance over the last several years. This led the industry falling from 12% of the S&P 500 to less than 4%. It became abundantly clear that for the industry to survive, the model of production growth at any cost needed to change. The investment community of mutual index and pension funds, which represents the retirement funds of millions of Americans, demanded change. The new model of, of sustainable growth generates returns more consistent with other industry sectors in the S&P 500. Instead of the U.S. growing up to 1.5 million barrels of oil per day in some years and oversupplying the market, the long-term annual growth rate is expected to be 500 to 700,000 barrels of oil per day over the next several years in this country. Long-term, the Permian Basin is the only growing oil shale basin in this country. The drilling inventories in the other U.S. shale basins are limited. The Permian Basin is producing today at a record high of 5 million barrels of oil per day, 20 BCF, natural gas per day. Based on current internal forecast, it will reach 8 million barrels of oil per day and over 35 BCF of natural gas per day around 2030. Pioneer is providing its share of long-term growth at approximately 5% per year. And we expect to produce over a million barrels of oil equivalent per day by 2030. Why can't Pioneer and the industry grow faster? The industry not only has to spend significant capital just to offset, offset existing production declines, but is experiencing severe cost inflation, a labor shortage due to three downturns in 12 years, shortages of drilling rigs, frack fleets, frack sand, steel pipe, and other equipment and materials, and the need for 
pipelines and LNG facilities. Given these constraints, it would take 18 to 24 months to add any min meaningful incremental production. Further, the capital available to our industry is severely impaired with equity offerings, private equity and bank financings, essentially non-existent in the industry today. We face a future oil price curve that declines by more than $25 over the next five years. In the face of Russia's destabilization aggression, now is the time to come together for another bipartisan effort to protect America's energy security and to ensure that the U.S. can continue to provide global leadership. We need more oil and natural gas pipelines, LNG plants. At the same time, we need to support adding nuclear power and other sources of alternative energy that are made in America and not in China. American energy security, whether from oil and gas or alternative sources, is important to all of us. I do not want my grandchildren to be dependent upon foreign energy supplies the way our country was for most of my life. That's why I feel so strongly American foes focused all of the above strategy is needed to maintain affordable energy and energy security for the benefit of future generations of America. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Turn now recognizes Ms. Watkins for five minutes. Chair DeGette, Ranking Member Griffith and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss Shell's response to the invasion of Ukraine the global energy disruption caused by the invasion and our efforts to address rising energy costs in the United States. I lead Shell USA, the US subsidiary of Shell PLC. Shell strongly condemns the unprovoked attack on Ukraine and we have acted swiftly in response. Shell announced that it would withdraw from all Russian hydrocarbons, halt the spot purchases of Russian crude and LNG, exit our equity partnerships in Gazprom related joint ventures and end our involvement in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The phased withdrawal from our downstream operations in Russia is being planned with a priority on the safety of our staff and operations and in line with relevant legal obligations. We will continue to work with governments across the world as they assess the incredibly difficult challenges presented by responding to the war in Ukraine while managing the effects on global energy supplies. The global energy disruption has highlighted the importance and difficulty of moving towards a future in which global economies are less dependent on fossil fuels. We believe Shell's Powering Progress strategy continues to be the right approach, and we remain committed to helping society achieve its goal of net zero emissions. At Shell, we recognize that at rising energy prices as a result of building pressure on oil supply pose a significant challenge for consumers and businesses. Shell is focused on doing our part to ensure a reliable supply of energy products and mitigate the disruptions caused by efforts to move away from Russian hydrocarbons in the global market marketplace. Because oil is a global commodity, Shell does not set or control the price of crude oil. Similarly, Shell does not set or control the price that consumers pay. Indeed, it would be illegal for Shell to do so because nearly all Shell branded retail stations in the US are owned by independent operators who set their own prices in the marketplace. Shell already had in progress actions that will allow us to respond to the current crisis. In the Gulf of Mexico, we recently started production from the Power Nap project at 20,000 barrels of oil a day. And just this morning, we have announced first oil at another project in the Gulf, which will provide an additional 15,000 barrels a day. We also expect to bring online new production from the Vito field by the end of this year. Shell offers three thoughts regarding the challenges posed by today's energy environment. First, we cannot depart from the path towards diversification and lower carbon sources. We are diversifying our own portfolio through several recent developments, including our recent acquisition of solar and energy storage provider Savion, substantial wind power investments, including our recent $390 million investment in a 50% stake in an offshore block in the New York Bight and renewable natural gas ventures in Oregon, Idaho, and Kansas. Second, the government should continue to advance the approval of per and permitting of otherwise ready oil and gas projects that would bring new supplies of oil and gas online within weeks or months. And third, the Interior Department should end its pause on federal oil and gas leasing, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, which is among the lowest greenhouse gas intensive productions in the world. 
Even in the current crisis, Shell is unwavering in its commitment to the energy transition. The market challenges presented by the reduction of Russian oil and gas in the global market presents an opening for policymakers to look for a realistic pathway that would blunt the disruptive effects of the ongoing crisis and accelerate the transition to a lower carbon future. Shell recognizes that recent events have led to volatile gas prices that pose challenges for consumers. To address these burdens, I view it as our obligation to continue to provide a reliable and secure energy supply for Americans and consumers around the world. From the Shell employees working offshore to produce oil, to our staff workers in refineries that have been working throughout the pandemic, to our employees planning and building new offshore wind farms, we take this obligation very seriously. Shell will continue to invest in clean energies and we will continue to work with our customers to help them decarbonize. We are committed to helping society achieve a low carbon future. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you there very much. Uh, General McMaster, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman DeGette, Ranking Member Griffith and members of the subcommittee, it is a privilege to testify before this committee at a critical moment for our nation and the free world. I hope that my statement for the record is useful to you and the important work that this committee is undertaking to strengthen our nation and promote peace and prosperity. I believe that this committee, this Congress, and the Biden administration have an historic opportunity to overcome the interconnected economic and security challenges we face, especially those at the nexus of energy security and national security. Because we have been complacent and I think preoccupied with our own traumas and divisions, we are behind in doing so. We urgently need new policies and new legislation to catch up, strengthen our nation, and build a better future for generations of Americans to come. In my statement for the record, I argue for policies and legislation aimed at achieving the goals of, first, reducing the coercive power of authoritarian regimes over energy supplies. Second, integrating energy security and climate policies. And third, removing bureaucratic and regulatory obstacles to progress to meet burgeoning global energy needs. With the brutal and unprovoked Russian assault on Ukraine, our post-Cold War holiday from history has come to an end. As more of the horrors uh, that the Ukrainian people are enduring become apparent, it is also clear that the United States fell behind in realizing its potential to improve global energy security and reduce Vladimir Putin's ability to wage indiscriminate warfare while constraining the world's response through dependence on Russian energy supplies. Let us be inspired by the courage and determination of the Ukrainian people who are fighting for the freedoms we too often take for granted. It is past time to work together across political parties and between the government and industry to unleash the power of American energy to weaken the authoritarian regimes and, and strengthen the free world. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. It's now time for members to have the opportunity to ask the panel questions. And before I begin, once again, I want to remind members to mute themselves while not speaking, and also the witnesses, even during your question time. This will prevent feedback for witnesses and, uh, and listeners at home. The chair will now recognize herself for five minutes. Many of the witnesses today testified that demand for gasoline went down during the pandemic, and therefore supply went down dramatically as well, too. And that's because the majority of the price of gas, of course, is determined by the price of crude oil. The reality so is that gas prices are high because crude oil prices are high. And the reason why crude oil prices are so high is because there's less supply in the global market. Does everybody agree with that? And I'm going to go right down the, the list and ask you yes or no. Mr. Lawler? Yes, there is less crude Thank oil you. supply. Thank you. Mr. Worth? Uh, Madam Chair, fuel prices are impacted by a number of factors. Uh, crude so oil you don't you don't agree that crude oil prices are high because there's less supply? 
Uh, crude oil prices are high because there are concerns about potential disruptions to future supply. Okay, I don't have time. I'm sorry, Mr. Moncrief. Mr. Moncrief. Crude oil prices are higher because we have had some. Had some right, and some because supply. there's less supply, right? It's a supply and demand issue. Isn't that correct? There, there has been less supply, and there's also concerns Thank you. about even further. Mr. Woods. Mr. Woods. It's a combination of higher demand and lower supply. Thank you. Uh, that's what I said. Thank Mr. Sheffield. Lower supply and higher demand. Right. Ms. Watkins. Generally, yes, Chairwoman. Thank you so much. So one of the things that has confused me, as I said in my opening statement, and it's making people mad, is why are gas prices still high even after crude oil prices came down? And this is the chart. I don't know if you can see it, it, it on Zoom, but, but um, you can see how when price per barrel of, barrel of oil went down, the price per gallon of gas stayed the same. I don't get that. So I want to ask you, Mr. Lawler, BP operates a number of gas stations in the U.S. and internationally. So, Mr. Lawler, can you explain? Uh, people are saying, well, we don't own the gas stations, but actually BP does. Why is there such a disconnect between the drop in cost of crude oil and the much slower drop in the price of gas at the pump? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. So just as a point of clarity, you know, BP has branded stations here in the United States um, of around 7,500 or so, and only about 10% of those stations um, do we operate. Okay, so, so maybe you can tell me why is there a disconnect between the drop in cost of crude oil and the, the fact gas prices are staying the same? Yes, happy to do so. So as Very shared briefly, earlier- Very briefly, I have another question. Go ahead. Okay, um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, it is a very complex set of factors that impact the price of gasoline. So for, exist, for example, the price of oil that's entering a refinery could have been purchased at a higher price, and therefore that price then flows through all the way to the station. It's not necessarily an instantaneous market. There's also quite a, quite a reflection of supply risk. So we talked about just a moment ago that crude oil supplies are down. That actually applies to all refined products, whether that's jet, diesel, gasoline, and that supply risk so, is So you're saying, you're saying that the price at the pump may be higher because of jet fuel prices? Is that one of the factors you're saying? Um, what I'm saying is that all refined products at this point carry a supply risk, okay. which is part of the complex pricing equation that impacts prices at the pump. Okay. Can any of the rest of you in the 41 seconds I have left tell me if you have an idea why price per barrel of oil is falling, but price at the pump is still saying just as high? Anyone else? Congresswoman, I think President Biden did a pretty good job explaining this last week during his comments when he announced the intent to release oil from the strategic reserve. And he talked about uh, the fact that across the supply chain, these prices flow. Oil and, and, and product prices are correlated over time. But at the retail level, uh, the cost that a retailer has paid for fuel a week or two weeks prior and the cost that they may need to pay to resupply all factor into the competition, the pricing that you see at the pump. And so these things do correlate over the long term, but in the short term, they don't always move in tandem. Uh, except, for, except for here, they did correlate. So uh, the president was talking about the relief he's going to give to the American taxpayers and the, pe and the American citizens at the pump. The SPRO is a short term solution to that. But the question I wanted to ask you, and which I will ask you later so you can think about it between now and then, is what concrete steps can each of your companies take right now to reduce the price at the pump for my constituents? And with that, I'm going to yield five minutes to Mr. Griffith. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. My time is short, so I would ask that you answer yes or no. Mr. Woods, is your company taking advantage of the crisis in UK to keep prices artificially high in order to increase your own profits? Absolutely not. Mr. Worth, is your company taking advantage of the crisis in Ukraine to keep prices artificially high to in, in order to increase your own profits? No, we are not. Mr. Lawler, is, is your company taking advantage of the crisis in Ukraine to keep prices artificially high in order to increase your own profits? Absolutely not. Ms. Watkins, is your company taking advantage of the crisis in Ukraine to keep prices artificially high in order to increase your own profits? No, we are not. And you all recall that you're under oath. Do any of you wish to change your answers? Hearing none. All right. The Biden administration's fiscal year 22 budget request listed the following as a key objective. Not funding work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels, including work that lowers the cost of production, lowers the cost of consumption, or raises the revenues retained by producers of fossil fuels. Do statements like this facilitate more domestic production? Yes or no, Ms. Watkins? Yes or um, no? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the context within which that was stated. This was the, the president's budget uh, objectives. One of the top uh, objectives of his budget was to not fund work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels, including work that lowers the cost of production lowers the cost of consumption or raises revenues retained by pro producers of fossil fuels. Mr. Lawler, do statements like that fa facilitate more domestic production? Yes or no? Well, I'm unfamiliar with, with those particular comments, so I, I could not. All right. Any so answer. let me. So apparently everybody wants to get into the weeds and, and hide behind words. The president says he wants to make sure that we do not lower the cost of production. Is that going to make you produce more or less? Mr. Woods, more or yeah. less? I think, the, I think the government has a role in encouraging investment and creating a positive investment climate. And when we create a negative <laughs> climate, you produce less. Isn't that true? Yes or no? Yes or no. There tends to be a chilling effect with negative there words. There you go. There you go. Mr. Worth, you want to, you want to weigh in on this and give me a real answer? Yes or no, is that hurting the production or does that encourage you to produce when the president says in his budget document, not funding work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels, including work that lowers the cost of production, lowers the cost of consumption. That'd be the consumers that Mr. DeGette's been complaining about having to pay these high prices and they don't want to lower those prices. And when you hear statements like that, do you increase production? Yes or no? Con Congressman, mixed messages uh, from the government do not encourage us to make investments with confidence in future supply. Well, and I appreciate you don't want to get uh, stuck with answers, but the bottom line is that's not a mixed message. That's a clearly anti-fossil fuel message from the President of the United States at a time when he claims he wants increasing production. All right. President Biden recently has begun to stress short-term need to increase oil and natural gas output and expedite LNG, liquefied natural gas project development. But in his fiscal year 23, 23 budget request, it focuses almost entirely on transitioning away from fossil fuels. It even proposes tax hikes on oil and gas production. The proposal alleges that oil, gas, and coal tax preferences distort markets by encouraging more investment in the fossil fuel sector than would occur under a neutral system. The provision also alleges that this market distortion is detrimental to long-term energy security and is inconsistent with the administration's policy of supporting a clean energy economy. Are those proposed tax hack hikes, are pro these proposed tax hikes on the oil and gas industry an incentive to explore and develop more domestic production? What say you, Mr. Sheffield? Less production. Mr. Mr. Moncrief, more or less production? Less production. Less production. All right, thank you. General McMaster, in your written testimony, you talk about America's role in defeating deterrent tyranny in World War II, providing more, the U.S. provided more than 85% of the Allies' oil use. What do you see as America's trajectory today as a global leader helping me to meet the rising demand for oil? And you have five seconds. 
How about the trajectory is negative? We need to reverse it immediately. There, there, we should not be beholden to authoritarian powers for energy supply. And if we have the right investments, we can make up for the gap in supply now that we're all paying for. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Palum, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Degat. Let me say I appreciate um, the executives being here today, in particular your willingness to move towards renewables. Every one of you, I believe, stressed that you are moving towards renewables, which, of course, is the real answer in the long run. But for now, um, I do want to point out, I heard Mr. Griffiths say in, in his opening that, um, that you all, um, you know, uh, um, uh, we're dealing with the Ukraine crisis, but the reality is that um, during this crisis, you've had record profits and stock buybacks, and the American people want to know why they're paying such high prices at the pump and giving your industry lavish tax breaks while your profits are being turned over to shareholders. So first, I'd like to ask each of our witnesses here today to please state your net profit from last year, that's 2021, uh, but it's a matter of public record, so if you don't tell me, I'm going to tell you uh, quickly. So let me start with Mr. Woods. What was Exxon's net profit last year? $23 billion after a loss of $22 billion in 2020. Thank you. And I just saw the announcement on Monday that Exxon's profits for only the first quarter of 2022 could be as high as $9 billion. That's incredible. Mr. Lawler, what was BP's net profit last year? It was approximately $7.6 billion after a 2020 loss of $20 billion. All right. And Mr. Worth, Chevron's 2021 net profit? 2021 was $15.6 billion after a loss of $5.5 billion the prior year. And Mr. Watkins, Shell's net profit, 2021? Yes, Shell's earnings last year were about $19 billion. Thank you, Ms. Watkins. And Mr. Munkriff, Devon's net profits in 2021? $2.8 billion. Thank you. Mr. Sheffield, Pioneer's net profit in 2021? It's $2.1 billion after the largest loss in the company's history before. Thank you. Now, that's almost $77 billion in profit just from the six companies testifying before us today. And there's nothing wrong with making an honest profit, but as gas prices have soared, your companies have funneled record profits back to shareholders. In fact, for 2021 and 2022, the six companies here today have collectively executed or announced approximately $45 billion in share repurchase programs in addition to the almost $40 billion in dividends you issued to shareholders last year. Now, that's a lot of money to shareholders, but it's coming at the expense of the American people who need you to dramatically increase production, not shareholder wealth. So it was mentioned that President Biden recently took the step of ordering a massive release from the SPRO to increase fuel supplies by up to a million barrels a day. But that can't go on forever, nor should it. For the American people to have relief from high gas prices, your companies need to do their part and increase production to meet demand. And some of you said you are going to do that. I heard the president of Exxon particularly say that. But what I want to know is, will you commit, and this is going to be yes or no of each of you, will you commit to doing whatever it takes, including increasing production, but also reducing dividends and buybacks in order to lower prices for struggling American consumers? Yes or no? We'll start with Mr. Woods. We are increasing our productions, as I said in our prepared remarks. The investments that we've made since Well, I need a yes or no. So is the, the answer yes or no, Mr. Woods? Yes or no? We will increase our production, yes. But you're not going to, that means you're not going to reduce dividends and buybacks. Well, that's unfortunate because we need you to do that as well. Mr. Worth, yes or no? Mr. Chairman, we're investing 60% more capital this year than uh, we did I last guess, year. I guess guess the answer is no. Uh, you're not willing to do increased production and reduce dividends and buybacks? Mr. Chairman, we can increase production and okay. return value. All right. I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, Mr. Lawler, yes or no? Yes, I, I can't commit. I can't commit to a reduction in buybacks. And All right, I hear you, Mr. Ms. Watkins. Ms. Watkins, yes or we no? We think we can return value to our shareholders as well as increase production, as well as invest for the future in renewables, low and no carbon fuels for our customers. We will be doing all of that. All right, that sounds like a yes. 
Mr. Sheffield? We are increasing production, and the answer is no on dividends. All right, that's an honest answer. Mr. Munkriff? Yes, we'll see. Production increases over time, and the answer is no on uh, dividends and share purchases. Well, I, pr I appreciate that. Now, of course, we're, we're, uh, it's unfortunate that many of you are saying you're not going to address the increased uh, uh, buybacks and, and uh, more dividends to your shareholders because I think that should be part of what you do. But in any case, I appreciate your responses. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mrs. Rogers for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to focus on energy security. The number one thing that we can do to lower gasoline prices is increase domestic production of oil. It's really that simple. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has done the opposite and declared war on American energy. Under President Biden's leadership, American oil production has declined by 1.5 million barrels per day. Permits for pipelines and other important energy infrastructure has been delayed or revoked outright. And the administration is pressuring banks to stop lending for fossil fuel projects. As a result, gas prices are the most expensive in U.S. history. General McMaster, can you explain why American energy is vital in the competition between the free world and authoritarian powers like Russia and China? Thank you. It's, it's absolutely vital because really what, what Russia endeavored to do was to gain coercive power over the global economy and over Europe's economy in particular. And we all witnessed how they've used that course of power over many, many years, uh, not just in connection with the renewed invasion of Ukraine, which began, which began in February. The only way to break that grip on the global economy and the course of power over Europe's economy, Germany's economy in particular, is with alternative sources. And what's sad about it is that we have it within our power to, to make up for, for that production uh, and to break Russia's and other authoritarian regimes' coercive power uh, over the energy market. So this is one of the uh, tremendous opportunity, I think, to advance the Thank interests you. of the United States and the free world. Thank you. What signal does it send to our allies when the Biden administration says no to a pipeline from Canada and yes to oil from OPEC, Russia, Iran, and, and Venezuela? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it really makes no sense at all. I, it doesn't pass the common sense test to cancel a Canadian pipeline and green light a Russian one. And then, of course, it doesn't make any sense either to put all these obstacles in place for, for permitting and uh, that would allow us to, to increase our production and our exports and then to supplicate to the Venezuelans and the Iranians to get them to increase their production and exports. So I, I think it, it really is, is past time for us to do what makes sense and, of course, it, this is consistent as well with the effort on, on climate and CO2 reductions because our production, our transport, our export is greener. And, of course, without our supplies, what's happening is the world is ramping up coal consumption and coal burning, uh, which is the worst thing for the environment. So it's time to rationalize our policies, increase U.S. production, and increase U.S. US exports. Thank you, uh, General McMaster. I'm concerned that part of the reason gasoline prices are so high is because the Democrats ultimately are opposed to domestic drilling and hydraulic fracturing. They would rather let OPEC, Russia, Iran, and Venezuela produce the energy to meet our needs. Is it true that Russia promoted and funded anti-fracking propaganda in Europe and the United States? Absolutely. The evidence is overwhelming. In fact, there have been hearings on this topic back in 2014 in the House uh, that pulled the curtain back on quite a bit of it. And there's been some very good investigative journalism as well. To, to, and this is Russia's effort to portray fracking as unsafe uh, and to do so that, so they can keep their coercive power over the global energy market and on Europe in, in, in particular. And, and of course, this is a huge missed opportunity for the world because the largest ever reduction of man-made CO2 emissions ever was was associated with the availability of cheap natural gas here in the United States, which was, of course, connected to shale oil and, and, and fracking. So, so we're denying yes. ourselves a tremendous opportunity from a security perspective, but also from, from a climate and CO2 emissions reduction perspective. Thank you. Is it true that Russia has worked to discourage American exports and strengthen its grip on Europe's energy supplies with pipelines like Nord Stream 2? 
Absolutely. And this is a this is a, a, a story of, of of rampant corruption. I mean, look at Gerhard Schroeder, right, the former chancellor who received huge payoffs from the Russia oil industry uh, to, 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 to begin Nord Stream 1. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the continued corruption to try to co-opt politicians within within Europe and, and within Germany uh, to get Nord Stream 2 through. So this is this is a corrupt enterprise. It's part the oil, Russia's oil enterprise is part of their international criminal enterprise. And, and we have to recognize that the best way to counter that is with alternative sources of supply and especially uh, American North American supply. And I would include Canada in that as well. Thank you. I really and Mexico. I appreciate you being here, your leadership and your insights. I yield back, Madam Chair. Chair now recognizes Ms. Custer for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman DeGette, for hosting this important hearing today. The recent rise in gas prices has once again made it abundantly clear that our nation's dependence on oil is unsustainable, both in the short term and in the long term. The American people are reminded of this each and every time they fill up at the pump. In New Hampshire, Granite Staters are paying even more than the national average of $4.23 per gallon. And yet, while consumers are being pinched at the pump, oil companies have been raking in profits and pushing for policies that will only make our country more dependent upon oil. It's long past time we promote long-term American energy independence through investments in clean and renewable energy production to insulate our economy and our consumers from these short-term crises. This gas price roller coaster might be great for your company's bottom lines, but it's hurting the American people's pocketbooks. To the six oil companies before us today, you made more than $75 billion combined in profits just last year. And it looks as though with your first quarter, you're on path for record profits again. Now, to address your comments earlier, we understand you did lose money during the pandemic. Most Americans did. Everyone had a tough 2020, including businesses and the 60,000 workers that the oil industry laid off last year. But the facts are that oil majors testifying here today still returned billions of dollars to your shareholders in 2020 at the same time that you were laying off your workforce. So please, don't use 2020 as an excuse for gouging the American people today. In fact, other than in 2020, all four of the oil majors testifying today made billions of dollars every year between 2017 and 2021. So bad, one bad year does not excuse the practice of ripping off American consumers. Now I'd like to focus in on the four oil majors testifying today to identify how much money your company spent in 2021 on stock buybacks and dividends, and how much your companies plan to spend during this year of record profits on the clean energy investments that several of you mentioned during your testimony. And just the numbers will do, you know that our time is short. Mr. Woods, how much money did Exxon spend on stock buybacks and dividends in 2021? And how much do you plan to spend on 2022 on low carbon technologies? We did not buy back any stock in 2021. Our dividends were roughly $15 billion. Half of our stock are owned by uh, average American families. It was an important income stream for them in the, in the depths of the pandemic and during the recovery. So, and so would we you be surprised that the public the record shows $14.9 billion in stock buybacks and dividends? Would that number surprise you? That is the $15 billion of dividends that I mentioned. I, I thought you just told me you did not no spend buybacks. any. On buybacks, we had no buybacks. We had fifteen billion dollars. Fifteen billion dividends, dollars in dividends, to, and how much on low carbon investments? We're ramping up our low carbon solutions business and have a commitment of fifteen billion dollars through twenty twenty five to invest. And how in much last year when you were paying the fifteen dollars in dividend, fifteen billion in dividends? With I the think it's important to recognize the dividends billion? that we pay are critical income to people. And during the difficult right, economic times, Right, I'm just trying times, to compare. I understand that. But $15 billion in stock dividends and $2.5 in low-carbon investments, does that sound about right? Does that sound 
That sounds about right. We recognize okay, we are growing Wirth, our low carbon. The same question business. for you on Chevron. How much in stock buybacks or dividends, and how much in low carbon investments? Uh, Congressman, in 2021, uh, we paid out roughly $10 billion in dividends. We bought back uh, around $1.4 billion in stock. And this year, we expect to spend between 4 and $5 billion on low carbon energy. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Mr. Lawler, how much did you spend in stock buybacks and dividends, and how much in low carbon investments? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, we spent uh, about $4.5 billion in dividends and about $4.1 billion on buybacks. Um, we spent several billion dollars on low carbon energy, ramping to three to four billion and by 2025. Okay, Ms. We'll Watkins at Shell, my time is almost up. How much in stock buybacks and dividends and how much in low carbon investments? In 2021, uh, we spent about 6.3 billion on dividends and about 2.8 billion um, on uh, share buybacks. And uh, we, on our renewable energy, we spent about two to three billion last year, and even more on low carbon uh, fuels and investments in low carbon fuels. Okay, my time is up, and I, I thank the gentlelady, Mr. Burgess. You're now recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the chair. I thank our witnesses for being here. I, I do wish you were here in person, but. Unfortunately, we don't do things that way anymore. Um, Mr. Woods, I just have to ask you, um, who are the shareholders? Are any part of those shareholders retired teachers in Texas whose pension plans may invest in your stock? Absolutely. A very large proportion of the people who own our stock look for our dividends as a source of income. One of the reasons why we we we'll walked such a fine line in 2020 during the pandemic was maintain those dividends, recognizing the important role they play in retirees and the average American family. And, and I think that that needs to be underscored. I suspect that same is true for uh, for almost every one of our witnesses here today. I, to encourage production, and my thesis is that the federal regulatory burden has increased over the last 15 months. We saw what regulatory reduction did in the previous administration and led us to a situation where really we were energy independent, we were energy dominant in, in the world. So on that thesis of, of lowering regulations and increasing the performance of the federal agencies that are supposed to provide you with, with the permits to drill, I'm concerned because at the federal agency level, we've got a ton of people who haven't yet returned to work. They're still working from home, and I can't help but feel that that impacts your ability to get an answer from a federal agency in a timely fashion. So for that reason, I introduced a bill that uh, will withhold any future unallocated COVID funding from the Department of Interior until they return to work to address your permitting problems. Um, I've also introduced a bill that would immediately restart all oil and gas leasing permitting on federal land and prohibit the president from delaying the issuance of future oil and gas leases, permits, approvals, or authorizations on federal land authorization. This administration needs to get back to work and they need to rescind their anti-energy executive orders and ramp up production here in America we cannot forget in September of 2019, uh, in an unguarded moment, then former Vice President Joe Biden promised a young voter, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we will end fossil fuels. So Mr. Woods, let me ask you, uh, the Biden administration has <laughs> claimed that the Oil and gas industry is sitting on more than 12 million acres of non-producing federal land with 9,000 unused but already approved permits for production. So can we go through this? Just talk to us a little bit about how you obtain a federal lease. I would tell you uh, today, uh, Congressman, we have about uh, 2,000 uh, leases on federal lands and all but about 1% of those are producing um, oil or gas. So after you get approved for a federal lease, can you immediately start to drill? 
It is, a, it is a fairly complicated process that requires understanding, one, what's on the lease, developing plans to produce that, uh, the, the discoveries that you have on the lease, uh, putting gathering systems in, getting permits for that, infrastructure to move product to oil. So it is a fairly complex um, interdependent system of permits and investments across uh, from the drill well all the way to the market. It's a fairly complicated and long process, particularly with uh, delays in the regulatory process. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, almost seems like the administration is being disingenuous when they accuse you of not performing on these leases. It is a complex and complicated process precisely because we make it a complex and complicated process. Let me just ask you again, Mr. Woods, do you think uh, Congress could play a role in providing greater clarification of Department of Interior's leasing and permitting procedures to avoid potential litigation? I think increased clarity, increased certainty, increased uh, predictability, more uh, efficient and effective uh, permitting processes and regulate, regulatory uh, processes would benefit the industry significantly. Thank you. And I've got a ton more questions I'm going to submit to all of you for the record. But Mr. McMaster, let me just ask you, we've seen now the releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in a non-emergent situation. We hear over and over again that Energy security is national security. Are we putting our national security at risk with these releases from the SPR? You know, I, I don't know what the extent of the risk is, but there is risk associated with it. I think it's going to be important to replenish those reserves at some point, hopefully when prices are lower. But uh, I, I do think that this is obviously a, a short-term measure for what is really a long-term, what I would characterize as an opportunity to increase U.S. production in a way that satisfies the global market and, again, reduces the course of power of authoritarian regimes. Thank, thank you. And thank you for your testimony, Dave. Thank you for your written, written testimony. Chair now recognizes Ms. Rice for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I'd just like to Not make note now. of the reference that the reference that was made before to the credibility of Russian propaganda when it comes to energy issues. I just wish that more of my colleagues could give that same credibility to Russian propaganda when it comes to impacting our elections and the future of our democracy. And hopefully we more of them will go in that direction. Um, Mr. McMaster, I would like to direct my questions to you. Um, We've all talked about Putin's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and how it has sent global markets into disarray, caused unspeakable tragedy for the citizens of Ukraine. Gas prices have spiked partly in response to this latest global crisis. But we have been here before during the Arab oil embargo, the Iranian revolution, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and on and on. So long as we remain dependent on oil to meet our huge domestic needs, countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia are going to continue to have leverage over us and our allies. We have to transition to cleaner energy here at home and away from our reliance on fossil fuels. General uh, McMaster, um, could you speak to the importance of ending U.S. reliance on fossil fuels, particularly foreign oil imports, as a matter of national energy security? Congresswoman Rice, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with all of you and to answer that question. Uh, of course, I think it's immensely important to reduce the course of power of hostile regimes over us in the area of fossil fuels, uh, but also in, in connection with, with all energy sources. One of my concerns is that in our race to renewables, which we have to do with un, undiminished vigor, we risk actually <laughs> uh, transitioning from dependence on, uh, on oil in the Middle East in the 1970s or on Russian oils we're seeing today uh, on supply chains that are captured by the Chinese in connection with renewables. So when, the, when we put into place a sensible energy policy, I think it involves increasing U.S. production, increasing U.S. exports, and then also making our supply chains much more resilient, especially those in connection with, uh, with wind and solar and all of the upstream components and, 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 I couldn't uh, and minerals. I agree with you more, General McMaster. And in fact, the Department of Defense, just for example, has recognized the security implications of relying so much on petroleum and has invested heavily, as you know, in biofuels and renewables for military purposes, military purposes. Can you explain why, um, and I say you because of your past experience, can you explain why the U.S. military has looked for ways to reduce its reliance on products derived from crude oil and increase the potential for alternative fuel sources? 
Well, I, I think the military criteria are, 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 has to always be military effectiveness. And so what's important, I think, is to ensure that, as you can see with the failed Russian offensive, that logistically you can sustain forces. And what's critical for energy for the military is to ensure freedom of movement and action at the end of extended and contested supply lines in you austere environments. And so that should be a range of, of, of energy capabilities. But do you agree with the Department I should say of Defense? batteries, which, which of course is another vulnerable supply chain, yes, Congresswoman. You, but you agree with the Department of Defense going in that direction, don't you? If it increases freedom of movement and action, it, okay, shouldn't, so be done, your... it shouldn't be done for, for any other purpose, I don't think, than military effectiveness. I Well, I, I, I would agree with you. And I, I thank you for pointing that out. In your testimony, you talk about the need to develop our domestic manufacturing capacity for renewable energy hardware and equipment, as you were just talking about. You state that it is vital to act on the Biden administration's 100-day supply chain review report and onshore renewables manufacturing. I agree with you. And that's why I supported the bipartisan infrastructure law. And that is why President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act to encourage domestic production of battery materials. Uh, thanks to the Biden administration, we'll also soon break ground on wind farms off the coast of Long Island, um, and you mentioned that before, that will power as many as 2 million homes. Can you expand on the importance of onshoring renewables manufacturing so projects like these can be built with American technology and labor? Congresswoman, it's, 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 it's a, it is so important to do this because China is in a race to get a lock on these critical supply chains. Everything from the, the rare earths and other minerals that go into the, manu the manufacturing process, as well as the separation from ore and the refinement of those materials. We don't have the capacity anymore in the United States. The one U.S. mining company for rare earths is 10 percent owned by the Chinese. How can that make any sense? So we are we are really very far behind in securing the upstream components uh, to renewable energy, as well as the manufacturing, as, you, as you've mentioned. And that's going to take, I think, an element of economic statecraft, some significant investment, because as I mentioned in, in my statement for the record, we've just been complacent for too long. And we risk, again, trading energy dependence of one form for energy dependence of, of a new form and doing it to the Chinese Communist Party. General, thank you so much. And thank you to all the witnesses. And I yield. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Surely this committee recognizes that the uh, gas prices are set at the global market and are markedly influenced by domestic regulations. So let's just take a step back. According to the Energy Information Administration, gas prices historically tend to increase dramatically under Democrat presidents imposing more regulations and have even decreased under Republican presidents. Gas prices have actually dropped 52% under President Reagan. So since our goal is to lower gas prices at the pump for Americans, we must stop over-regulating. Listen to what the panelists have been saying to us all day, all day today. To reduce prices, we must allow increases to production and supply. So, so Madam Chairman, high gas prices seem to be responding to the increased regulations that have been imposed. The administration, this administration has already been waging its own war on fossil fuels by issuing a federal leasing moratorium, slowing down the permitting process. Companies have sought 22,000 permits for drilling, but only 9,000 have been approved. They're weaponizing the Federal Reserve and the SEC, and they're canceling the Keystone Pipeline and threatening others like Line 5, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, Dakota Access Pipeline, Mountain Valley Pipeline, no wonder the, the market is nervous and prices have increased. Remember, our goal is to lower gas prices at the pump for Americans. Increasing regulations will, have, will produce the opposite effect. So Mr. McMaster, yesterday the Wall Street Journal reported that the, the Biden administration is seeking to increase oil imports from Canada. Really? Didn't he just cancel the permit for the Keystone Pipeline that have imported 830,000 barrels of crude oil per day from Canada, and Canada's network of pipelines are already running at full capacity. So we'll have to import by rail, which 
according to analysts, is more expensive. So my question to you, Ms. McMaster, will energy prices go down if we rely on rail to transport crude oil? Congressman, I'm, I'm not an economist. I'm like, I'm a washed up general, you know. <laughs> but, but I would say, I would say that I, I think that they would uh, that they would go up, you know. Of, of course, and, and what 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 I think this is just one example of the irrationality of of energy policy, and this is what I mean by the need to integrate energy policy with national security policy and with climate policy. Of course, it is much more ecologically friendly to transport that oil and gas through a pipeline rather than through rail and trucks and so forth. So this is just one of many, many examples in which energy policies and decisions run counter to what our overall goals and objectives General, are. General, if I could ask, I've got two more quick questions to you. Uh, one is the Atlantic Coast and the Mountain Valley pipelines were, if they had been completed, would that have made energy costs in America more likely to have decreased? Yes, to, and, and also, and also just and, and made the supply much more secure and, and accessible. Okay, and then third question. In your testimony, uh, you said that it makes no sense to cancel the Keystone XL while green lighting Nord Stream 2. Could you explain a little bit more on that? Well, what, what happened is, you know, we, we denied Canada access to our market. And of course, what's Canada going to do? They're going to have to sell oil elsewhere, maybe to China, for example, which would give China maybe more power over over uh, over Canada's economy. And then, of course, we enabled the coercive power of the Kremlin uh, over Germany, which is you know, importing 51 percent of its gas and 41 percent of its oil from Russia. This is why the European Union will not impose a hydrocarbon embargo on Russia, even as they're committing mass murder of innocent people in Ukraine. So it was an extremely poor decision that ran counter to our national security interests. And again, this is why energy security and national security policies must be integrated and compatible with one another. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I think it was an excellent panel, and I think we've got quite a bit of good information to work with. So thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, the vast number of American people um, believe that the main reason for their increase in prices and at the pump, not the only reason, but the main reason, is in fact price gouging. You know, during uh, World War II, uh, Congress held uh, um, war profiteers accountable. And I want to tell you that a recent poll three weeks ago um, that there is overwhelming support, 80 percent of Americans for a windfall profits tax. And I want to tell you that I am planning to upgrade my COVID price gouging prevention act to make sure that it extends beyond the, uh, the, the COVID crisis because we cannot tolerate in any industry price, uh, price gouging. Um, I wanted to um, ask you, Mr., or, or just to mention Mr., to you, Mr. Lawler, that your global C CEO, Bernard Looney um, re recently stated, and I, and I quote, um, that uh, BP is literally, he says, literally a cash machine when oil prices are at this level. Um, and so I do want to ask you this, Mr. Lawler. Do you think that uh, BP should be receiving any tax, uh, ta tax payments uh, from the uh, uh, American people? Um, as long as the uh, company is making such uh, such great profits right now, I know that you are projecting that there is going to be a um, big profit in the first quarter. The tax. Um, thank you. Yeah, appreciate the question. I, I think if uh, if you look at the whole context of of those comments, what we were really focused on with those comments is that at these prices, it will be very helpful for the energy transition. So as we've talked about, it is very expensive to not only bring on resilient hydrocarbons, but the massive investment that's going to be needed uh, to effectuate the energy transition cannot be understated. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. So in the Gulf of Mexico, I'd mentioned in my opening statement, we're installing this platform called Argos. That costs $9 billion. And it's been in motion for years. No, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, I have a, a short time, but 
Um, some of the tax breaks that you get are uniquely to uh, help you to um, do oil exploration, and I don't think that taxpayers ought to continue uh, to, to pay that back, especially as much as 96% um, of subsidies for new oil wells go toward uh, profits when the prices are, are so high. Uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Um, Mr. Wood, um, reports indicate that, uh, that your company, Exxon, excuse me, that I wanted to, uh, Exxon um, could um, uh, see a first quarter profit of about $9 billion. Do you think that it makes sense for your company to receive federal subsidies while you are um, seeing such high profits? Such high profits. So I would put our first quarter profit uh, in the context of a much longer time horizon, which is the, the time horizon we make investments over. And if you look across the industry as a whole, and our company specifically across that time horizon, the return that we generate for the capital that we have to invest is fairly average versus the rest of industry. We have a, the cycle highs and the cycle lows, and it's important to look across those. As I mentioned in 2020, our company lost $22 billion. And so we rode through that, continuing to make investments. In that year, we lost $22 billion. We made $20 billion of capital investments if, if to make I, sure if that I, the supply If I was could, just online. because I have such a short time, you know, lots of companies, especially during the pandemic, lost money. But we do, as American taxpayers, um, pay subsidies to the oil and gas industry. Um, and, and in some cases, um, the kinds of tax breaks that really are not available to other corporations. Do you think that you should be treated separately and get the kind of tax breaks um, that you're getting now, even when the profits are high? I think, uh, and what we advocate for is a level playing field. We're a global industry, a global business that competes globally, and having a tax regime that is competitive with international competitors is important. But a level playing field is our is our approach and what we advocate for. Don't look for special carve-outs, level playing field. Okay, but you get special carve-outs, and I'll uh, yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Long for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I have a question for the chairwoman. Question: Were the I know the other day we had a, had witnesses here at the table for another hearing in here, and then one of my colleagues said that we don't do things that way anymore. Were the witnesses invited today or told to stay away? So in was fact, that their decision to not be here? In, or was that in, our decision? In fact, Mr. Long, I encouraged the witnesses to come in person. I wanted them here in person. They opted. The witnesses opted themselves to testify remotely. That was their decision. Was that a group? I mean, each one of them decided individually not to be here? That is my understanding. I wanted them okay, here Okay, if any of table. you disagree with that, let me know, but I would. Well, you know what? You can ask the witnesses. That's what I am. I'm trying to. Yeah, ask I'm them. sorry. Yeah, but uh, yeah, if any you of you want to chime in right on here. that, why you are not here, because, you know, an empty, I always like to look people in the eye, and it's kind of tough to do it through a, through a computer. Uh, or screen or whatever we call that thing up there on the wall. So, but anyway, uh, Mr. Sheffield, am I given to understand that the oil markets move in anticipation of future events, not events today, but anticipation of future events? Yeah, it's all based on the world supply demand and also predictions of what may happen in the future. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Because uh, I remember very well that President Biden campaigned on the fact that he was going to pretty much decimate energy production in this country. And this committee right here that we're in today, Energy and Commerce, a few years ago I was on the Energy Subcommittee, and we worked long and hard to uh, get LNG to where we could export LNG. We had to change the law to be able to do that, and we did that very successfully for a while. So. Uh, it goes back to the old saying, who are you kidding when you're kidding yourself? When you're sitting here talking about price gouging and things like that, we have a president of the United States that campaigned on the fact that he was going to do everything he could to decimate energy production in this country. It, I'm from Missouri. you got to show me. And this hearing today doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Mr. Sheffield, I'll go with another question for you. 
uh, I'm mindful of the impact that higher gas prices have on Americans. Policies that hinder growth in the energy industry certainly impact prices. Americans pay for that energy to run everything, small businesses, heat their homes, uh, fill their gas tanks, and it means less money to pay for groceries and other essentials, which, oh, by the way, are up quite a bit. Tires are up 30 to 40 percent if you need a set of tires today. Under the Biden administration, inflation has hit the highest point in 40 years. Unfortunately, experts suggest it's only going to get worse no matter how much President Biden tries to pass the blame. A key component of the Consumer Price Index is gas prices, which have been rising since day one of the Biden administration. And actually, that's not true. They started rising on November 3rd or 4th, 4th the day, I think November 3 was the day he got elected. And in anticipation, like I mentioned earlier, of future events, knowing he was going to be president, knowing he'd campaign on killing energy production in this country, they went up the next day, and the next week they were up like, if I remember right, like 20 percent on uh, crude. A key component of the consumer price index is gas prices, which have risen since day one of the Biden administration, like I said. I read that twice, in case you didn't get it the first time. Oil is priced on future markets and future for American oil and gas development. Doesn't look so bright under the Biden energy agenda. Can you elaborate on how inflation affects your industry, Mr. Sheffield? Uh, yes, we are seeing severe inflation, uh, primarily due to the uh, pandemic. We're seeing severe supply constraints, and I testified already in my testimony that uh, we're lacking a lot of equipment. The reasons why we can't grow faster is we're lacking uh, uh, rigs, we're, we're lacking frack fleets. When you go through three downturns, we can't bring people back to the Permian Basin. Who wants to come back and work in the oil and gas industry? We just can't get people back. So we are seeing severe inflation. It's up significantly, uh, and we'll continue to see severe inflation over the next several years. Okay, and I got a quick question for General McMaster. What steps should we uh, be taking to increase energy production here in the United States to lower energy costs and make us once again energy independent as we were on January 20th until 11.59 in the morning of 2021? I think streamlining the, the permitting process and then and then uh, and removing bureaucratic obstacles. I think that is the number one impediment. And, and I'd like to hear from the other members. I'm, I'm, I think who could speak more authoritatively about this. But I am aware of a number of actions, for example, that are just sitting at the Department of Energy uh, with all of the environmental impact work done and are just waiting signatures. So. I think it's important to remove rather than put more obstacles in place, which has been a tendency uh, to be able to, to, to tap into the tremendous power associated with American energy. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for not being here today, I think. I think that's what I mean. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Long, just for your information, in the interim, I checked with staff, and in fact, all of the witnesses for today were invited to appear in person, but they all opted it was their decision not to come in person today. Thank you but to for inviting them, and I'm very, very sorry they made that decision. I am too. Uh, Mr. Tonko, you're now recognized by, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before you start, my Clark, um, I just want to correct something that my friend and colleague, Ranking Member Rogers, said. Here are the facts. According to the Nonpartisan Energy Information Administration, domestic oil production was only 9.8 million barrels per day during President Biden's first full month in office. Since then, production has grown to 11.4 million barrels per day. That means oil production has gone up almost 2 million barrels per day since President Biden took office. So it is patently false to say that oil production has decreased under President Biden. The oil industry has a notorious track record of investing in countries run by petrol dictators, including Russia. According to recent reporting, Shell, Exxon, and BP are among nine American and European companies that have paid more than $15.8 billion in taxes and fees to Russia after, after it annexed Crimea in 2014. Those projects have helped to fund Putin's war chest and provide Russia with the operational and technical energy expertise that gives it leverage on the global stage. All the while, we watch in horror as the media alerts us to the tragedies in Ukraine. Each of you has since announced either pause on or exits from your Russian businesses. Mr. Woods, Exxon recently announced that it would begin the process of exiting its Salkin One venture in Russia and would not make further investments in Russia. Briefly, can you explain when Exxon will be completely divested from Russia? 
We're, we're working through that process now. It's rather complex because we are the operator of offshore rigs in deep water and environmentally sensitive areas. So we're, we're working our way through Thank that you. as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Mr. Woods, Exxon's former CEO, Lee Raymond, famously said that he doesn't make decisions based on what's good for the United States. Another Exxon CEO and President Trump's first Secretary of State received the Order of Friendship Award from Putin after, after Russia had already invaded Georgia. Do you agree that Exxon should not make decisions based on what is in the best interest of the United States? And what actions is Exxon taking to ensure that it no longer invests in governments run by violent adversaries of global peace? Well, we're a company that operates on a global scale across the world. And uh, obviously making decisions about where we choose to operate, a number of uh, factors are inputted into that, including the administration's view and recommendation. Is it for the, the best interests of the United country? States? That's what I asked. I, I would tell you in our business in Russia for both Democratic and Republican okay. administrations have encouraged our investments there as a way to bring Western values into Russia and benefit okay. the Russian people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wirth, I listened as you committed to, I, and I quote you, maintaining American leadership. But Chevron's website indicates that it has marketing and retail operations in Russia and that it supplies Russian oil companies with lubricants and other materials. According to your website, Chevron is merely pausing all transactions in Russia. Question, will you make a commitment that Chevron will not simply suspend but terminate all operations in Russia and that it will no longer supply Russian oil companies with the lubricants and materials that help Russia fill its coffers? Yes or no? Congressman, we've halted all those sales and for the foreseeable future, there's no way that those will resume. Mr. Watkins, I would like to take the opportunity, to, or Ms. Watkins, excuse me, I would like to take the opportunity to share how shocked I was by Shell's decision to purchase new Russian oil cargoes. I think it justifies the concerns of many who believe that the major oil companies will always prioritize their own profits even when basic moral values are at stake. Having said that, I'm glad that Shell, too, has now decided to exit its operations in Russia and it's withdrawing from purchases of Russian petroleum products. Briefly, can you explain when Shell will be completely divested from Russia? We're in the process of working through that. Uh, we have we have ceased uh, buying all spot crude and all spot LNG at this point in time. Um, we have walked away from um, uh, our investments uh, that we have with Gazprom. We are in the process of, of uh, figuring out how to do that. It is not completely clear. Um, we need to be in compliance with all um, laws and sanctions, and we are doing it as fast as we possibly can. And Mr. Lawler, BP has also recently announced that it is exiting its 19.75% stake in Ros Rosneft, an oligarch-run operation that helps Putin project power in Europe. Since Russia's invasion of Crimea, reporting indicates that BP has paid approximately $817 million in taxes to the Kremlin, in addition to $353 billion in taxes, fees, royalties, and profits remitted to the Kremlin by Rosneft itself. What specific actions is BP taking to exit its Russian operations, and when will BP be completely divested from Russia? No, thank you for the question. What I can say is that uh, BP was horrified with the military action and the war uh, against Ukraine. Um, within 96 hours, we announced our intention to exit our position with Rosneft in Russia. That means up to a $25 billion write down. So the company is actually quite serious uh, about our response. And what I would say is that we're looking at all options. It's still early, uh, but we will come back and report when that process is complete. It well, is, uh, I would hope it way, would. and we're looking at it. I hope it would be done with great urgency. It's troubling that you place profits over people and profits over our planet. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Right I thank the gen dollars. gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Palmer, you're now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman and I thank the witnesses for being willing to be here today, considering all that you've been through and all that my Democrat colleagues have put you through over the last few months. And I appreciate the fact that there are multiple factors that impact the price of oil and gas, natural gas. And the most fundamental, uh, obviously, is supply versus demand. But obviously, when demand is high and supply is limited, prices go up. But that's not the only consideration when it comes 
to oil and natural gas, uncertainty created by government policies that impact investment decisions and the availability of capital also impact prices. Would all of you agree with that? And I'd appreciate if all of you answered it once, yes or no. Yes. 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 What is happening here today and what happened last fall when your companies were attacked by my Democrat colleagues on the Oversight Committee will continue to impact oil and gas industry decisions and prices because it creates more uncertainty uh, in terms of capital investment. The hearing before the Oversight Committee last fall attacked your companies. Now, this is, this is what gets me, is here, here we are attacking you because Supply uh, price is high because supply is low, and they opened up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to increase supply, but they attacked you last fall for producing too much oil. And, and one Democrat even uh, used jars of M&Ms and bags of rice to illustrate the point. Another Democrat on the committee called one of you a liar and compared your industry to tobacco companies. There was another Democrat who said that they want to have big oil hearings like they had big tobacco hearings. That, I kind of think that's what we're doing today, setting this all up. It was part of a strategy that was developed at a, a meeting in La Jolla, uh, California in 2012, where left-wing activists mapped out a strategy to take down the fossil fuel industry. Uh, are you aware that your industry is being set up? Are you aware that these hearings are likely part of a strategy to destroy public confidence in your industry? It was laid out, like I said, in 2012, where, where these activists mapped out the strategy. The American people should be aware of what is taking place here because it's going to impact them enormously. I think you should trust the judgment of the American people more than you do the judgment of the Biden administration or my Democrat colleagues in terms of their choices for providing energy for their homes, uh, the matter uh, and, and choices and, and their decisions on the transportation that they decide they want to utilize in the conduct of your business and base it on that. Now, I realize that it's going to be very difficult for you to do that as long as the Biden administration and the Democrats in Congress work to undermine the domestic energy production. But it's not just the price of energy that should be of concern to every one of us and to Amer uh, every American. It's also a national security issue. Uh, by shutting down our domestic energy production, not only have we uh, made Eastern, uh, made Europe, all of Europe, uh, more vulnerable to the influence of, of Russia, we've undermined our own national security, and I'd like General McMaster for you to comment on that. Well, I, th I think as, as we've said, Congressman, you know, the energy security is, is, is national security. We can see that just quite dramatically uh, with the invasion of Ukraine, but that's always been the case. And I, I do think that that there have been constraints put on our, our ability to take full advantage of uh, of of uh, you know the the great um, you know the the resources we have in in this country to not only satisfy the global market in a way that's cleaner, uh, but also in a way that breaks the grip of these authoritarian regimes. And I would like to see maybe now put into place an energy policy that is connected to our national security strategy. And I think it's past time to do that, Congressman. Thank you. I appreciate that. One of my colleagues pointed out that in previous administrations, we've seen uh, substantial price impacts. I, I hearken back to the, the last time we saw price increases like this, maybe to the presidency of Jimmy Carter, when uh, the price of gasoline almost doubled uh, by the end of his administration. God help us if that happens in this administration. Um, I, I just want to, to, to point out again to the American people, I hope that are paying attention to this, the inconsistency and the hypocrisy of these hearings. What's happening here today is going to impact every American family. It's going to impact jobs, not only in your industry, but other jobs. And it is going to undermine the prosperity and economic future of this country. Madam Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now I'm pleased to recognize Mr. Ruiz for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, for holding this hearing on a critical issue on the top of my mind and my constituents' mind. In my district last week, I saw prices between $5.49 and $6.40 a gallon. These prices are outrageous, and my constituents are struggling at the pump and struggling to make ends meet. 
I hear from constituents who tell me how the outrageous gas prices are putting everything out of reach. They tell me that they're struggling to afford the gas just to go to work. I'm curious, on your salaries, do any of you have trouble affording the gas to get to your job? I didn't think so. And as this graph behind me based on research shows, while American families are struggling with high gas prices, you and your big oil corporations are making record profits choosing to keep supply low instead of investing oil in production in the 9,000 unused permits, you choose to make more profits for shareholders. During this Russian war, you are ripping the American people off and it must end. Gas prices need to go down. And while the rest of America is trying to make this happen, you all are trying to increase your record profits. And gas prices cannot continue to be dependent on the whims of autocrats like Putin who can weaponize oil against us. The solution for now and in the future is transitioning to a clean energy future where we aren't dependent on oil. We must expand our use of affordable electric vehicles with batteries that are made in America with American materials. Right now, we're sitting on the fifth largest lithium deposit in the world, big enough to power our clean energy future and meet our ba battery manufacturing needs right here at home in Southern California in my district underneath the Salton Sea. What's unique is that this lithium is extracted from the brine from geothermal energy production. A clean energy future will break us free from our dependence on oil. It'll ensure we won't have to worry about outrageous gas prices like we're seeing now. And if we do it right, it'll create sustainable manufacturing here at home. So I'd like to hear from the companies here today, what are you doing to move us toward that clean energy future? Mr. Lawler, can you briefly discuss what BP is doing to move us toward a clean energy future with more electric vehicles? Uh, absolutely, Congressman. Thank you for the question. So I might start by saying I grew up in Denver, Colorado in the 1970s, and my dad printed the Denver Post each night and was a member of the union. And I remember clearly as a child the pain that the cost of gasoline uh, imposed on our family. And so, so what are you today, doing to honor that memory and moving towards the clean energy future? Well, no, I appreciate that opportunity. So what we're doing at BP is we're working flat out. Our refineries are running flat out. We are bringing 140,000 barrels of crude oil to the market this year, in the second half of this year. We've also- That doesn't sound too clean forward. to me. What are you doing to expand well, the clean energy future with batteries, electric vehicles, something that will help clean our air and help us uh, uh, not be dependent on oil? No, absolutely. So again, we're making the transition investments that are needed. As I mentioned, we're going to install 4.5 gigawatts of power offshore Massachusetts and New York. We'll be rapidly expanding the number of EV charging stations in the states. We do have a 50-50 partnership with Light Source BP that's putting in numerous large solar farms across the United States in many, many places. And we just bought a company called 7X and we'll, we'll be installing a significant number of solar fields in the, in the mid-continent region of the United States. And we will be spending $5 billion a year by the end of the decade. So BP is in action. We have real things that are happening Thank you now. for that. Thank you for that. I wanna ask Ms. Watkins the same question. Uh, what investments is Shell making to develop and improve on lithium battery and electric vehicle technology to transition us to a cleaner future? Yes, Shell's making a lot of investments to uh, advance to a cleaner future. In fact, our whole strategy is premised on working very closely with our customers in order to increase the demand for low and no carbon fuels, including um, electric vehicles. As you mentioned, uh, we have a uh, a, a company within our company um, called Green Lots that actually is working to install electric vehicle charging and back office uh, software systems. Um, we're working with cities, uh, governments, universities, um, other companies in order to decarbonize their fleets. Um, so we have a very specific focus there as well as on wind and solar. I mentioned we've just recently bought um, offshore New York, 50% um, uh, interest for almost $400 million. That's just the lease uh, for the offshore space to install offshore wind. 
Um, and so we're investing billions of dollars a year. And as we move through time, that will in only increase um, as, again, as our customers work, uh, as we work with our customers to increase their demand for low and no carbon fuels. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Dunn for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss rising gas prices and how poor administration policy contributed to this. Uh, when President Biden took office, he wasted no time targeting American energy production. And you can guess what happened next. The markets responded. So gas prices were already rising well before Putin's attack on Russia. What's worse, we had the chance to prepare to unleash American energy prior to the Russian invasion with full foreknowledge that that invasion was coming. Instead, largely due to administrative failure, we forced the United States and our allies to increase our dependence on Russian energy. The gap left by less American energy exports directly funds Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That's shameful. We could talk about administrative malpractice for hours. Unfortunately, I only have five minutes, so let's move into some questions. <clears throat> General McMaster, nearly one year ago, Russia was massing troops at strategic points all along the Ukraine border, the largest presence of Russian troops since the invasion of Crimea during the Obama-Biden administration. Despite this, the Biden administration continued to push policies that attacked our energy supply and our exports to Europe. General McMaster, do you believe that those actions, such as canceling the Keystone Pipeline, emboldened Vladimir Putin? Congressman, I do believe this was an element of Putin's uh, calculus. He believed that, that we're weak, right? He's looked at our internal divisions. He's looked at policies and actions like the surrender to a jihadist terrorist organization and our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I think he also looked at our energy policies and believed, hey, I, I have course of power, uh, especially over Europe's economy, and there'll be a muted response that he thought would be kind of similar to the weak response after he first invaded I'm Ukraine I'm gonna move on to Mr. Sheffield just for a moment. You mentioned in your testimony, Mr. Sheffield, the oil and natural gas we produce proved a geopolitical asset for the United States. Can you list just a few of the federal and state regulatory obstacles that are restricting your production and transportation of oil and gas, American oil and gas? Yes, we need uh, more pipelines, both oil and gas. For instance, use Keystone, for instance, if Keystone would have been built six, seven years ago, we probably, Canadian production would be up another million barrels a day going to the Gulf Coast refineries. That's an example. Uh, you have to make long-term decisions to help the industry. Uh, but there's not enough oil and gas pipelines. There's not enough LNG plants. We need LNG plants in the Northeast. We have the largest gas field in the world in the Northeast. It's too expensive to get the gas down to the Gulf Coast. We need to build LNG facilities in the Northeast. Those are examples. I mean, well, I, I thank you for your clarity on that, Mr. Sheffield. I really do. And I, I, uh, I appreciate we'll take that home. Uh, back to General McMaster. General, while the Biden administration continues to push the industry towards developing and adopting renewable energy technologies, the United States is highly reliant on imports of the minerals and the production of the materials that are used in renewable uh, uh, energy technologies. So with the vast majority of those coming from China, I cannot fathom why we want to become more dependent on China for energy. Doesn't, General, doesn't this play directly into China's goal of world hegemony? It does. What, what Xi Jinping wants to do, Chairman Xi wants to create a dual circulation economy in which he is insulated from any kind of financial or economic ramifications for his aggression against his own people and internationally, and he fosters dependence on him, uh, especially in the emerging data-driven global economy and on energy in particular. If you think it's bad for oil and gas infrastructure in the U.S., hey, try to get a mining permit for some of the minerals that are essential to, to generating, you know, the batteries and the magnets and the, and, and the, and the, renewable, uh, the renewable energy uh, hardware and equipment. 
So it's it's vastly important. I mean, it's sixteen to twenty years about to get to get a mining permit in the in the United States. So we have a lot of work to do, Congressman, in removing regulatory barriers to become more competitive and to ensure that we don't trade one dependency for another in the form of renewable energy. Well, thank you very much for that clarity, especially as it as it applies to the mining of all the essential minerals and, and commodities that we need to go to renewable technology. That was an outstanding point in your testimony as well. Thank you very much to all the witnesses, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Chair now recognizes the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, Mr. Peters, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. If, uh, if Mr. Putin loves American division, he probably loves that Republicans are blaming President Biden for low production that happened before he took office or the inability to get workers in American oil and gas fields. The one thing we should agree on is that the war in Ukraine is exposing the interconnections between our energy security environment and our economy. And we should be doing everything we can to, to alleviate price shocks and support the people of Ukraine against, against Russian aggression. As we transition to a clean energy economy, we should focus on bolstering our energy security, which the Congressional Budget Office defines as the ability of households, businesses, and government to accommodate disruptions in supply and energy markets. The increase in gas prices across the United States clearly reflects a nation that lacks energy security. One nation, Russia in this case, can cause significant economic pain to Americans due to the, our dependence on oil. In San Diego, the average price of gasoline reached nearly $6 a gallon in late March, and the most vulnerable San Diegans feel these price increases the hardest. We have to respond with real solutions to provide them relief. I'm grateful for the Biden administration's actions to reduce prices, including re releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and working with U.S. companies to replace Russian oil and gas with American energy. And I'm open to ideas to reduce prices in the short term. However, we know that the long term solution to energy security is diversification and clean energy, more electric vehicles, more hydrogen vehicles, more renewables and more biofuels. And we can't ignore the climate science, whatever we do in the short term. Earlier this week, the International Panel on Climate Change Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, said that we need to rapidly transition to a clean energy economy, and notably they warned that we have 20 fewer years to cut methane pollution than we previously thought. Instead of by 2050, we now need to cut global methane pollution by 33% by 2030. Mr. Woods, Exxon refers to itself as an energy leader in addressing methane pollution, and you have committed to working with the U.S., European, and other governments to implement the Global Methane Pledge. And as mentioned in my remarks, we have to accelerate the emission reductions by 20 years to avoid dangerous warming. In light of the IPCC's findings, should Exxon and other com companies testifying today set more aggressive commitments to reducing methane emissions to align with the new scientific findings? Congressman, I think you touched on a very important part that the industry is very focused on. Our, our uh, work to reduce methane, I know across all the companies that I engage with, uh, we're focused on that. Our, our company specifically has committed to, by 2030, reducing methane emissions by 70 to 80 percent. And as we work towards that goal, we're trying to improve upon that number. And I what think are uh, the, what most, are some of the specific steps that Exxon should take to accelerate methane emission reductions? So there's a process of um, uh, ch changing out equipment, making sure that the the process, the operations that we use are sensitive to uh, to uh, events that release methane, uh, making sure the equipment is of the right uh, vintage. There's a lot of maintenance and, and replacement of equipment that drives that. Don't you think U.S. oil and gas companies should be leading the world in reducing methane pollution? After all, our customers, your customers, are going to be looking for clean gas? I think the oil and gas industry has an obligation to lead in this space, and I would I make the point that I think we are doing that. And in fact, I think many of the, the panel members here today are, are taking that position to lead in reducing methane uh, emissions. Well, I hope you'll be willing to work with the committee um, in Congress to accelerate that commitment. And Mr. Worth, Chevron and other companies today have set climate targets and committed to the Paris Agreement. At the same time, they've argued that cost remains a barrier to stopping routine flaring, which is a, a significant co uh, contributor to climate change. Will you commit to using your increased profits to further reduce methane pollution and routine flaring? Congressman, we absolutely share that commitment. You've put your finger on a very important issue, and I would echo the comments of Mr. Woods that I think the uh, companies in this industry, particularly the American companies uh, and uh, some of the international companies represented on this panel, uh, are absolutely committed 
uh, to uh, reducing methane emissions and eliminating routine flaring. Thank you. I appreciate the witnesses being being with us today, and I want to just um, call out for my Republican colleagues that these folks uh, in this industry um, that you you guard so closely see it as a priority to reduce methane pollution. I need the, I need my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle to commit to that as well, and then we can get this done. Madam Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Joyce, you're now recognized for five minutes. First, I'd like to thank Chair DeGette and Ranking Member Griffith for having this hearing today. Chair, I'd like to quickly respond to Mr. Tonko to correct the record. My good friend repeated a claim that the Biden administration has made, but it's very misleading. They are claiming that oil production under President Biden is up, but they are only comparing it to the first year of the Trump presidency. Here's the truth. According to EIA data, U.S. oil production has declined by over one and a half million barrels per day from the peak production of 13 million barrels per day in 2020. President Biden also imposed a moratorium on fossil energy development on federal lands and waters, and he stifled U.S. energy production through bureaucratic delays. Clearly, the Biden administration is creating a regulatory environment that is hurting Americans' ability to produce oil and gas domestically. What we've seen in the last several months has been an energy crisis, unfortunately, of our own making. We have finally learned what many of my colleagues and I have been saying repeatedly in this committee, that the only way to guarantee reliable and affordable energy for the American people is to utilize the resources under the feet of my constituents. Instead, the Biden administration has given in to environmental groups and left our country beholden to foreign autocrats and oil cartels. This is not what America needs. In my home state of Pennsylvania, we have the resources required to power our nation and get back to energy dominance. But for now, that potential is locked underground, and my constituents are left paying higher and higher prices to fill their gas tanks. We need to stop talking about how to attack the energy industry, and we need to start focusing on how to stimulate domestic production. We need a positive energy policy instead of a punitive energy policy. Many of these companies before us have invested billions in research and development that have directly benefited Americans' consumers. Several have made large investments in Pennsylvania that have not only spurred domestic production, but provide thousands of family-sustaining jobs in the communities that I represent. This is the answer on how we bring gas prices down. The solution to our energy crisis cannot be found in Saudi Arabia, but rather in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, in Bedford County, Pennsylvania, in Cambria County, Pennsylvania. Enabling production here at home is the only way to give Americans the economic future that they deserve. My first question, a great example in my home state of the type of long-term development that we need is the Shell Pennsylvania Petrochemicals Complex. It has brought thousands of construction jobs and hundreds of permanent jobs to the region. I've been to this plant. I stood with the pipe fitters, the electricians, and the plumbers, working Pennsylvanians. Ms. Watkins, can you give us some of the impacts of Shell's investments in Pennsylvania? Yes, thank you, Congressman. Um, this is a this is a huge infrastructure project that we've been investing in for the last few years. In fact, it's the biggest uh, infrastructure project in the country. Um, at, at its peak, it employed 7,500 uh, construction workers, and we're in the process of commissioning this plant this year. Um, we'll have 600 permanent jobs uh, in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, it's, a, it's a polyethylene plant that's built on the site of an old zinc smelter. Um, and so we're, we're actually a very proud uh, community members and proud that we've been able to go back into um, a community that uh, industry had left and, and actually really revitalize that by creating jobs um, and creating products that, uh, that will be vital to the energy transition. Uh, this my time is limited, and I thank you for that vitality that you're infusing you. into Pennsylvania. Mr. Woods, ExxonMobil is another company that has invested in the shale gas fields of Pennsylvania. 
At present, a lack of pipeline and LNG capacity is hampering our ability to respond to global energy price spikes and support our friends, our allies in Europe. How can the federal government work with this energy sector to ensure the necessary energy infrastructure is there to facilitate the growth that we need? Well, thank you, Congressman. You've touched on a really important part of the equation with respect to uh, building up out uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, oil and gas business, which is infrastructure and the ability to take the, what we produce and get it to market efficiently and effectively. And one of the big challenges we face today is the permitting process for pipelines, and then beyond that, the, the legal challenges that come from a number of interest groups. And so both of those need to be addressed if we're going to efficiently and effectively build pipelines that connect resources with demand. Madam Chair, my time has Thank expired. I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Schreier, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the executives for participating in today's hearing. Uh, I got to tell you, my constituents are hurting. They are worn down by two years of this pandemic. And now, just as they are getting back on their feet, they are being hit with skyrocketing prices at the pump and at the grocery store. Over $100 to fill up a truck, $75 to fill up my car's gas tank. And here's the thing, prices don't have to be this high. You all can make decisions today that will help our constituents tomorrow. Increasing production will meet demand and bring down prices. Frankly, given your profits, you could drop prices without even increasing production. Uh, Pre-pandemic, the U.S. produced about 13 million barrels per day. Now we're at 11, and we need you to step up now. And I'll tell you, when I tell my constituents, and they learn that at the same time they're paying these skyrocketing prices at the pump, $5 in my area, your companies are making record profits, they're mad, and they should be. Let me just lay out some numbers in case you think this is hyperbole, comparing 2021 profits with 2019, the last typical year. Exxon, 2019, 14.3 billion. 2021, 23 billion. Chevron, 2.9, up to $15.6 billion. BP, 10 billion, up to $12.8 billion. Shell, 16.5 to 20.1. I think most of us would agree that this just doesn't, doesn't feel fair. It feels like gouging. It, it even feels like profiteering. And right now we all have a role to play, a patriotic duty really, when, that when there is war in Europe and gas prices are high and the American people are hurting, that oil companies should not be sending profits to shareholders and you all are some of the biggest shareholders. Uh, I have introduced a bill to suspend the federal gas tax for the rest of the year. And right now, in the short term, most people think you should be using the money you have to extract more oil, meet demand, and bring down prices to give us, all of us, some relief. And with oil at over $100 a barrel, you're gonna make a profit regardless. So I'm asking you, in just 20 seconds each, can you tell me what is the one most important thing that it will take to ramp up oil production to pre-pandemic production levels? Uh, Ms. Watkins, you can start. What will it take? Yeah, we're in the process of bringing on oil every day. We brought on um, new oil in the Gulf of Mexico last week, some more announced today, some more by the end of the year. Um, some things that would enable that to happen even more um, is the approval of some permits that we have outstanding right now. Um, those permits are out there. Uh, approvals tomorrow would enable us to drill wells that would likely bring it on more. Sounds uh, like permitting is it for year. you. Mr. Lawler, what would it take for you? Thank you for the question. So we're increasing our capital budget in the onshore by 15%. And we're also bringing on a massive offshore platform, 140,000 barrels of oil a day. And we're operating our refineries at absolute safe maximum capacity. Okay, that didn't really answer the question. Mr. Worth, what would it take for you to further increase production? Uh, Congressman, I appreciate your, uh, your concern on this issue. It's a very important one. Our production in 2021 was 
higher than our pre-pandemic production. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're investing 60% more capital this year than we did just last year. We intend to grow production in the Permian Basin by 10% this year. Our company is growing production and investing in that. I think broadly speaking for the industry, uh, the issue of permitting that has been raised multiple times is essential and also a, uh, Thank you. an environment that is it sounds, supportive of investing in this like industry. It sounds like permitting is the main issue that I'm hearing. My understanding is that this administration is working with you on permitting. My understanding is also that 90% of the drilling happens on private lands. And so I just want to summarize that I think you can do more and the American people need you to do more. Long term, we need to wean ourselves off of this dependence on fossil fuels. But in the short term, we need you to step up for the people in my district and for the people across this country who are feeling extreme pain at the pump right now. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Mr. Ham for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In late February, Russia launched its unprovoked and its violent invasion of Ukraine, and President Biden has organized our allies to impose crippling sanctions on, uh, or, uh, has organized our uh, allies to impose sanctions on Russia. I recently returned from visiting Eastern Europe, where I heard thanks for President Biden's and America's leadership on these issues, but also concerns about American oil and gas companies profiteering from Russia's invasion. Now, for the most part, oil companies have rightly stayed away from trading Russian oil during this global crisis, and several of your companies are discontinuing investments that have long fueled uh, Putin's war machine. But among our witnesses, as my colleague, uh, Representative Tonko, pointed out, there has been one company that continued to purchase Russian oil even after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On March 1st, after the invasion began, Shell purchased 100,000 barrels of Russian oil. Shell got this oil at a deep discount because no one else would touch it. Ms. Watkins, I'm aware that your company has since apologized, but what do you think it says about Shell's values and credibility that you bought Russian oil while the Russian military started carrying out its brutal attack on the people of Ukraine? I think it says, um, you know, we, we within a day or two, we announced that we were walking away from $3 billion worth of investments. Um, and I think that says a lot about um, how we despise what is happening. Certainly. Um, Look, I am aware of your, your recent actions. But the reality is, after the invasion, uh, you know, you put the profits ahead of the lives of innocent Ukrainians and before our ability as a nation to hold Vladimir Putin accountable. I mean, each of you have been crystal clear in public statements in the past month that Putin's invasion has been great for your bottom line. Not only have each of you taken advantage of this war and the crisis that it has produced to return even more profit to shareholders, but it also appears that at least five top oil executives have cashed out some $99 million worth of stock personally since the invasion began. These include top executives with, from Hess, Marathon, Continental Resources, and represented here today, Pioneer. Mr. Sheffield, you sold 22,247 shares worth of 5.3 million on March 2nd, a little over a week after Russian, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Was the value of Pioneer stock when you sold it after Russia's invasion higher, lower, or the same as it was prior uh, to on February 24th? Yes, uh, Madam, the stock is only up about 8 to 9% since the uh, invasion. And I still have not over 90% of my net worth in Pioneer stock. It's well, the first time I've sold stock in several years. Well, thank you, Mr. Sheffield. But the undeniable reality is that you did sell over 22,000 shares of your company's stock and pocketed millions from Putin's attack on Ukraine. But today's witnesses, they've talked extensively about industry externalities and the global nature of oil prices that aren't in their control. Yet at the same time, I hear how these same executives and their companies are independently deciding not to invest in new supply or produce more, which would drive down gas prices for consumers in order to return value to the shareholder. You may not directly control price, but you do manipulate supply to decrease the amount of product on the market. And you do that to create scarcity, which at the end of the day drives up costs for hardworking Americans. It's easy to make prices skyrocket overnight 
And that's great for share prices and stockholders. Mr. Sheffield has showed us that much, but it's bad for working families in my district and in every congressional district across our country. Your company's made a combined $76.4 billion last year. You're on track to make more this year. You're cashing multi-million dollar paychecks and you're profiting personally off your stock options, telling us that your hands are tied. Meanwhile, there are millions of folks who are seriously considering taking a second or third job just to make ends meet. So I'll close by asking you what any working parent who is struggling with their home heating bill or their gas prices in my district would. Sitting here today, no evasion, no pivoting, no slick lobbyist talking points, how do you plan to change course today? Will you stop prioritizing obscene profitability, buybacks and dividends over the livelihoods of working Americans? Because after all, you represent American companies and that used to mean something, especially when we've been faced with threats abroad. It's my hope that you'll take this opportunity to make it mean something again. And with our remaining time, if anybody wants to uh, answer that question, I'd be grateful. Perfect. Unfortunately, the gentlelady has 15 seconds left, so perhaps well, I'm hearing we can ask anyway, for so I'll yield back. Response. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. O'Halloran, uh, you're now recognized for, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's clear to me that uh, no real solutions for lowering gas prices have come out of this hearing today. People from are more focused on playing the blame game rather than identifying actions to, to lower gas and energy prices for Americans. We're in an unprecedented time. We've seen historic inflation caused by a multi-year pandemic and now a war in Europe. I have no issues with energy companies making profits. What I do have an issue with is the excess profits that you are making at the expense of the American people. Since the Industrial Revolution, oil and gas companies have invested in technologies to help ensure Americans have access to energy that we need to survive and thrive. However, in America, the natural resources belong to the American people and often sits on our lands, uh, in the ground, in our country. This is critical to remember. I understand that oil and gas markets are complex. What I don't understand is what, that when we are mu multiple, we are multiple unprecedented crises is occurring right now. Oil and gas companies are turning a blind eye, choosing their Wall Street friends o over their corporate responsibility to the American people. They're partners in this whole process over time. Thousands of Ukrainians have been slaughtered at the hands of the Russian invaders. Parts of Arizona saw the highest rates of inflation in the nation over the past year, and Americans are paying the highest gas prices that they've paid in decades. Americans are hurting. When the world shut down in 2020, Congress passed bipartisan COVID relief bills that included critical support for businesses of all sizes. Over the course of the pandemic, behind uh, demand for oil fell sharply, and oil prices were temporarily went negative. But oil and gas companies benefited from over $8 billion in, in relief. Oil and gas companies have long benefited from tax breaks like the intangible drilling cost deduction and others that American taxpayers pay billions for every year. The companies on this panel alone made the $76.4 billion in profits last year. But I, I know that oil and gas companies are back to break, breaking in profits. They've forgotten the American taxpayer and the, their partners in the whole history of energy in America. We are oil and gas companies. Where are they at now when the American public needs help? Multiple uh, of the witnesses have testified today uh, they've forecasted that returning money to investors then is more important than lowering prices. They've stated it time and time again over the last months. This is real, has real consequences for people in my district. High gas prices have a severe impact on rural America. It's not uncommon for my constituents to rack up over 50 miles a day commuting to work and school and running every, everyday errands. When energy prices go up, everything becomes more expensive. Families, farmers, ranchers, 
and rural Americans. Everywhere have to make up uh, uh, and make the hard decisions to cut costs somewhere. Congress is limited in how much it can affect oil prices set by global markets. But we, are, we can do something. We can work together for the American people, as we have done in the past, to overcome this. But we can't let this crisis stop us from taking steps to ensure our energy independence. We must invest, and you must invest, in the future of energy in America, clean energy in America and the world. But in every past crisis, we've been told that increasing domestic production will solve the issue. It hasn't. The long-term solution is not limiting our dependence on foreign oil, not just limiting it, but it is to transition from the current dependence on foreign oil. I have some other things I'd like to say, but I also want to correct a couple of things here. We are in a different landscape. It was mentioned earlier, the pricing, how much it's increased over the last year or so. There was a chart up here. That different landscape, part of that didn't show that part of the reason is we've had tens of millions of jobs come online. That means more energy needs. That means more cost. It wasn't just when the Russians attacked Ukraine. It was the buildup to the Ukraine attack that caused a lot of that price rise. Uh, Pre-invasion pricing was just went up exponentially. And finally, I've heard time and time again over the last several weeks, but let alone today, that we, we are not doing the job on LNG. We're the largest export, exporter in the world on LNG, and pretty soon we have the permits available uh, and they have to be invested on by your companies to do 30 plus billion cubic feet additional over and above. We have two new, two new uh, facilities coming online. So with that, Madam Chair, um, I want to thank you for your uh, time. I thank and, the you know, gentleman. Uh, at this time, all of the members of the, of the Oversight Subcommittee have questioned the witnesses. And at the request of the witnesses, we are going to uh, recess and so the chair will announce that the committee will stand in recess for 10 minutes. And we're going to return promptly because we have many, many more uh, people to question. And we're going to have votes on the floor. So the committee's in recess for 10 minutes.
come to order, and the chair is now very pleased to recognize the distinguished chairman of the Energy Subcommittee, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for this uh, outstanding hearing. Madam Chair, the overall profits of the U.S. energy companies are the greatest profits ever recorded in the history of mankind, of the human species. Let me be clear, these profits are outrageous on its face. Madam Chair, look at these profits. Exxon Mobil in 2021, 20, $23 billion in profit. Chevron, 2021 profit, came in at $15.6 billion. And last but not least, Shell. Shell Company's profit, $19.3 million. These are outrageous profits. In the weeks following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, many Western oil and gas companies distanced themselves from Russia, including BP and Exxon. Mrs. Watkins, the same week that other companies announced then they would take a step back from Russia. Your company was buying cheap Russian crude oil. She bought over 700,000 barrels of Russian Ural's crude oil for nearly $30 per barrel under the international oil prices. It managed to convert that oil into products that is sold at normal prices. That single purchase would represent over $20 million in profit. These profits are nothing short of war profits. Blood money soaked in the blood of innocent Ukrainian citizens. Of course, she always says apologize, but it seems to me like it is an insincere apology. Are they sorry they did it? Or are they sorry they got caught while doing it? Ms. Watkins, listen have some truth now, some true facts. When was the decision made to purchase that cargo of oil? Congressman, I'm not sure when that decision was made, but I can tell you that um, we have well, walked away. You're not sure who within Shell approved the purchase. Well, our CEO, Ben Van Burden, came out and said that uh, that he he had approved that and he had made a mistake and he has apologized for that. Yeah. I can tell you the situation in Europe at the time was such that attempting to fill refining... The Shell's chairman of the board also approved the uh, purchase? Sir, I'm not aware of, of how the approvals worked, to be honest. Prior, prior to the war, the Shell typically uh, purchase your own crew? I'm sorry, I'm not, I didn't understand the question. Or Shell typically purchase your own crew oil? Yes, Urals was is a, is a type of crude that we run at our European refineries. And at the time that that decision was made, we were attempting to keep refineries yeah. running and keep gasoline at the pump for our customers. According to uh, S&P, 
late Russian crude oil boat was supposed to arrive in Rotterdam on March 25th. Has that crude oil arrived? Has she taken possession of it? And has she processed that oil through any of its refineries? Yes, sir, I believe we have, so that we can supply diesel and gasoline to our customers in Europe. So at this point in time, we have ceased all spot, spot purchases of crude, and we've ceased all spot purchases of LNG from Russia. We are doing none of that at the, at the time, at this time. Madam Chair, I'm running out of, let me ask one of the, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'm running out. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Scalise for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding and for holding this hearing. Uh, I have some questions for the witnesses. But first, uh, before we talk about why we're here, I think it's important to go back and look how we got here. Americans are furious that gas prices are so high, but they also know that President Biden walked in day one with an agenda to kill American energy. And don't take my word for it. Let's go back to candidate Joe Biden. When Joe Biden was a candidate for president of the United States, he was very clear what he wanted to do to shut down American energy production as a candidate. And here you see him to the left, ironically, of Bernie Sanders. Joe Biden said, quote, no more drilling on federal lands, no more drilling, including offshore, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period, ends. That was Joe Biden, as a candidate, said he wanted to kill American energy. And I wish it ended there, but that's just where it got started. He then went on and issued a barrage of mountains of red tape from every one of his federal agencies to make it harder to drill in America. Not in other countries, by the way, just in America. Look at all the agencies that President Biden used to go after American energy producers the Department of Energy, the, Depart the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Securities and Exchange Commission, the Department of Agriculture, the Council on Environmental Quality, the Department of State, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Justice, the Department of Interior, all of these federal agencies putting mountains of red tape on every American driller making it harder to drill in America. Look at a few of them. Of course, we all know Keystone, day one, coming from the State Department killed the Keystone Pipeline. He's not against all pipelines because he turned around and gave a gift to Vladimir Putin and greenlighted Nord Stream. So he made American energy less secure, but he said it's okay for Russia to produce oil and send it to Europe, making them addicted to Russian oil. Helping fuel, by the way, Putin's war against Ukraine. Putin is getting before the invasion, was getting over $700 million a day selling his oil to America and to Europe because President Biden issued this assault on American energy. Now, again, go back to what Biden said. He did say that he was going to do it. No more drilling, including offshore. So what happens when you kill American energy through all these Biden red tape policies? The price goes up. Just look at it didn't start when Russia invaded Ukraine. The price was going up from day one when Biden took office because he carried out an assault on American energy. So if you want to solve the problem, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. How about you first get rid of this entire assault from every federal agency I just mentioned on producing oil in America. None of these rules and regulations, by the way, apply to Russian oil. None of them apply to Iranian oil. None of them apply to Venezuela. But yet, that's who President Biden is begging to produce more oil. Stop begging dictators to produce our energy and turn to America, where, by the way, we do it cleaner than anywhere in the world. You get energy from Russia, they have a much higher carbon footprint. I'd love to see the carbon footprint. Maybe we can have a hearing on that. The carbon footprint of Joe Biden's anti-American energy policy. The good news is there is help on the way. Republicans have filed more than 60 bills, by the way, 60 bills to reverse this barrage and assault on American energy by President Biden. More than 60 bills. Our ranking member, Kathy McMorris Rogers, has a bill. There's bills to do all kinds of things to actually allow us to produce our resources, 
by the way, cleaner than anybody else in the world. That's where we should be going with this. But I've got some questions for our witnesses, and I'll start with Mr. Lawler. My question is, does this whole mountain of red tape by President Obama make it harder for you to produce more energy in America? Yes or no? Mr. Lawler. Well, in, in, gen in general, you know, regulations that are supportive of the industry are helpful. Regulations that help improve the energy transition are helpful. So there, are so these supportive are these supportive of the industry? You've seen them. You know these. You have to comply with them. It's one of the reasons you can't produce. And I talk to people who produce in all parts of the country, and they tell me it's these regulations that are stopping them. Mr. Worth with Chevron, do these regulations make it harder for you to produce energy in America? Yes, they do. Woods. Yes, they do, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Sheffield. Yes, they do, sir. Mr. Moncrief. Yes, they do. Ms. Watkins. Congressman, certainly some regulations are necessary for our business, but as I do said these. before, we've got, we've, we've got outstanding permits that would, if, if approved, would be uh, enable us to bring even more production well, on Let's open soon. up American the energy. Let's expired. stop the assault on American energy now is very pleased and lower to... gas prices. I yield back the balance of my time. The chair is now pleased to recognize the chair of our health subcommittee, Ms. Eshoo, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for holding this very important hearing today and for extending the uh, legislative courtesy to me uh, to participate. Uh, in response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, over 50 American companies have pulled out of Russia, uh, including BP America, Exxon Mobil, and Shell uh, USA. Uh, and uh, uh, so to those that have, uh, I salute you for that. Uh, those that haven't, that are with us today, do you plan to do so? No response. Okay. Uh, one policy that, uh, that Congress is considering uh, to address the uh, uh, the soaring uh, uh, gas prices is uh, suspending the federal gas tax, uh, a, ga uh, uh, a tax holiday, uh, so to speak, uh, of 18.4 uh, cents per gallon. Uh, and there's a serious debate over whether gas prices would actually fall uh, uh, by this amount in the not too distant future. Uh, my question is, if your companies uh, can pull out of Russia, uh, can you also commit to passing on the full savings of a gas tax holiday to consumers? So we'll go through the panel and it, uh, it's a yes or no answer. Are you refusing to say anything? It's a yes or no answer. Congresswoman, I, I'll start. This is Mike Worth with Chevron. I was waiting to see if somebody was going to go through the list. Okay. Uh, we can certainly uh, discontinue the collection of that tax. Uh, prices move each and every day in both directions. And so uh, I can't guarantee you that the price will go up or go down due to a variety of other factors that influence prices. Uh, but we collect the tax on behalf of the government and submit it to the government. If that tax were suspended, we would no longer collect it and, uh, and pass it on to the government. So it would go the uh, uh, it would go to the government, but would the uh, consumers uh, that are buying the gas, trying to fill their tanks, would they uh, be the beneficiaries of that? Direct the, beneficiaries. Uh, appreciate your question, Congresswoman. Let me try to be more clear. The uh, consumers would no longer pay that tax. We would no longer collect that tax. Uh, that could be a separate issue. The price of gasoline could go down more than that. Or it could it could go the other direction, depending on a variety of other factors that are at work in markets uh, each and every day. To the other gentleman and gentlewoman. Yeah, so Congresswoman, what I would share is uh, 
a similar comment in that uh, it is a very complex market that, that uh, might precipitate increased demand, which could also uh, increase prices. And I would just tell you that it's very complex uh, market based uh, decision. But I, can't you bring more clarity to this than just saying that everything is so complex? Uh, you know, it. Um, I know that this is not pleasant, but the American people are really not with you. They're angry. They're angry. And, you know, when uh, I think every American company owes something to America, to the American people, there's pain at the pump. And really what underlies my question is, what can you do to help alleviate that? You know, if you don't plan to do anything or help to do something, uh, then I think that becomes absolutely apparent. But I think that it will just add to another layer of, uh, of the deep anger and resentment of the American people. So uh, uh, let me go through the, the rest of uh, uh, the individuals that are testifying today uh, on my original question. Uh, Congresswoman, this is Darren Woods with ExxonMobil. I'll, I would just tell you, um, I think the point that Mike made is a function of the supply and the demand. If the price drops off and demand picks up, so comply, supply would pick up. The way to ultimately solve this problem is to uh, increase the amount of supply available to American consumers. That's well, been something that... You're essentially saying no, because uh, 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 if there were to be a tax holiday, then uh, uh, at the consumer at the, uh, at the pump uh, to fill up will, would, not, um, would not get the benefit. No, what I'm saying is that, that that tax holiday doesn't change the amount of supply, and the question is how does supply and demand balance out, which will ultimately set the price. And I think what you're, what you're seeing is nobody knows exactly how that supply and demand balance would be struck, but that is what will ultimately determine supply, the, the price, the way to influence price is to raise The, the gentlelady's time's expired. I thank the gentlewoman, thank and I you. yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes... Mr. Latta for five minutes. Well, I want to thank the chair for allowing me to wave on today's hearing, and I want to also thank for our witnesses for testifying before us today. Today, we're seeing the blame game played with maximum effort by our Democrat colleagues. We have heard the other side of the aisle and the Biden administration point their fingers in every direction to seek a culprit for the rise in energy prices. What the administration should be doing is pointing their fingers in the mirror. Since day one of this administration, President Biden has pursued policies that would restrict the ability to produce oil and natural gas in the United States. He canceled the Keystone XL pipeline, issued a moratorium on leases for oil and gas exploration on federal lands, used the immense regulatory powers of the administrative state to bog down the permitting process for energy infrastructure projects, and pushed his financial regulators to squeeze investments in the fossil fuel industry. Now he's trying to convince the American people that this full court press of anti-American energy policies is not contributing to the rise in gas prices. Instead, they say it's entirely a fault of greedy oil companies and the war, Putin, war criminal Putin. I'm glad we are holding this hearing today so we can set the record straight and get the answers for the American people as to why they are hurting when they go to fill up their car at the pump. General McMaster, if I could start my questions with you, and first I want to thank you for your service to our nation. In light of the horrible crimes that were discovered over the weekend in Ukraine perpetrated by the Russian army, many Western nations are now catching up to the United States and recognizing the need to end the importation of Russian oil and gas. Lithuania has become the model for this, where that nation went from being fully dependent on Russia for energy only a few years ago to now having the ability to end any Russian imports. What, uh, General, what will be the result of this decisions by the Western European countries to end Russian imports, and how will that impact gas prices here and around the world? Congressman, the, the, the result in the near term will be to constrain the, the supply even, even further, but, but I think the key is that we have to start racing now to catch up to be able to displace Russian oil and gas in, in, in the market, uh, as, as well as to pursue 
solid supply chains for the transition to renewables. I think what's really important about what Europe is doing is to follow up now on infrastructure investment. So much of that infrastructure was designed to keep Russia uh, Russia's coercive power over those economies. So some big investments need to be made in, in infrastructure on our side of the of the Atlantic as well as in Europe. Uh, and then also it's really important to recognize that we need a rational approach to energy security and climate and carbon emissions. Germany made a leap. They made a leap away from nuclear and a leap toward renewables without investing uh, in, in hydro hydrocarbon infrastructure uh, and as a result, they, they left off a cliff and can't keep the lights on. So it's very important for us to recognize that as we pursue reductions in carbon emissions, that we have a sensible approach to energy security. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Woods, uh, there have been efforts to shut down pipelines across the country, including Line 5, which uh, serves Ohio and Michigan. And last year, we saw how gas prices were impacted the shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline. Would you speak to the consequences for gas prices if anti-pipeline advocates got their way and more pipeline operations were shut down? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. Uh, infrastructure plays an incredibly important role with respect to energy uh, supplies and keeping reliable and affordable energy available for American people around the nation. What you'll tend to find is sources of supply uh, refining in the Gulf Coast is feeding uh, the demand in the East Coast. And so having those pipelines available is absolutely critical. As upstream production and new resources of natural gas are, are found and developed, that production needs to be connected to markets, which then have to move via pipelines, which are the most efficient, the most environmentally sound, and the safest uh, modes of transportation. Stopping those lines of uh, either natural gas to consumers or crude into refineries or from refineries into demand centers, ends up putting a disruption into the balance of the supply and demand and increases prices and reduces uh, security for people in, in accessing uh, reliable and affordable energy. Thank you. Mr. Lawler, in my last 30 seconds, what role can the United States play in delivering cleaner, safer fossil fuels and displacing less responsibly produced oil and uh, natural gas from countries like Russia? No, thank you for the question. I think uh, the U.S. is on track to, to, to be a leader, and I think BP is participating in that. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're spending uh, two to three billion dollars this year. We'll be spending four billion dollars uh, around the 2025 time frame. And it is important that we keep our eye on both uh, topics right now. You know, it's very important that we get uh, near term supply up, as we've all discussed, but it's also important that we follow through on on uh, a clean energy environment that we all want to live in in the future. Gentlemen's time well, expires. Thank you very much, my, I now recognizes back. the chair of the Select Committee on Climate Change Crisis, uh, Congresswoman Castor from Florida, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chair DeGette, for calling this very important hearing on price gouging by the big oil companies. Uh, it's truly outrageous, and we've seen since the Putin's attack on Ukraine a rise of at least 75 percent, or 75 cents, uh, and this is, I really feel for the small business owners and the parents trying to get their kids to school every day. Uh, they have supported the ban on Russian oil imports to America, so they are doing their patriotic do duty. They are willing to help the Ukrainian people. And now it's time for the big oil corporations to do the same. It's time for the big oil companies to, to lower prices rather than pad your bottom line. It is time for you to end the billions of dollars in American-funded taxpayer subsidies that are going to support your businesses. It's time to stop your decades-long obstruction of the transition to clean energy, which would provide lower costs for consumers, the cars and trucks we drive, the way we heat uh, our homes and cool our homes. Uh, it's really scandalous to see this profiteering at a time when the Ukrainian people and freedom are under attack. And it's scandalous to watch year after year as you unleash your lobbyists uh, and the, grand, the, the uh, grand oil party uh, to block action to get to true energy security. And what can that look like? Because America is already number one, uh, the number one producer of oil and gas. Has that insulated us from the volatility and the price spikes? It hasn't. Now, I want to remind everyone, it was just a few years ago that the Congress and the big oil companies pressed to allow the export 
of petroleum products from the United States, something that many of us opposed at the time. U.S. exports, they said, would allow us to become even more independent. It, this would lower prices. Has that happened? No. And more than a half a million barrels of petroleum exports leave the United States for China every day. Going down the line, I want to ask each of the CEOs how much uh, of your product produced in the United States does each of your companies export to China, largely being aligned with Putin of these days. Mr. Lawler? Uh, thank you, Congressman. So I can't speak to the to the exact volume. Um, as you may know, the the uh, the world market so is very a dynamic. Quick, a quick uh, number is all we need. Mr. Worth. Yeah. So Mr. Worth. Uh, Congresswoman, that's not a number that I have uh, at hand, but I'd be happy to uh, follow up with your staff Moncrief. and make sure we get that information to you. Mr. Moncrief. Yes, we export. Yes, we export about ten percent of our production, uh, predominantly to Europe. To China. How, I'm just asking about China. Oh, uh, I don't think we, hardly any to China. All right. Mr. Woods? I'm not aware of that number. I think it's a very small one, but we can follow up with you. Mr. Give Sheffield? A very small number. Mr. Ms. Watkins? I don't have the number, but I can also follow up with you with it. Well, this is very important to know because we're looking for solutions. So one of the solutions may be to ban the export of our uh, petroleum products to countries that are a malign influence in the world. But that's not the real answer. The real answer, of course, is breaking this dependence and addiction on, on oil and gas. Uh, renewable energy right now is the cheapest form of energy, and it's getting cheaper every year. We've got to accelerate the transition to clean energy. It's more stable, it's more affordable, it's generated here at home. Uh, the House has passed legislation, it's being blocked largely by lobbyists aligned with the fossil fuel companies that would lower the cost of your gas bill, would lower your AC bills, would lower the cost of electric vehicles, and would provide, uh, I mean, this is a time we've got to provide relief to Americans and not double down on the same old wretched thing where we're addicted to oil and we can't get off. This is a time we must pivot, especially because the world's top scientists early this week said we are facing a future catastrophe and much higher cost than the pain we see at the pump right now unless we make this break right away. Our Time is urgent, and we have a moral obligation to our kids and future generations to give them a livable planet and a healthy economy where everyone can thrive, and that's what we must do. I yield back my time. Thank the General H. Her now recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. General Masters, I will have this uh, question, a couple of questions for you, and I've known you for 39 years now from uh, this summer. And so I followed your career the whole time since we, we first met at West Point. And I know you're an intellect, you're an academic, you're a straight shooter, and sometimes your straight shooting has taken you some lonely places. So we should find that your analysis and what you say to be very, very thought, thoughtful and something we should find very sobering. And in your testimony, you, you argue that energy security versus saving the planet is not a false choice. Um, energy security, including American independence, including fossil fuels, is not a false choice. In your book, Battlegrounds, which I read when it first came out, you talk a lot about climate change and it's important to address climate change. You absolutely do not dismiss it. So would you expand upon the question that energy security versus saving the planet is not a false, or is a false choice? Thank you, Congressman Guthrie. And thank you for, you know, for your service and, and those fond memories from many years ago at West Point. I really believe it's a false choice. The problem is, Congressman Guthrie, I think what we've been doing is pursuing non-solutions, and we can't afford to pursue non-solutions anymore. And what I mean is, is this idea that we can have an energy transition that all of a sudden moves ex fr from, you know, from uh, fossil fuels directly to renewables with, without a bridge in place. And of course, this is where the U.S. can play such an important role by providing the bridge associated with natural gas and the displacement of coal in particular. If we want to save the planet, we have to get off of coal for energy generation. That was 
was the largest reduction in CO2 emissions ever in the history of the world is what we did in the United States associated with the opportunity presented by, by, uh, by cheap natural gas. It's extremely important to recognize that whatever we come up with, whatever exquisite solution we come up with to, to, to CO2 emissions and climate change, it has to be applicable in developing economies because they just won't do it. They're not going to compromise economic growth and moving people out of poverty for some exquisite solution that isn't consistent with what the market will bear. So affordable renewables, yes, huge part of it. But also a big part of it is relatively inexpensive natural gas, which we can get to with increased production and export. And then finally, it's 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 uh, emerging capabilities like next generation nuclear, which can be combined with hydrogen to meet so much of this demand and to do it at a zero emissions level. So it's a combination, Congressman. And, and what's sad about it is uh, we continue to pursue these non-solutions and get the opposite effect of what we desire. For example, burning coal exports going up, CO2 emissions going up in large measure because of our pursuit of these non-solutions. Thanks. I want to ask you another question. Um, talking about, you said in renewables, we're still going to be dependent on supply chains in foreign countries. It's reportedly that we left $3 trillion in critical minerals in Afghanistan. We left them uh, in the hands of the Taliban and their new friends, the Chinese. Would you comment on, on that? Congressman, the competition with China occurs in places outside of the Indo-Pacific region. And in this case, you're pointing out how important South Asia is. But I would say it cuts across the Middle East. It cuts across Africa. And it's really important for us to recognize the importance now of resilient supply chains, especially those associated with, with renewable energy and energy transition. You know, of course, an electric car, I don't know how many magnets, I forget, is, is an electric car, but it's a lot. And then, of course, battery manufacturing, magnet manufacturing, uh, the, the whole upstream supply uh, associated with rare earths and other critical minerals and the separation from ore, all of that has to be resilient. And the only way we're going to get there is with onshoring and nearshoring. And that's really, I think, has to be a major focus of this committee and the Congress as well as the Biden administration. Okay, I want to ask you one more thing. You, 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 in, your, in your written statement, you argue that OPEC isn't expanding their production when President Biden has put down a request because they're concerned with his dealing with Iran and the Iran deal. Would you comment on that as well? And also what happened, what's going on in Yemen? Would you comment on that as well? Well, it, it is it is our what I would characterize as a nonsensical Mideast policy that has alienated what could be key partners in the Gulf region. And this is in foremost among them, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And what they're upset about is is a very weak, another weak Iran nuclear deal that would essentially just give the theocratic dictatorships in Iran cover for continuing their nuclear and their missile programs, which are a grave threat to all of them in the region and obviously a grave threat to Israel. Uh, and, and then also a failure to to, re, to designate or taken off the designation from the Houthis in Yemen as a terrorist organization, even as they're firing rockets you know, in, into the Emirates and, and into the into the into Saudi Arabia. So we, we asked them for cooperation, but of course they're not giving it to us because they're angry with us. And I think in, in some cases, you know, rightfully so, because of uh, of of a unwise approach to the Middle East and to Iran. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, Chair. Now recognizes Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, let me just say up front, um, put my cards on the table, I don't trust you. I don't mean that in the sense that I question your personal integrity. I don't. But I recognize your role. Your role is to lead large for-profit corporations that are looking to maximize the return to your shareholders. So when I say I don't trust you, what I mean is I don't trust you not to take advantage of this situation to try to meet that goal. I think that there's clearly an opportunity to profit from this crisis that's occurred in Ukraine from the disruption to the global uh, supply chain of oil and gas, and it's an opportunity that you're seizing on. Again, I, I understand why 
you want to satisfy your, your shareholders. I won't speak to what it means for your executive compensation, but that's your impulse. And earlier we saw a pretty revealing chart that Congresswoman DeGette laid out where she conceded, obviously, that the price of crude oil had spiked uh, when the invasion occurred, initially the disruption, and predictably the price at the gas pump went up as well, but then she showed how the, the price of crude is coming down, but the, the prices at, at the pump have not come down. So I think what that reflects is this ability to kind of manipulate the situation. Your industry can say, well, we expect that the crude oil price may go up, so you can anticipate that by charging more to the retailers. And then if the price comes down, you can say, well, it's, it's coming down, crude's coming down, it's gonna take a few days before that can be passed along, or maybe we can't pass it along yet because we think the price may go up again. You've got a lot of latitude to manipulate and take advantage of the situation in ways that will boost your profits. And sometimes it's legitimate to use phrases like there are a variety of factors in the marketplace. Uh, prices move up and down every day. That's the industry, I understand that. But sometimes that can just be a good way to cover up what is a effort to, um, or an opportunity to price gouge. The fact of the matter is that your customers, not just the generic consumer at the, at the pump, these are your customers. These are your red-blooded, patriotic American customers, many of whom, when interviewed, are saying, we're willing to take a hit. We're willing to pay a little bit more to try to address this invasion. So they're stepping up. So if you realize savings, don't you think it's the patriotic thing to do to pass that savings along? Let me, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Lawler. If, if, if BP America is realizing savings because the price of crude is going down now, so you're saving money on that end, isn't it the patriotic thing to do to pass that savings along to your customers at the pump. So Congressman, as I had shared before, we sell our crude oil into a market and it's a competitive market and we sell all of our refined products into a competitive market and we buy feed stocks for our refineries in a competitive market. And it is not something that BP controls. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Worth, I'm gonna see if I can get a better answer from you. You have costs, the costs go up, costs go down. If the price of crude is going down, that represents a savings to your operation, does it not? Yes, sir. Uh, if the price of crude goes down, that reduces the cost of inputs to our refineries, that is correct. Savings. Is it the patriotic thing to do when that happens, as it has happened based on what Congresswoman DeGette showed us earlier, is it the patriotic, corporately responsible thing to do to pass those savings along to your customers at the pump? Congressman, no single company controls prices. I know, in the I got market. it. I, my time's out. Um, there's a lot of hocus pocus language you can throw up here. I think you need to pass savings along when you realize them. You have done that recently. That can benefit the consumer again your loyal, devoted customer at the pump. Gentlemen's and I yield back. time's expired. Mr. Bilirakis, you're recognized for five Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again to the witnesses for coming to testify at this very important uh, hearing. Uh, some of my Democratic colleagues have for weeks, and especially during this hearing, lambasted uh, American oil and gas companies for high prices at the pump and attempted to deflect criticism from the President for his rhetoric 
and policies that have clearly sought to defer, to deter and reduce domestic oil and gas production. My Republican colleagues have talked about the negative impact that has had, it has had domestically because of the President's Green New Deal policies, and that's what they are. I want to highlight the Biden administration uh, that it isn't, uh, in other words, is it jeopardizing the United States energy independence and security? I think it is. It's actively intervening to stop foreign uh, fossil fuel projects that empower our allies and reduce Europe's dependence on Russian energy. And I'll give you an example. I'm talking about the Biden administration's recent reversal of the East Med pipeline, which would have delivered natural gas from Greece, Israel, and Cyprus to the southeast to southeastern Europe. Makes sense. The parts of Europe most dependent on Russia. And I'll add that the president in 2014, when he was vice president, approved of this project. After establishment of U.S. support in 2019 for our allies' uh, energy independent and energy projects, specifically mentioning the pipeline, the Biden administration reversed course. Why? Contradicting U.S. policy and not following the law as outlined in a bill I co-led and most of us voted for that w was signed uh, into law, the Eastern Mediterranean Act of 2019. We're seeing what happens when Europe is energy insecure right now in Ukraine. Nobody can deny that. And even going back to 2006, the extended effect that uh, that's had on our own national security and that of our uh, NATO allies. Thank you for your service, uh, General McMaster, and I have a question for you. In your testimony, you talked about Putin's long history of trying to coerce its neighbors to extend Russia's influence. Could you please briefly describe the positive impact the East Med pipeline could have on reducing the energy dependence on southeastern Europe countries, uh, European countries, and hopefully preventing repeat, a repeat of what's uh, tragically happening in the Ukraine uh, in countries like Romania, Bulgaria, I could go on, Moldova, uh, let alone the NATO allies. If you could comment on that, uh, I would appreciate it, General. Thank you. Congressman, what you're highlighting is a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous opportunity for international investment in infrastructure. The current infrastructure that is giving Russia course of power has to be circumvented, and it has to be circumvented in a number of ways. From the Eastern Mediterranean is one, is one tremendous possibility, as well as the other infrastructure you see in southeastern Europe, such as Kuril Island, for example, as an import terminal. It's important to recognize that a lot of the infrastructure that Russia is using is old Soviet infrastructure. For, so, for, for example, in Ukraine, where they're concentrating the offensive now in the Donbass, that's the area in which about 90% of the energy infrastructure and potential in Ukraine lies. And that's not a coincidence. Ukraine is designed to export right, uh, energy, not, not receive energy imports. So these, these sorts of infrastructure investments are immensely important. And of course, people argue, well, it's going to take a long time. Well, it takes a much longer time if you never start. And so I, I think uh, in, in every crisis, we should look for an opportunity one of the opportunities here is, is renewed investment in energy infrastructure globally. You are general common sense. That's just talking about the pipeline from a national security perspective as well. From what I've been hearing, my colleagues across the aisle and the president of the United States don't seem to understand or willfully ignore that their actions not only affect current prices, but heavily influences decision-making focus in the future, like investments, of course, oil futures, and oil price contracting, all which feed back to the effect the current, uh, current and in, in future prices as well. So, uh, Mr. Worth, I know that Chevron, especially after your acquisition of Noble Energy, uh, have significant, uh, you have a significant presence and activity in the Eastern Mediterranean. Could you please describe the impact the administration's reversal on the East Med pipeline has not only on other public and private investments in natural gas projects in the region, but specifically the East Med pipeline, which is currently in the stage of seeking investments and evaluating viability. If you could answer that question, uh, I would appreciate it quickly. Uh, Congressman, I appreciate you raising this issue. It's an important one. The Eastern Mediterranean has 
uh, tremendous gas resources that currently serve only local and regional markets. We're working on a number of options to try to extend uh, that gas into other markets in Europe in particular. Uh, the Eastern Med Pipeline is one alternative. It's a complex, uh, costly alternative, but it's a real alternative. Uh, we're looking at liquefied natural gas, floating liquefied natural gas. Uh, we welcome dialogue with others that could help uh, mobilize the capital and infrastructure to get that gas to European markets. The gentleman's time you, has expired. Thank Chair you. now recognizes Mr. Welch for five minutes. Uh, thank you. A gentleman and woman, we have, uh, there's two issues here. One is a debate about long-term energy and how quickly, in my view, we need to transition to renewables. But there's another issue that is immediate, and that is the impact of the war in Ukraine, that brutal invasion that bloodthirsty Putin has inflicted on the people of Ukraine and how that has caused such disruption pain for consumers everywhere, from Eastern Europe to the United States. And the question that all of us have is, what can we do to support the people of Ukraine in their effort to survive? And what can we do to help citizens, everyday citizens who are living paycheck to paycheck to be able to uh, pay the bills that have escalated, particularly at the pump and for home heating oil? This is not for me a debate about long-term policy. I know we have disagreements here between me and my colleagues and perhaps me and some of you. I think we've got to get to clean energy as quickly as we possibly can. But here's what alarms me. In March 6th, 2020, just before we had to shut down as a result of COVID, US crude oil production was 13.1 million thousand barrels per day. A million barrels per day. Yeah, 30,000, thank you. On January 2022, it has declined to 11.4. So what we've seen in that time is production has gone down, prices have gone up, and what we have seen, particularly since February in the invasion, is that profits have exploded, dividends have been raised, executive compensation is up, and shareholder stock buybacks are up, 41 billion dollars. So the question I have, and I'll start uh, with Mr. Worth, is in the boardrooms, there can be a decision about the allocation of the resources of the company, putting it into production to bring it up to pre-pandemic levels, stock buybacks, and dividends. All of these have been increased. Has there ever been any discussion about lowering the price at the pump to help folks who are helping to bear the burden of the U.S. and our European ally support for the people of Ukraine? Congressman, I appreciate your, your concern. We share that concern for uh, Americans. I'm asking about your concern. I know your concern. I'll, I'll grant that. I'm, I'm asking specifically, is there any discussion about, hey, fellas, you know, maybe we ought to lighten up on the stock buybacks. Maybe we ought to lighten up on the dividends. And maybe we ought to lower the price at the pump. It'll be tough. It'll be less profit. But me, you know what? That might help the cause here. Has there been any discussion Mr. about that? Congressman, we have very lengthy discussions about capital allocation. Our production in 2021 was the highest in the history of our company, higher than it was pre-pandemic. Our capital spending this year is up 60% versus what it was just do, a year do, ago. Do you dispute my that figures? Is on American production. Do, you dis do you dispute my figures about the U.S. production is less now than it was before the pandemic? Congressman, we went through a tremendous uh, economic contraction during the pandemic. Uh, there was no need for more supply as supply was. That's uh, right. There was less. Than you know, th this is really pretty simple because you all have to make decisions and it gets all complicated and you've got your economic models, you've got your computer logarithms, whatever the you have, you have. But bottom line, you have a decision with the profit. You put it into stock buybacks, that helps shareholders. You put it into dividends, it helps shareholders. Or you put it into production and possibly under these extreme circumstances with a war, with people dying in Ukraine, you say, you know what? Maybe we'll lighten up a little bit on the stock buybacks. Maybe we'll lighten up a little bit on the dividends. And maybe we'll lighten up a little bit to help folks in Vermont who are getting hammered with the price at the pump. Is that a discussion? 
Congressman, it is a discussion. We're investing more capital to grow production. We are. We can do that and return value to shareholders. They're you not do, mutually exclusive. You We're do have both the, of them. It is a world market, and, and you. I agree with that. You don't have even the mining oil companies don't have total control over what the price is, but they do have control over how they allocate capital between increasing production, between profits, between stock buybacks, and between a dividends. I, I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to thank our panel, some of the biggest names in oil and gas for joining us today. And, and thank you all for what you do to keep the lights on, to power transportation and industry, to create thousands of consumer products and millions of jobs, and quite literally, to fuel modern life as we know it in America. You deserve praise for that. What you produce has lifted billions of people out of poverty around the world. But there's a problem. Many of you have big advertising budgets. Why won't you tell that story? I'm not going to name names, but we've all seen the TV commercials from Big Oil filled with solar panels, green climate messaging about how you're diversifying your portfolio, and how you're embracing liberal progressive values. What's been your return on investment with that effort? You've taken a shellacking today from the Democrats. Do they seem impressed by your efforts to show your allegiance to their anti-fossil fuel agenda? Do they give you any credit for your green overtures, your ESG commitments, or your carbon cutting plans? No, they do not. For heaven's sakes, they're blaming you for high gas prices, for inflation, for bad weather, and all the world's problems that their failed policies are actually causing. Your industry has a lot to be proud of, and Americans know it. You just have to help us tell them. But if you continue chasing these radical green progressive values, these moving goalposts over the real value that you bring to our country and the world, then the environmental left and the ESG investors will crush you and the millions of Americans that support, that need your support. So today I want to give you a platform, ladies and gentlemen. First, Mr. Sheffield, these are yes or no questions because I got a lot of them. Mr. Sheffield, Pioneer Resources, are you and your employees still proud of the oil and gas that you produce, knowing that it goes into so many essential products and industries? Yes, we are. Okay, sir. thank you very much. Mr. Muncrief, Devon Energy, or Devon Energy, if I got that right, are you proud of the great paying jobs you provide in America's oil and gas fields? Yes. The answer okay, is thank yes, you sir. very much. That's a big yes. Mr. Woods, ExxonMobil, are you proud that your company, one of the world's largest, provides resources that quite literally lift billions of people out of poverty globally? Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Worth from Chevron, are you proud that the jet fuel, diesel, and gasoline that you sell play such a vital role in Americans getting to their jobs, getting their jobs done, taking care of their families, and keeping our economy moving? I am absolutely proud of okay, our people. Okay, thank you. Ms. Watkins, Ms. Watkins from Shale, are you proud of your company's investments to export more clean, abundant American liquefied natural gas? And are you proud of the cracker plant at Monaca, Pennsylvania, that produces a raw material that goes into literally thousands of products that are needed in everyday life here in America. Are you, a pr are you proud that the gas that you produce, that our European friends and allies need so much right now that they are literally dying for? Are you proud that you produce that product? Yes, Congressman, I am. Thank you very much. Mr. Lawler from BP. Estimates say oil markets are going to be 3 million barrels a day short with Russian crude go, uh, coming off the market. But the world needs that 3 million barrels that the Russian market is going to collapse. Would you be willing to help make up that deficit, perhaps from American resources? Well, I can tell you, Congressman, we are focused on that. Okay, just this year. I, that's well, a yes. The same time I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, these are a few commercials that you folks could run. You've got a good story to tell. 
use these ideas to tell the American people the truth about what you do so that they can quit being misled by the, by the barrage of negative, disingenuous, false advertisement that you see coming from my Democrat colleagues today. I'm going to yield back a whole 18 seconds of my time, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. You see him on, online. Okay. Mr. Car if Mr. Cardenas is in here, chair now recognizes Mrs. Dingle for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for holding this hearing. Times are tough right now. Americans and my constituents are really feeling it in their wallets. Gasoline prices in Michigan have doubled to triple uh, in the last couple of years. This means families, as everybody's been talking about, are forced to cut costs while they, while they see the oil companies making record profits. I had a UAW worker who at Christmas time told me he couldn't go visit his family because he simply can't afford it anymore. Another worker who used to visit her mother every Sunday said it's really hurting her. So times like this underscore the importance of ramping up investments in domestic manufacturing of clean energy. And I'm going to say to my colleague, Mr. Johnson, look, I'm a car girl. I come from an industry that operates with the internal combustion engine. And yet global climate change is real. We're 30% responsible for carbon emissions, and we're coming together to work together, the OEMs, the workers, and the environmentalists, to try to get to the next generation. And that's what we're all talking about like this. We need to make this transformational shift to electrifying the transportation sector to reduce carbon emissions and our dependence on foreign energy sources while we're creating good paying American jobs and strengthening clean energy supply chains. The fact of the matter is, this is an economic and national security issue. I've heard each of you today point to, the, to thank you to our witnesses, but I, I've heard each of you today point to the complex global commodity market or describe your company simply as price takers. The way you talk about your business, it's as if you have no control over anything and that you're just helpless participants in the global market. But I'm not sure that's true. Your decisions on whether to increase, sustain, or decrease production affect the price per barrel. But isn't it true that your product is the majority of the price that someone is paying, that the customer is paying for the cost of gasoline? So if the price of your product, crude oil, is high, then the price of gasoline at the pump is high, correct? I'll quickly go down the line, just yes or no. Mr. Lawler? Uh, yes, the price of crude does impact uh, Just the price a yes of or gas. no, please. Mr. Worth? Yes. Mr. Moncrief? Yes. yes. Mr. Woods? Yes. Mr. Sheffield? Yes. Ms. Watkins? Yes. But looking back at this chart, the same doesn't see to apply on the downside. And that's why we want to understand this better, because the consumer isn't seeing the benefit at the pump. So what I want to understand is, is what it is that your companies can and should do, and what Congress can do to incentivize action so we can alleviate the pain at the pump for our constituents. Global demand has been rebounding for nearly a year and is projected to exceed 2019 levels by 200,000 barrels per day this year. The demand is there, but we still haven't reached pre-pandemic levels of production. And while I understand that you simply cannot flip a switch or turn on a spigot, you must be honest about the main reason that some companies are choosing to ramp up production slowly. A survey of oil company executives by the Dallas Federal Reserve found that nearly 60% of oil companies are restraining growth because of investor pressure. But that same survey also found that for large firms like the ones like you all sitting before us today, the price needed to turn a profit on a new well is somewhere around $50 a barrel on average, roughly half the current trading price per barrel. Mr. Moncrief, let's start with you. 
You stated on December 21st, 2021, Investor called that Devon can officially sustain production at an ultra low WTI break even funding level of about $30 a barrel. Is that still approximately your break even point? Yes, it is. It's uh, oh, slightly higher than that with the inflation we've seen, but it's pretty close, yes. Mr. Woods, on February 1st, 2022, you stated on a call with investors that Exxon's break-even price for a barrel of Brent crude is $41 per barrel and is expected to average $35 a barrel between now and 2027. Is that accurate? For the projects that we're developing, that's accurate. Mr. Lawler, the guidance that you gave investors for the second half of last year was that your break-even price was around $45 per barrel for oil. Is st that still your break-even point? That sounds about correct, yes. Mr. Wirth, your CFO told investors that your break-even was around $50 per barrel to cover capital expenditures and dividend. What is the break-even just to cover your costs without the dividend? Uh, our dividend, Congresswoman, is about $10 billion a year. That is um, divided by our production of about a billion dollars. Uh, it would be about $10 less than that. Ms. Watkins, your company's break-even is around $30 per barrel, correct? Yes. Mr. Sheffield, your break-even is around $30 as well, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, my friends, the price of oil today was $96.76 for WTI and $101.54 for Brent crude. Given those prices and break-even costs, it's no surprise the oil and gas industry is projected to collect a windfall of up to $126 billion in 2022 alone. And while you break even at as low $30 per hour and are selling right now well above $100, the oil industry is also taking billions of dollars of subsidies from the American taxpayer. Subsidies are meant for struggling industries that need taxpayer assistance to operate and remain afloat. With margins like this, it's not clear to me why you all are getting tax subsidies and taxpayers are paying for it at the pipe pump. So I'll leave it with that and yield back. Madam I thank Chair. the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Mr. Bouchon for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I just want to say this. I mean, we're in a free market economy with publicly held companies that millions and millions of Americans have as part of their portfolio in their retirement accounts. And so I think we need to remember that, um, you know, this is a free market economy. Um, and sometimes I think uh, some of my colleagues forget that. Uh, today, my constituents are paying record high gas prices. In Evansville last month, regular unleaded gas reached $4.25 a gallon, while diesel climbed over $5 a gallon. On, on average, gas prices in Indiana are over 45% higher than they were at this time last year. While Putin's invasion of the Ukraine has undoubtedly had an impact on these prices, Republican members of this committee have been sounding the alarm on rising fuel and energy costs for months. In fact, since January of uh, 2021, because that's when it really took off. Uh, we've been sounding the alarm on rising fuel and energy costs uh, well before the invasion of Ukraine. Yet today, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are calling on their, their usual game play when gas prices get too high. It's price gouging, let's get the FTC to investigate. Let's be clear, in my view, this isn't remotely close to the main culprit of why Hoosiers can't afford to fill up their cars. It's been the hostile policies of the Biden administration towards American energy producers that has helped to drive up prices during the past year. And instead of looking into how we can reverse course on these policies, again, we revert back to the FTC, which has never shown that price gouging is the main culprit for, for decades, every time it's been approached to study this. Not only are these misguided policies emptying out wallets of my constituents, they're also threatening our national security. As, you, as we should be learning from our European allies, those misguided energy policies have given significant leverage to Putin and we must prioritize our energy security as a matter of national security. 
And it just baffles me why the Biden administration continues to pursue policies that harm domestic energy producers, weaken the position of our allies, and ultimately plays into the hands of adversarial states around the world who seek to weaponize access to energy. We must get back to American energy dominance. General McMaster, you mentioned in your testimony that authoritarian governments use their power over energy supplies to coerce opponents. Uh, the Biden administration, uh, in my view, is playing right in to Russia and China's hands by pursuing restrictive energy policies and attempting to negotiate with dictators in Iran and Venezuela for oil rather than producing American energy and getting our country back to pre-Biden pre administration uh, energy dominance where we were net exporters of energy. And some of this may be ground that's been covered, but General, could you explain what is at stake if the United States were to continue down this road and become irreversibly dependent on, on, upon adversaries like China, Russia, and Iran to meet our energy needs. Congressman, thank you. Well, you know, we all live and learn. So I'm hoping that the Biden administration, all of us will learn from Russia's use of energy for coercive purposes. That we should learn, obviously, our lesson in terms of investing in our own production and export, which can help satisfy global demand and do so in a way that, that redounds to our, to our benefit in terms of security and prosperity and prosperity in the world broadly. But also, as you're, I think you're alluding to, the danger associated with becoming over-reliant on supply chains that go through China, especially those, in, those connected to, uh, to, to renewables. Uh, renewables associated with you know with solar and, and wind power and the hardware and equipment, but also you know the manufacturing of of electric cars and the, and the batteries that go into them and the magnets that go into them as well as the as well as the minerals and various materials. So I think it's it, and, and by the way the oil that goes into them in the form of plastics. I think mean, every every electric car is about one third uh, made out of petroleum products. So it's important for us I think to to recognize that we have an opportunity. And, you know, I, of course, I don't want to lay blame on anybody at this stage. As long as we learn our lesson and we change the policies, we relax the regulations and the permitting uh, and, and be able to take advantage of the great promise of, of our tremendous natural resources here and American innovation and ingenuity. Yeah, I mean, I'm particularly concerned about China's situation and their strong position in the renewables market, as you just mentioned, especially as... You know, we have a, a rush to green energy agenda while still discouraging mining of critical mineral, minerals and energy production in the United States. So, I mean, I think you did touch on this by pursuing this rush to green without shoring up domestic mining and processing capabilities, particularly for uh, our battery, battery situation. Are we simply going to create a dependency on China for renewables that will echo our dependency on Middle Eastern oil in the 1970s? Congressman, I think that's exactly the danger. There's been some good work done on this at the Hudson Institute by Dr. Nadia Shalou that I'd recommend that shows really how vulnerable we are to these supply chains that, that are that are vulnerable because they're overly dependent on, on China. Yeah. And I'm out of time, so I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. Yes, thank you. It's interesting that some people will say that we're rushing to green energy when it's been talked about seriously from the president's level to Congress and along all the analysts around the world for decades now. So all of a sudden it's a rush to energy. I find that quite interesting. Um, when it comes to clean energy today, the United States is the world's leading producer of both oil and uh, natural gas. And this has undoubtedly brought our country numerous economic benefits, including job creation opportunities and trade, greater global competitiveness. Uh, nonetheless, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shed a light on how interconnected we are globally. And I commend all the individuals in our country and corporations and, and heads of corporations uh, for uh, removing their operations and terminating their operations with Russia. And I think it's really important that everybody understands, of course, we stand with the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people and all peoples around the world who uh, have been invaded by other countries and who are being decimated uh, and atrocities occurring upon them. Uh, Mr. Moncrief, uh, prior to the crisis at the pump, how have you worked to advance the transition to clean energy uh, domestically? Thank you for that question. You know, our fundamental business is uh, producing crude oil and natural gas production. And uh, the best thing we can do is be a, a strong, healthy company. Uh, we continue to explore new ways in the energy uh, transition. Uh, we've, we've actually made some investments uh, along the lines of venture capital to, uh, to develop some uh, real-time emissions monitoring, uh, things like that. So. 
it's something we're continuing to uh, to look at, look for opportunities. The, the reality is, is, sir, that these are uh, these are very low low return uh, projects, and we have to be mindful of that after a decade of uh, challenging investments. Yes, th thank you, and 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 I understand that you have a legal and fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders first and foremost uh, as a C-suite executive. I understand that, and thank you for your frankness about talking about where profits uh, interject in your decisions on how much uh, clean energy investments your company is going to make. That's not a criticism. That's just, I think, an honest observation. Uh, Mr. Worth, as we work uh, towards meeting energy independence, we can't ignore the ongoing crisis that cl that is climate change, which we know is a serious threat to our planet, to our national security, economic prosperity, and the future of our people. On Monday, the United Nations Intergovernmental Planet uh, Panel on Climate Change uh, released a report on climate change that indicates that global emissions have never been higher and that we are on a pathway to more than doubling the 1.5 degree limit that was agreed upon in 2015 in the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, with the current emissions trajectory, scientists are forecasting extreme climate change, unprecedented disaster, and a world that is uninhabitable. Uh, as the U.S. shifts the increase of energy independence, how is clean energy being prioritized and what steps are you each taking to prioritize the transition to cleaner, more sustainable energy in order to address climate change uh, and reduce uh, GHG emissions? Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question and thank you uh, for your genuine uh, appreciation for the contributions that this industry makes to American competitiveness and, and our economy and the responsibilities the leaders of these companies do have. Uh, our strategy is to decarbonize our existing business by reducing the emissions intensity of the oil and gas that we produce and the world still consumes and continuing to reduce that uh, CO2 intensity over time while the world is using traditional sources of energy and then to invest in new lower carbon forms of energy at the same time. Our focus is in three areas, renewable fuels, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. In fact, this year, We'll spend nearly $4 billion on renewable fuels alone, uh, and we have uh, many, many projects that we're working on developing in the areas of hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and other technologies. Thank you. My time is limited, and, and I, I'd like to also point out that, uh, with all due respect, the $4 billion that you mentioned of the investment, that's good, uh, but yet at the same time, it was mentioned earlier that some of your earnings, quarterly earnings, are in upwards of $10 billion in one quarter. So again, it's all relative as well. And I heard earlier that it's about making sure that your bottom dollar is met as well. So maybe what we can see uh, to the to the biggest country in the world when it comes to producing oil and fossil fuel production, maybe we can get a little bit more aggressive and maybe be a better competitor to China so that those uh, economic forecasts don't play out that we're gonna end up at the, the behest of China in the future. We all have a part to play, American industry, is uh, at the pump every single day in front of our, our uh, folks, like in California, prices have hit above $5.90 per gallon, and we all have a role to play on making sure that we could do what we can to uh, uh, give some relief to the American consumer, the American families, and the American people. So with that, my time's expired. I yield back, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the title of this uh, hearing today attempts, I believe, to skirt blame away from what I hope we all know, uh, that despite recent statements, the Biden administration's policies have always and will continue to push us away from uh, energy security in favor of unrealistic climate goals. On his first day in office, President Biden issued an executive order revoking the cross-border permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. My colleagues have pointed out the long list of policies they have implemented since that time, whether it be the unrealistic CAFE standards, the recent SEC rules, or the ongoing threats to existing pipelines like Line 5 in Michigan. They all create an inhospitable environment for energy investment. Meanwhile, our constituents are suffering. Recently, a constituent wrote to me, not far from my personal home, saying that someone had drilled overnight a hole in their truck's gas tank and stole their gas. This is the environment that Biden inflation and President Biden's energy policies have created. It could get worse. Clearly, something needs to change. And so 
General McMaster, just a few months ago, sir, uh, there were reports that the Biden administration was actively exploring the possibility of terminating the Line 5 pipeline in Michigan, a U.S.-Canada pipeline which brings light crude oil and natural gas to Canada and our state and states across the Midwest. Doing so would cost thousands of jobs and further raise already record high costs for energy for Michiganders. General McMaster, what message does the Biden administration send both at home and abroad when they talk about closing cross-border pipelines? Congressman, I think the message is that we're continuing to pursue non-solutions. Non and I think this, this shows a, a high degree of strategic incompetence. It's important for us to reduce carbon emissions. It's important for us to, 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 to move rapidly toward renewables and, and, and zero emission sources of energy. But we have to also recognize the global energy demand is going to go up 45 percent, you know, by, by the middle of the century. So it's important for us to undertake a range of actions to ensure our energy security uh, and and uh, and to ensure the prosperity for future generations. And and you know, canceling pipelines again, this is a non-solution. It makes no sense, right? Because this is a way to move energy in a way that is much safer. It's more ecologically friendly. Uh, and and again, I think that there is a certain kind of ideology that drives a lot of this decision making, uh, and it reveals that that we're not d displaying the degree of competence necessary to address these interconnected problems of energy security, national security, and carbon emissions it, it, uh, it, reduction. It pushes back against uh, OPEC and Russia's control of the global energy market as well, doesn't it? Yes, it, it, it does, especially if these, if these pipelines can lead to export terminals that allow us then to alleviate the, you know, the, the, uh, the supply constraints on the, uh, on, in the global energy market. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Watkins, Mr. Woods, and Mr. Lawler, uh, Line 5 services some of your refineries, and I've been at some of those refineries. Closing the pipeline, Line 5 pipeline, would mean thousands of additional trucks on the road, rail cars, tankers on the tracks, going through our communities, creating safety hazards, and more emissions, actually, rather than a pipeline. Do you agree that pipelines are the safest and most efficient way to transport fuel, Ms. Watkins? Uh, yes, sir. I do believe that there are ways to transport fuel. Mr. Woods? Yes. Mr. Lawler? When properly maintained, absolutely. And that is key. Properly maintained in line five. In fact, it's more than properly maintained. They're attempting to dig a tunnel underneath the Great Lakes to totally encase it keep it protected from any type of damage to bring it across. And so the fact that we can't, and it would be great to have had our energy secretary here before we all talk today, so we could ask those questions in the context of what it's doing in your industry. I appreciate your answers, and with that, I yield back. now recognizes Ms. Kelly for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. I want to start by thanking General McMaster for his service to our country and for appearing as a witness today. However, my questions are directed at the oil company executives who are before us today because my constituents want to know why are they paying outrageous prices to fill their cars up they want to know why your companies who crude, whose crude oil makes up some 60% of the price of a gallon gasoline are not doing anything while prices at the pump are going through the roof. Now, you all have talked extensively about your companies and the global nature of oil prices that really aren't in your control. Certainly, I understand how, things, how there are things that can affect prices in ways that are out of your control. One of the things seems to be OPEC and OPEC+. Plus. Mr. Woods, can you or one of your colleagues explain how OPEC impacts prices on global markets? Well, as we've talked about today, uh, Congresswoman, uh, the main driver of price is the imbalance between supply and demand. And OPEC is a co uh, basically gets together and decides on production and therefore supply in the marketplace, which will then translate into that balance and then pricing. 
Thank you. So it sounds like OPEC sets targets for production that have an impact on price. They restrict output and prices climb. But I've also heard today how you and your companies are independently deciding not to invest in new supply or produce more in order to return value to the shareholder. So you don't control price, but you do manage or manipulate supply to restrict the amount of product on the market relative to rising demand we are experiencing. And you do that to create scarcity, which in turn dries up prices for that product. And of course, that's what creates value to the shareholder. So I guess my question for anyone that wants to take this, isn't that exactly what OPEC and its affiliates have been doing to the detriment of the American people and our economy since the oil shocks of the 1970s? How is your behavior any different than that of OPEC, if anyone wants to answer? Congresswoman, I would say that you've mischaracterized the approach that the industry takes in general, and specifically the approach that ExxonMobil has taken. In fact, what I would tell you from 2017 through 2021, we have been extremely committed on uh, impre improving our production, increasing supply, and making sure that energy remains uh, available and uh, affordable for people all around the world. In fact, we did the hard things. When, when we weren't making money, we continued to invest to make sure that the projects that were gonna be needed for additional supply were available and are now producing. And as a result of that, the production that we're gonna have this year is 25% higher than it was last year coming out of the permit, which was 25% higher than it was before. Our global liquids production, our oil production around the world is at the highest it will have been this year for 15 years. So I would tell you that the company, this company has been working to make sure that we are making the investments, and are thinking about the impact on people all around the world, including the consumers here who are struggling with high prices to make sure that products are available to meet their needs reliably. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're trying to do something, but again, more needs to be done. And the other thing is, if the, oil, if the price of oil is set by global markets, the American people want to know why we should continue to shower your incredibly profitable companies with special tax breaks and subsidies if you aren't working in the interest of American consumers. Oil companies like some of those testifying today get intangible drilling tax breaks, percentage depletion allowances, tax deductions for tertiary injectant expenses, tax credits for producing oil and gas from marginal wells, passive loss exceptions for working interests in oil and gas properties, tax deductions for income attrib attributable to domestic production activities for oil and gas, and uh, seven-year amortization periods for geological and geophysical expenditures. And this doesn't even complete the list. If these tax breaks are not being used to increase supply and lower prices for American consumers, then it's time to reconsider whether tax dollars should just be padding your company's profits. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Mr. Mullen for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I appreciate all the witnesses being here today and understand the uh, the difficulties that you face as a business. And so I kind of want to start with Mr. Uh, uh, Mangrief. Um, with the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, we saw the global demand for oil drop and the price plummet. We finally are seeing a demand rise to pre-pandemic levels. Can you explain the process of ramping up production um, to meet these needs? Yes, thanks uh, very much for that question, Congressman. Uh, the the, the uh, process of ramping up production is you need to go out and secure services. And you need to make sure you have uh, manpower. You need to make sure you have infrastructure and uh, all the permits. And uh, that is something that uh, here at Devon, we, we have been doing. So if you look at 2021, we averaged 14 rigs. As we said here uh, today, we're at 19 rigs. So we have been after ramping that up. Additional ramping takes a lot of considerations. Uh, and quite honestly, it's, uh, it's very challenging. You've heard some testimony today about the uh, shortage of manpower. It's, we have a tight labor, labor market. We also have tightness in rigs and services and supplies. So it's something that we uh, we really have to uh, uh, to think about. But for our company, uh, we're, we not only increased uh, activity, we're gonna be bringing on 300 new wells this year. And uh, that, uh, that'll that have a big implication as we go into not only the back half of 22, but 20, uh, 2023 as well. 
Thank you. Following uh, from day one, President Biden has been uh, very vocal about being anti-gas and anti-oil. What kind of signals does that send to the industry when um, when you're trying to plan your future for your company? Well, for us, it's uh, you know we we really need uh, we need to have have some dialogue, and that's that's what we've been asking for is uh, dialogue. Uh, for instance, uh, Congressman, in our with our company, about uh, 20 percent of our our uh, activity or our acreage, excuse me, is on uh, federal lands. However, 50 percent of our our uh, activity and capital budget is also on federal lands, and and the uh, production uh, is corresponding. So we're seeing some some ramping of production, uh, primarily in southeast New Mexico and Leonetti County, which is the most active two. Two counties, I believe, in the entire nation, and so we're seeing some uh, some good response there. But we really have to think about not just getting existing permits, but also or, or new permits uh, for the okay. drilling. But as we I talked about, it. we also need some additional permits, and so you have to think about Except right ways. You have to think about infrastructure build out, and you need to think about uh, uh, long haul pipes getting to the market. Thank you, sir. Uh, General McMaster, uh, many of our allies in Europe are reliant on energy from Russia. With Russia wa waging war on Ukraine, is it evident now more than ever that Europe needs energy from the United States? Would you agree that American energy independence creates global stabilization? Absolutely, Congressman. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, are, are there any geopolitical vulnerabilities for importing oil from Venezuela, Iran, and Russia? Absolutely, because we know that that it is the ATM of oil exports that allows those oppressive regimes to stay in power, to keep in place their criminalized patronage networks that, that make people in those countries reliant to them. And in the case of Iran in particular, it is the it is the revenue from oil exports that allows them to continue their four decade long proxy war against uh, the great Satan, us, uh, their Arab neighbors and against Israel. Thank you. And, and here inside the United States, the Biden administration is pushing us away from fossil fuels. Can you explain how this plays into the hands of, of communist China? Well, it, it plays in the, in the hands of China because we cannot meet global energy demands without the U.S. being really a major player in the global energy market in the area of hydrocarbons and I would say in natural gas in particular. But then, but then also it, it, trying to, to jump ahead to renewables before renewables are economically viable in terms of developing economies puts China in, in, a, in a position of, of control where China can restrict access uh, to renewable sources of energy and gain coercive power over us that is reminiscent of U.S. dependency on Middle Eastern oil in the 1970s. Which brings me back to my point that I like to bring up all the time uh, and something I said earlier that American energy independence brings global stabilization. Setting on HIPSI, uh, I have a uh, opportunity to visit with a lot of our, uh, our allies around the world and they will tell you the same thing. They would rather buy oil from a friendly country like ours than to be dependent on buying a country, uh, oil from a country they know would rather take them down than see them succeed. So once again, global um, a stabilization happens when we have energy uh, independence from America. With that, I'll yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. McEachin for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And I'd like to start off by uh, uh, disabusing the American public of, of some myths. A lot has been said about the Keystone Pipeline so far today. Um, but the reality is, is that the Keystone Pipeline would not be operational until at least next year. So the notion that somehow that's adversely affecting the price of oil uh, and the price of gas at the pump is to me to be somewhat uh, somewhat mystifying how someone can look at the American people in the eye and make that argument. And what's more, the Keystone XL was essentially a Canadian export pipeline designed to take Canadian oil to foreign markets. And Canadian officials have said just as much. But let me get to another myth that I think is going around the Capitol and perhaps through the American public. And that is this notion that if we declare a federal tax holiday, somehow the American people are gonna feel that in their pocketbook. And so I would like to ask each of the uh, major producers here, starting off, starting off with Mr. Lawler, if we uh, decide we're gonna suspend the federal gas tax, are you prepared to reduce the wholesale price of gasoline by that 18.3 cents, sir? 
So I, I can't commit to that today. Again, it's- uh, Okay, it's I appreciate that. I appreciate that. How about you, Mr. Rith? Congressman, uh, the way the market works, we collect that tax on behalf of the government and remit it to the government. So if that tax were suspended, we would no longer collect it and that would no longer be passed through to the marketplace. So your, your, your wholesale price of gasoline would be reduced by 18.3 cents? Uh, our wholesale, we, we, we add the tax onto our wholesale price of gasoline. If the tax were suspended, we would no longer add that on. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, how about uh, Mr. Woods with Exxon? Also, the wholesale gasoline market set by supply and demand levels, we don't actually set a price on that. So as Mr. Worth said, depending on how that market translated in the supply demand balance, that would set the price. So you're saying that the 18.3 cents that we charge for per gallon wouldn't uh, doesn't affect the price? Wouldn't would not be in the price. And that's not my question. If we declare a federal tax holiday, is your are your prices going to go down by 18.3 cents? We don't set the price in the commodity wholesale market for gasoline. That's set by supply and demand. We won't collect the tax, but then the market will set the price for the underlying fuel. All right, I appreciate that. And uh, let's see, Ms. Watkins, uh, how about Shell? What will Shell do if we uh, declare a federal tax holiday of 18.3 cents? Congressman, we're, we're in a similar situation. We will no longer collect the federal tax. Um, the, the price of gasoline will be set in the marketplace um, and it's, a, it's based on a supply and demand. So let me see if I've got this right. And either one of the four that just spoke can correct me, please. What you're saying is, is that supply and demand is setting the price of uh, wholesale gasoline, which obviously gets translated to retail and, and ultimately uh, to what uh, my constituents pay for gasoline. So the 18.3 cents that we charge for a federal tax holiday really isn't affecting anything other than you know the government's collecting some revenue. It's not affecting supply and demand. It's not affecting the price at the pump. Is that correct? Congressman, it's added to the price uh, at which the wholesale gasoline is sold on through the value chain. So if it's suspended, that, that component uh, leaves the equation. Uh, the rest of the dynamics remain in the marketplace as they, as they do every day. So there's no promise then that, that the price is going to go down by 18.3 cents, correct? Congressman, uh, it, it's impossible to predict how commodity markets will behave day to day. So All right, I appreciate, you know, I, I appreciate yeah. the candor. What I'm trying to do is disabuse the American public of this myth that if we do something uh, like a declare a federal tax holiday, uh, that, they're, that the price of gasoline will go down. We don't know what's going to happen to it, is what you all are saying, because you're saying that the mysteries of supply and demand and this and that could still have the wholesale price uh, go up or go sideways or go just about in any direction. Um, Madam Chair, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Let me just say this. I think our solution ultimately ought to be we just need to give direct payments to the American people while we're in this emergency so they have some extra money to pay for gasoline. That would be my solution. I've said as much on the record. I've said as much to leadership. I look forward to continuing this discussion, and I yield back the balance of my time and appreciate you allowing me to pass on yours. I thank the gentleman, and uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize Mr. Carter for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to wave on to this committee and thank all of the witnesses for being here. Gentlemen, what I have behind me, ladies and gentlemen, is, is a chart of receipts that I've asked constituents of my district to send in to us. What you'll see here, first of all, there's an $80 to fill up a tank, $80 receipt to fill up a tank in Brunswick, Georgia, $135 in Waycross, Georgia. One constituent pointed out that they spent $334 just last month on gas. And behind each of these receipts is a story. Sam from Ellabelle, he's having to cancel his Veterans Affairs appointment because he can't afford to get there. Kayla from Ware County summarized the pressure facing the working class Americans by saying, and I quote, I can't afford to go to work, but I also cannot afford not to go to work, unquote. We are forcing our seniors, our single parents, and our veterans to choose between groceries and gas, between a regular paycheck and regular fuel. It all comes down to the Biden administration's refusal to recognize reality and instead wage a war on fossil fuels. 
I, for one, do not believe any of these assertions that have been made here, that it is Putin's fault or that it is the big oil companies simply gouging the, the, the prices here. That is not what it is. This was happening before Vladimir Putin, his unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. It has happened since the policies of this administration started taking place. General McMaster, I want to ask you something. Ukraine, in the geographical area that they are in, they, they have the second biggest known gas reserves. They also have a lot of natural gas. In your written testimony, General McMaster, you said Russian military incursions have focused on the 10% of Ukrainian territory that is home to 90% of their energy. Look, Vladimir Putin is evil. He is the devil himself. However, he ain't dumb. He knows what he's doing here. General McMaster, I want to ask you, can you elaborate more on the notion that Russia is weaponizing energy against the free world? Congressman, of course, Putin's been engaged in this behavior for quite some time. He's weaponized energy against Moldova, against Bulgaria, against Romania, and, and of course, we see it against Ukraine and now against Europe broadly, and, and Germany in particular, to try to soften uh, our, our, you know, our weak and our resolve in connection with the response to this brutal invasion of Ukraine. And he wants more of it. He wants to gain more and more access to oil reserves, as you mentioned, in eastern Ukraine, where he's focusing this offensive and, and what one analyst has called a, the great Ukraine heist associated with what Russia is trying to do in the Donbass region uh, in, in particular. But he's done the same thing in Syria as well. You might remember in February of 2018, Russian mercenaries attacked U.S. supported Syrian Democratic forces in the Euphrates River Valley. They were going after the Conoco oil facility because Putin knew he didn't have the money he needed to help reconstruct the, the country he helped to rubble uh, in, in, in Syria. You see the same kind of adventurism in eastern Libya, for example, on the part of the Russians. So Putin's trying to gain more coercive power, not less, over the global economy uh, through his control of, of hydrocarbon exports and, and uh and, of course, it's in our interest to make sure he can't do that. Let me ask you this, General McMaster, because about a, during the time, the week of the invasion of Ukraine, I, along with two other members of this committee, uh, Representative Wahlberg and Representative Curtis, as members of the Conservative Climate Caucus, we were in Brussels. We were in Europe when this happened. And we were there to look at what Europe has been doing in the way of, of clean energy. And it became very obvious to us that Europe has jumped the gun too much and, and that they have, they, they have closed down, for instance, they, they've shut down some of their nuclear plants. And it, it, it's an important lesson, I think, for us to learn here in America would you say it's, it's realistic to imagine that Europe or the rest of the world could become energy independent of Russia on renewables alone in the very near future? No, that's impossible. And especially if you take nuclear out of the equation, which was what Germany did as well. I mean, sadly, my home state of California is about to do the same thing, to shut down a, a, a nuclear plant that now that, that now uh, is uh, it generates 10 percent of the state's electricity. It makes no sense at all to, to do that. And so and, what and we General need McMaster, is I'm sorry. Above approach. I'm sorry. One one final thing. The, the American oil industry, we could help with natural gas. Is that not true? We could help Europe here. That, that's that's absolutely correct. And, and of course, this is this is a solution that is important for energy security, but also it's an important solution because everybody's burning more coal as a result of the of the con constraints on the oil and gas market. So we we need to export more gas, not only because it makes sense in terms of economic sense and in, in terms of energy security, but it also makes sense in terms of uh, of climate and CO2 reductions and getting off of coal and bridging into cleaner forms of energy. And oh, by the way, natural gas here in America is cleaner than the Russian gas, correct? Absolutely. Senator Kramer and I penned a, 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 a long piece on this, a long essay on this, and, and, and maybe a policy solution that could help incentivize cleaner extraction and transport of, of natural gas, consistent with the way that we do it here in America. Good. Thank you, General McMaster. And I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Clark for five minutes. I thank the Chairwoman DeGette for convening this very critical oversight hearing on big oil um, and, and the gouging at, at the gas station. It, it, it's very clear uh, to 
to most Americans that big oil shameless profiteering uh, is taking place at the expense of the people and of our planet. At a time when democracy and democratic values are in threat, the people of Ukraine are being massacred and the American people are suffering due to a, a historic spike in gas prices emerging from a once in a century pandemic, your companies are making record profits. Nobody is more impacted by your actions than the low income and working class communities who spend the highest amount of their income on transportation and basic goods just to get by. These communities are suffering, long, were suffering long before this current crisis, and now they are crying out for our help. And what is your response? You're enriching your investors with stock buybacks and dividends and lining your own pockets with millions after millions in additional executive compensation. Many of my uh, Republican colleagues here in Congress, and I, I believe uh, your companies as well, are trying to take advantage of this moment as an excuse to push for more oil and gas permits and less environmental regulation. This is not the first time that you've done this. You say we need to drill our way out of this crisis. You say we need to hurry and approve more gas leases and more drilling permits and build more pipelines. But in fact, the very opposite is true. We've been trying to drill our way towards energy security for decades. We currently have more drilling permits and leases than your companies are even using. But no amount of drilling can change the fact that oil is an unstable global commodity that's completely out of our control. Today is Putin's illegal war that has shocked the market and initially sent prices soaring. Tomorrow, it will be something else. And no amount of drilling is going to change this basic underlying reality that oil and gas are finite resources in the marketplace that is largely controlled by dictators and autocrats. And let's also try to remember that the extraction and use of this fossil fuel is pushing our planet to the very brink of climate disaster and is already destroying the lives and livelihoods of people of color in black and brown communities across the globe. Now is not the time to drill more. Now is the time to finally wake up to the reality that the only way out of this crisis and, and all future oil crises is by investing in renewable energy and green en and a green energy workforce at the scale needed to achieve a clean energy sector by the year 2035. Today, we have the technology to combat the climate crisis, create high paying jobs and grow our economy all at once. The only thing we're lacking is federal action to seize this moment and chart a new and bold path forward. This is why I've introduced the American Renewable Energy Act with my friend and colleague, Congressman Peter Welch. And this is why we need to immediately renew negotiations for a climate-centered Build Back Better Act that will unleash a wave of green energy investment across our nation. Before my five minutes are up, I'd like to ask you each, each of our executives, a yes or no question. Number one, do you believe that we need a historic investment in renewable energy to combat the climate crisis and end our nation's reliance on fossil fuels? And do you believe that your company should play a key part in this transition? Don't all speak at once. Yeah, so Congressman, uh, this is Dave Lawler with BP. We do believe the transition is very important and we have moved forward. We have and a new purpose. So that's a yes, Mr. Are you saying that's a yes, Mr. Lawler? Yes, we're supportive. Very of well, Mr. Worth of Chevron. Congressman, I, I believe we should uh, look to technology, innovation, and. Is market. that a yes, sir, or is that a no? 
I believe technology innovation. Oh, so it's not a yes or a no. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Mr. Moncrief, is that a yes? Uh, is there a yes or a no? Well, we have a lot of challenges that we do, we okay. will address. I got uh, it. I got it. You're not ready to say a yes or a no. Ms. Mr. Clark, Ms. Clark, your your time has expired, and we're trying to get everybody to the floor to vote. Can we have the oh, rest, please, well. supplement? Well, let me thank you once again, Madam Chair, thank and you. I yield back. I apologize. Thank you. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, Americans know that they're paying more, much more, for gasoline today than they were at the end of the Trump administration. And they know why, because of the policies of the Biden administration. This hearing is a complete and total deflection by the Democrats to distract from the energy crisis that President Biden and congressional Democrats have created. And they're trying to find someone else to blame. Don't let them gaslight you. Record high gas prices don't just lay at the feet of Vladimir Putin or of oil and gas companies. Just look at the dichotomy of their statements from the fall of 2021 and their attempt to lay blame uh, here today. And I'm going to ask this article to be submitted for the record. But this is an article uh, dated April 5th, 2022. And um, it says that last autumn they were demanding, House Democrats were demanding, these same oil and gas companies produce less oil to reduce the global supply of crude. That was just last fall. During the October 28th hearing, California Representative Ro Khanna praised BP and Shell CEOs for pledging to reduce their oil production. Then he asked oil execs why they weren't doing the same, U.S. oil execs. He goes on to say that um, in his questioning, he said, do you commit to do anything matching European counterparts to bring the actual demand of oil production down? Democrats were wanting to bring oil production down, and now they're trying to blame someone else. Mr. Khanna, Representative Khanna goes on to say that uh, no, are you committed to lowering the production as the Paris Accords say yes or no? If progressives truly cared about climate, they would support more U.S. oil and gas production, which could replace supply from countries with lower environmental standards and higher emissions. In fact, California Representative Katie Porter illuminated um, this when she chided the CEOs for opposing Mr. Biden's halt on new oil and gas leases on federal land. You can't have it both ways, Democrats. You can't come in here and blame others for the rising prices of, of gasoline at the pump when last fall you were also blaming, uh, or, or at least um, uh, the dichotomy of that, of trying to get the oil and gas companies to produce less. So the day before Putin invaded Ukraine, gas prices were already up 55% from before the day Biden took office. Why? One reason was displayed by Representative Scalise a minute ago, the costly and burdensome regs that drive the cost of production up for oil and gas producers. In fact, he provided these regs that I'd like to submit for the record, Madam Chair. The regs that are driving the cost of production up for American producers. We saw what the President Biden, candidate President Biden said. I think Scalise talked about that, but let's just look at his FY 2022 budget. In developing the budget, consideration was given to advancing three key objectives, one of which was not funding work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels, including work that lowers the cost of production, lowers the cost of consumption, that means lowers the price at the pump for American families, or raises the revenues retained by producers of fossil fuels. That was in Joe Biden's 2022 budget. You know, America is blessed with abundant natural resources, but we're cursed with liberal politicians who are causing these problems and, uh, and causing American families to pay more at the pump. Crisis wasn't created by Vladimir Putin. He's just capitalizing on it. He's capitalizing on it because the Nord Stream 2 project was green-lighted by President Biden in January of last year. That money that Vladimir Putin sells to Europe, uh, oil and gas to European countries and sells natural gas and oil to the United States, pads his pocket, and helps pay for his imperialistic aims in Ukraine and elsewhere. He's one of the ri richest men in the world. So I hope that we'll just look at Germany. Germany should serve as a warning signal in the United States. They sold out to the radical environmental ideology and now face an energy crisis. They simultaneously phased out nuclear power and coal and now import more than half of their natural gas from Gazprom and other Russian companies. 
They shut down uh, 14 of their 17 nuclear plants. Instead of prioritizing clean burning nuclear energy, Germany made a policy decision to heavily subsidize volatile and intermittent renewables. Now they're going back and buying more coal and more coal plants are coming online. It's a, a hypocrisy of pushing climate change initiatives and being held out in the world as being a leader in renewables that all of a sudden they say, well, we need power, so we're gonna burn coal. If you truly were believers, which I don't think they are, they, are, they have been at the mercy of Vladimir Putin turning the spigot on and off. You know, you just can't have it both ways. You can't encourage lower production and then try to blame somebody when the prices go up. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Gentlelady from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair DeGette, for calling this important meeting, hearing, and also to the witnesses for your testimony today. We've heard repeatedly, Americans are paying for gasoline prices higher than they ever have before. And it truly underscores the imperative for our country to be energy independent. In my state, the average cost of a gallon of gasoline is hovering above $4, uh, which might not seem like a lot to some, but it was $2.70 a, a year ago. And this spike is directly impacting Delawareans. I've heard from retirees on fixed incomes, veterans, and parents who are struggling to pay soaring gas prices. One constituent wrote me that the cost actually went up by 20% a gallon while he was standing at the pump. We've seen President Biden take action. We've seen many states, including Delaware state lawmakers and Governor Carney working on legislation to alleviate some of this burden. And Delaware leaders are planning to give $300 in direct payments to taxpayers to provide some economic relief as Delawareans continue to struggle with rising prices at the pump. Throughout the hearing, we've heard of, from members of Congress with solutions, but I wanna talk to you about the solutions um, that you are focused on and that we can tackle together. We know that gas prices are complex and that the lingering economic impacts of the pandemic, global markets, and Putin's unprovoked war are all factors into the cost, but people are hurting. They wanna understand what's happening, why it's happening, and how we're gonna tackle it. They're seeing oil companies rake in record profits and wanna understand where all the money is going and why with these record profits, they are paying so much at the pump. Oil companies felt the pain of the COVID pandemic uh, and as, as they saw their demand for gas evaporate. And then the CARES Act provided generous bailouts to the oil and gas industry. And now as prices continue to soar, it's time for the industry to step up and help the American people. We need to work together to create more financially secure future for all Americans. We've heard a lot today about the sacrifices that Americans are making. And I'd like to hear about the sacrifices your companies are making now. And I wanna be clear that I'm asking this and I'm gonna just submit the questions for the record in the interest of time, because in reading your testimonies, many of you talk about the things that you've supported in the past and the things that you're gonna do in the future, but people are hurting right now and I'd like to hear from each of you your commitment. So I will submit that, Madam Chairwoman, for the record. Um, but specifically, Mr. Moncrief, in a recent interview, you highlighted your promise to be more disciplined to get cash back to shareholders with dividends. And you ask yourself the question is uh, whether you're going to keep your promise or whether you're going to be patriotic. Mr. Moncrief, is your company willing to forgo getting cash back to shareholders in order to ease the burden Americans are feeling at the pump? Congresswoman, thank you for that question. You know, over the last decade, our company spent 110% of its cash flow, operating cash flow. We took on debt and still uh, issued new shares. Uh, that put us in a position to be where we are today, to be a healthy, healthy company. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are increasing our uh, production. We're adding, uh, we've added, uh, we've gone from 14 rigs to 19 rigs. We're going to have 300 new wells added uh, this year. So uh, we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing a lot. And we, we also are going to take care of our shareholders. And those are the shareholders that have stuck with us uh, all, all these years and when we weren't profitable. And uh, we, we are finally turning a profit, and so we are not going to forget them. As far as the patriotism, 
you'd be hard hard uh, pressed to find a more patriotic industry, I think, than uh, United States uh, oil and gas companies. As a follow-up, given Putin's tragic invasion of Ukraine, do you still believe that returning cash to shareholders is your top priority? We have several priorities, and returning cash to our shareholders are absolutely one of our top priorities, yes. Okay, you answered the question. In your testimony, you state that even with constraints, uh, Devon's net domestic oil production reached a new record high. You also noted that both supply chain issues and a shortage of workers are preventing you from additional drilling, but your company has also stated that it works to maintain a low investment ratio. Is this approach preventing you from increasing production capacity? No, I think the uh, the most uh, important thing for us as far as additional capacity. It's just a yes or no, because I'm running out of time. I ran out of time. So, excuse me, then. Can you repeat the question the way you had it framed? We'll send, submit it for the record. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership. And um, I thank you for the focus on our constituents uh, as well as the consumers. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The chair will announce there are two votes on the floor at this moment. And so we're going to be in recess, but for 10 minutes.
to walk out and do the job.
I'd like to call this meeting um, back to order. And now I would like to recognize the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for her five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to the people testifying today. Um, on this chart, hopefully we'll wait for the camera to zoom in a little bit. But on this chart, it clearly shows how the prices for gasoline have gone up ever since President Biden took office and the Democrats took control uh, of both the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate. And, you know, in Arizona, prices are even higher than this. Gasoline prices in the Arizona are $4.65 a gallon on average. In fact, Arizona has one of the highest, or the highest inflation rate in the entire uh, country. And so, General McMaster, I have a question for you. Do you think it's a coincidence that gas prices started down here uh, when, after Trump left office, and they have continually gone up, and even though the strategic oil reserves through the war in Ukraine, and now they are way up here. Do you think that's a coincidence, or do you think it's partially, at least, because of the Biden and Democrat policies and their war against American oil and gas? Congresswoman, it's not a coincidence. As you alluded to, there are a number of factors at play, but it's not a coincidence. Well, I totally agree with you. And uh, that's why I call on President Biden and my Democratic colleagues to increase production of American oil and gas. Um, I also think it's real interesting that Biden, uh, when asked, one of his answers to the high price of gas was, well, buy an electric car. Buy an electric car. Well, first of all, electric cars are very expensive. And so not everybody can afford one, but electric cars and renewable energy require a lot of critical minerals. And a lot of those critical minerals are actually processed in China. And so, for instance, wind, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, they all require critical uh, materials. Electric cars require four times the amount of copper than do a standard car. Yet, President Biden has closed down mines. There's a mine in Arizona called Resolution Copper Mine. Uh, under the Trump administration, it was given the green light to go ahead and continue mining. When Biden was in office, after two months, he closed it down, couldn't mine. I went to visit there, and that mine would produce 25% of all of the copper that is consumed in the United States, including for electric vehicles. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the policies that President Biden and the Democrats have are hurting America, and they are causing the prices to go up. Um, the other thing that I find very interesting is recently I uh, was able to speak to uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo. He was at a meeting and he expressed how whenever he went to meetings with foreign countries, he would use U.S. energy dominance and U.S. energy as a negotiating tool when dealing with foreign countries. General McMaster, do you believe that the Biden and Democrats' war against U.S. oil and gas and their war on U.S. domestic mining hurts our national security? Congressman, we have to do everything we can to increase energy security and, as you already mentioned, to make up you know, for the, the complacency in the area of, of mining and access to minerals that are critical to the emerging global economy and the energy transition. So uh, I, 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 I agree with your broad point that we're behind and we have to make up for lost ground, much of it's self-inflicted. And I totally agree with you, General McMasters, and let's hope the American people will realize that the Democrat policies 
are hurting America and they're hurting Americans' pocketbook. And with that, I yield back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Barragan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for holding this important hearing to hold the fossil fuel executives accountable for taking advantage of a war to pad their profits at the expense of the American people. Mr. Worth, public information shows that your compensation went from $29 million in 2020 to 33, uh, rather, to 33 million in 2021. Is that accurate? Does that sound accurate? Uh, the years are not accurate, the numbers. Okay, you went, but you got an increase of about $4 million. Does that sound about right? No, my pay went down in 2021, ma'am. Okay, do you have any idea what that was? Uh, that will be released in our proxy statement. Okay. Uh, any so we have some information that's publicly available that, that shows you made $29 million in 2020, $33 million in 2021. Mr. Wood at Exxon, um, the public information that I have shows that you went from $16 million in 2020 and $23.5 million in 2021. Um, BP executive looks like uh, your, your uh, pay doubled to, in 2021. And the Shell CEO made a 25% increase from 2020 to 2021. Why is this important? Because the American people are not getting a $4 million raise. They're not having their pay doubled. And what is happening is they are feeling the pinch. They are feeling the pressure at the gas pump. And they are asking, why is gas so high? And that is what this hearing is about today. It's about asking what is going on. Big oil is lining their pockets with one hand and taking billions in taxpayer subsidies with the other, while the American people are getting ripped off as these companies choose to keep production low so their profits can remain high. And people are hurting. And that's what they want an answer to. Mr. Sheffield, on a yes or no, do higher oil prices mean higher dividends for your shareholders? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Moncrief. Is that also true for, for yeah. you? Do you agree with yes. that? Yes. And do both of your companies off offer variable dividends? For those watching, that means um, your payment to the shareholder goes up when earnings are high and then goes down when earnings are low? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to enter into the record an article on variable dividends from Barron's Magazine, a financial magazine titled Energy Dividend Trend is Catching On. Not everyone's on board. The article covers how oil companies use a variable dividend to pay back more to their shareholders when oil prices are high and less when they're low. This article goes on to highlight your company's bragging about rapidly rising dividends as profits come in from increased prices. Now, a dividend of windfall profits to your investors tied to the price of oil leaves a lot of room for exploitation. Every company here is doing this in their own way. Stock buybacks, CEO raises, dividends, all of you are taking advantage of an oil subsidy. And you benefited in different ways from the CARES Act. This was the first coronavirus relief bill passed to help communities respond to the pandemic. For example, Devon Energy received $105 million from the CARES Act's tax benefit. Fossil fuel companies received tens of billions of dollars in subsidized loans and tax write-offs during the COVID relief period. And now that times are good for you, there's no return to the taxpayer. Instead, Americans are getting gouged at the pump. We need a dividend for the American people. That's why I, su I support the windfalls profit tax Big Oil's windfall profit tax to send Big Oil's windfall directly back to the American people through a quarterly dividend. Congress took this step in 1980 in response to the OPEC oil embargo. We should do it again to provide relief to the American people. What's happening to them is not right. And we need you to do your part in making sure that we're helping the American people. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Pence for five minutes.
Thank you, Chairwoman DeGuetta and Ranking Member Griffin for allowing me to join this meeting today and thank you for the witnesses for being here. Petroleum is the lifeblood of our economy. Let me say that again. Petroleum is the lifeblood of our economy. Today, this hearing is an attempt by the Biden administration and the Democrats to help the Chinese bleed us out of energy independence. With a background in the petroleum distribution business, I can tell you firsthand that the misleading title of today's hearing does not reflect the reality of the domestic oil markets. As the National Director of Fuels for Circle K, I knew what the price of petroleum products from wholesale to retail were based on a variety of factors across the value chain, as our witnesses have discussed today. Wrongly accusing oil companies of price gouging is only meant to cover up this administration's own anti-fossil fuel agenda, as my peers on this side of the aisle have pointed out numerous times today. At every turn, the Biden administration and my friends across the aisle want to make it harder to produce, distribute, and use fossil fuel for their Chinese electrification agenda. For the Hoosiers watching at home, that means higher gas prices, higher utility bills, and less energy security. The situation in Ukraine tragically has compounded the president's energy crisis, but make no mistake, this, pro this problem started long before March of 2022. House Democrats have been pushing a complex equation for a green economy that's totally unattainable. Can't get it done when they want to get it done. That's why they build back better uh, backed off. This administration has been creating regulatory uncertainty and investor pressures on financing fossil fuel projects that have squeezed oil companies, fueling the volatile energy markets we see today. The president needs to reverse course and put our country back on a path towards long-term, durable energy independence. By accusing the oil companies of price gouging now, it'll only be a matter of time Listen up, America, until the argument is pushed to the healthcare industry, the manufacturing sector, farmers, and the rest of the economy. They want everybody to be accused of price gouging to cover up their inflation. Price gouging can't be a catch-all response to inflation and an overwhelmingly regulatory environment that just keeps piling up every single day. The only answer coming from this administration has been a misguided use of our strategic petroleum reserve to lower gas prices, and of course this hearing. But looking at the past two emergency uh, uh, strategic petroleum re reserve releases, we fail to see meaningful effects of the pump for my Hoosiers in my district. General Masters, what is the purpose of the SPRO? Sorry, sorry, I have to unmute. The purpose of what, Congressman? I'm sorry. The what purpose is of what? the pur purpose of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Well, it is, it is obviously it is it is, a, it is a reserve that is meant mainly for wartime and to ensure that uh, you know, that if there is an interruption in, in supply, that that we can compensate for that and and uh, and that we won't entail national security risk associated with okay. the supply constraint Thank associated with petroleum. Thank you, General. You and I both know that the President's uh, release wasn't announced in response to a supply disruption or, or a war. Yet we're going to go down to 40 percent of what's in there. Uh, the average price was uh, below $30, and now I, I guess they're going to replace it around 100 bucks. If we're serious about lowering prices at the pump, would we be relying on the SPRO to stabilize energy markets and lower prices? Does that help releasing releasing that uh, a million barrels a day? You know, I, I defer to the other witnesses on this, but I, I would just say that it has a lot to do with obviously okay. supply uh, and, and the ability Mr. to Worth, increase can supply. You, yeah, Mr. Thank Worth, you. can you comment on my question? Is this going to affect lowering right. prices and stabilizing markets? Congressman, in the short term, it can send a signal that suggests there is more supply available. It's not a long-term solution 
to the challenger. Thank you, sir. It doesn't seem to be doing that. Three weeks ago, the price was uh, uh, about the same as it is today. So thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, record oil profits, add them all up, we see record prices at the pump for so many Americans. But especially with record profits and record prices, Americans are understandably angry. Of course, our Republican colleagues talk a big game, but fail to admit their role in this. The Republicans screwed up the pandemic response. COVID ran rampant. The economy cratered, and demand and production for oil nosedived and it still hasn't recovered. Add in the cozy relationship of some House Republicans with Russia voting against military aid for Ukraine, voting against sanctions, and the conclusion is clear. Our Republican colleagues share plenty of blame here today. But when oil prices were down because of COVID-19, the federal government came to your aid with the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, with tax relief, and subsidies, many of which were supported by bipartisan majorities here. Now we get back to normal with the pandemic and supply chains are improving, but slowly. And as to the war in Ukraine, we stand steadfast with Ukrainians against this violent Russian invasion. This also makes it take some time. Yet in the face of these challenges, in the time of our greatest need, what did our oil companies do? Did you increase supply to keep prices affordable? Did you step up for us, for your country, for the American people? No. You kept production nearly the same and watched record profits roll in. I get it, you had a bad 2020 and you tried to make it up in 2021. We're in 2022. There should be no more excuses for record profits that are made on the misery of our nation. Record profits for executive salaries, bonuses, and fancy offices. Record profits for the sake of your investors. You can see it right here in this chart. Meanwhile, in Central Florida, families suffer. Let me make it clear. We stand on the side of the American people. The irony is this greed may be your undoing. Because of you, Americans get it. They understand we need to transition to electric cars as soon as possible. They think about it every time they see a Tesla an electric F-150 or a Chevy Volt driving down I-4. They think, why am I still paying for gas? This is why the Senate must pass the $500 billion climate change investments that this House already passed earlier this year. But in the short term, turning back to oil itself, it's at 103 today in the US per barrel. Back on March 1st, we saw when oil prices were around 100 bucks, gas prices were $3.60 to $3.70 in Central Florida. I had my staff check today. In Kissimmee, gas is at $4.11, 40 to 50 cents higher than it was when gas was around this level just a few months ago. During World War II, your company stepped up. From 1940 to 1945, overall U.S. oil production increased by 30%. President Biden has done his part by ordering a release of 1 million gallons, excuse me, barrels per day for the next six months. So my question to all of you is, will you step up? Will you increase production and commit to increasing production and for how much during April? So first, Mr. Woods, thank you for being here. Will you commit to increasing production during April and for how much are you willing to commit? We are producing uh, production, increasing production. In fact, we started that effort uh, several years ago and continued our investments through the pandemic when we were losing money, and that investment's now beginning to pay off. Thank you, Mr. Permian Woods. production will grow by 25 percent. My, my timing's limited. We appreciate you all stepping up. Uh, Ms. Watkins, does Shell USA also commit to stepping up production in April to help meet this challenge our nation faces? As a matter of fact, we brought on stream uh, in the Gulf of Mexico a, a new field about a week or 10 days ago, uh, which will produce about 20,000 barrels a day more. And uh, this morning we announced another uh, new well coming on stream um, that will produce about 10,000 barrels a day. So we are in the process of bringing on new production. Thank you. Um, Mr. Worth, 
Will Chevron step up to help our nation and increase production over the course of April? Congr Congressman, uh, I know with irony that less than six months ago, I was asked to pledge to reduce production, and I resisted that request and pledged to increase production. And I reiterate that pledge today. We will increase our production. Thank you. My time has expired. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Crenshaw for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed watching my Democrat colleagues convulse dramatically between two opposing stances. Drill more, drill less, drill more, drill less. Mr. Worth, you surely remember in October of last year when you were asked repeatedly by Democrats to commit to less drilling and less production. You remember that, yes? Congressman, I remember it well. So today we've seen the same contradicting messages uh, as one would expect, and we wonder how on earth did we get to this point where there's such a clear mismatch between supply and demand and very clear underinvestment in oil and gas production. And what a mystery this is. What could have possibly caused this? Stopping federal leases? No. Delaying or outright canceling pipeline permits? No, impossible. <laughs> or the president literally promising he would end the industry, and we wonder why capital isn't just sprinting toward oil and gas exploration and production. Analysts say we need an additional oil and gas investment of $225 billion globally by 2030 if we are to avoid an energy crisis. Let me remind you, people die from lack of energy and in large numbers. And I hope all that green compassion I always hear about has some answers for that. And so the question is, how do we create the conditions so that your investors change their minds and actually wanna spend this additional money None of your companies are on track right now to make up that $225 billion. Why not? Many reasons. But I want to talk about the cost of capital and the influence of ESG. President Biden is hiking up the cost of capital, weaponizing banking rules like reversing the fair access rule, doubling down on guidance that would make it more costly to be a bank that lends to fossil fuel industries. Democrats over at Financial Services are helping them, proposing to charge banks a surcharge for lending to companies like yours. Then you have the deliberate actions for Democrats that help activist ESG investors, a SEC that puts its thumbs on the scales to promote investments in unreliable green energy instead of reliable oil and gas. This is the same SEC who's aiding activist investors who want to use the proxy advisory process to force companies out of oil and gas. Folks over at Exxon know what that's all about. So my question, I want to start with uh, Mr. Sheffield. This weaponization of the financial industry has had and will have an impact on investment in more oil production. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, in the past and in the future. Mr. Lawler, same question. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I, I think just from, from uh, what I can gather from the markets at this point, BP has not had any issues uh, tracking capital and maintains a low cost of capital going forward. All right, Mr. Worth, same question. Congressman, there are uh, no shortage of efforts underway that appear to be intended to constrain access to capital for this industry. I appreciate that. And I want to make some other points here. Let's get some facts straight because the future depends on us getting this right. We can continue down this renewables only path and keep watching our prices skyrocket while also failing to meet demand and also doing next to nothing to reduce emissions. Or we can deal with some hard facts and the facts are this. American oil and gas production is cleaner than OPEC's, it's cleaner than Russia's, by a lot. The fact is that global energy demand will increase by 50% by 2050, and oil and gas is still expected to make up the lion's share of the production. You cannot change these facts. The fact is that renewables will never meet that demand, never. To meet the renewables-only climate goals, you'd have to mine lithium 2,000% more. You'd have to mine indium 8,000% more. Cobalt production will need to grow 300 to 800% more. For a wind farm to produce the same amount of energy as a nuclear plant, you need 100 times more land, you need 30,000 tons of iron ore, 50,000 tons of concrete, and 900 tons of plastic blades that cannot be recycled. That is not green, and by the way, it also doesn't work when the wind stops blowing. And here's the most important fact. If American natural gas quadrupled in the next decade in exports, which is entirely possible according to industry experts, we would do something amazing. We would displace coal around the world. Here's another fact. About half of global emissions are from foreign coal. Displace that coal with cleaner gas and you reduce emissions 60%. And wow, just like that, you solve the energy crisis. And by the way, reduced emissions far, far more than the foolish $10 trillion Green New Deal ever could. And by the way, to our witnesses, thank you for being here, taking abuse. But that's the argument you should be making. 
Instead of behaving like you have Stockholm Syndrome, like your civility to the radical environmentalists in Congress and this administration will one day get them to like you. They will never like you. Please stand up for your work, your employees, and your consumers. Speak the truth. Don't pander to what they want on the left. Because Americans need you and billions around the world who want to rise out of poverty and live a life of prosperity need you. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Craig for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman DeGette and Chairman Pallone for this hearing today. So uh, let me get this straight. The six oil companies testifying at today's hearings collectively generated more than $76 billion in profit in 2021, and first quarter numbers look even higher for 2022. In the meantime, Minnesota families are paying near record high prices at the pump, and my Republican colleagues are howling about energy independence when your industry has 9,000 oil leases given to you by the government that you aren't currently using. This is another dumbfounding day in Washington, truly. I don't fault you for making money. You're a business. But we've got a pandemic, and we've got Putin, and you are using these crises to gouge the American people. You are using these crises to gouge my constituents. Experts are predicting tens of billions of dollars in profit yet again this year for all of you. And that's on the backs of my constituents. We all know that the price of crude oil has dropped in recent weeks, and yet Minnesotans have seen very little relief at the pump. In fact, one of the only forms of relief right now from near record high gas prices that my constituents have seen has come in the form of renewable biofuels. Right now at fuel stations across my district, the blend of ethanol and gasoline, known as E15 or unleaded 88, is saving my constituents as much as 50 cents per gallon compared with traditional gasoline. We could replace every barrel of oil from Russia today with renewable fuels. Which begs the question, with those record profits and a history of touting your desire to increase investments in renewable fuels, are you investing in strategies to reduce costs for consumers, like efforts to increase the availability of E15? I'd like to turn to Mr. Worth first for my question. Mr. Worth, I'd like to better understand your company's commitment to renewable fuels. Given your record profits, how much is your company investing in biofuels research and development and expanded deployment? Congressman, I don't have a research and development number, but I can tell you in terms of deployment, this year we will spend close to $4 billion. We're uh, growing our renewable natural gas business, renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel, bio biodiesel, and uh, are working with companies like Bungie to uh, integrate back into the agricultural feedstock chain to grow our renewable fuels business. Thank you. I'll have my team follow up to make sure we're aware of all of those efforts and uh, we can learn more about uh, the percentage of research you're putting into biofuels to drive down the cost of fuel for Minnesotans. So thank you, Mr. Worth. I want to now turn specifically to E15. It was recently reported that BP began offering the 15% ethanol blends at terminals in eight states, including Minnesota. This will not only save consumers money, but it also will increase energy security and reduce carbon emissions with a domestically produced product. Mr. Lawler, I appreciate this business decision from BP and hope that others in the industry will follow suit. Unfortunately, due to a court case brought by refiners, consumers across the country will lose access to lower costs from E15 without an emergency waiver from the Biden administration or immediate action. So, um, Mr. Lawyer, uh, Lawler, let's start with you. I'll give you each about 10 seconds, but uh, I want to ask you specifically, do each of you and please, yes or no, do you support an emergency waiver for E15, year-round sales? Do you support a permanent resolution to the E15 RVP issue so that this lower-cost, lower-carbon, renewable fuel blend can be available to consumers year-round? So, yes or no, Mr. Watkins? Excuse me, Ms. Watkins. 
Um, I would need to understand the specifics of what you're talking about, but what I can tell you is that we're investing actually quite a bit of money um, in biofuels in particular, um, renewable natural gas, um, biodiesel, Ms. biofuels. Ms. Watkins, I appreciate that. It was a yes or no answer. Mr. Woods, do you support E15 year round? There are challenges with E15 going into the entire uh, car okay. fleet. Okay, Mr. So Worth, do you support E15 carefully. year round? Subject to safety considerations with older vehicles, uh, we blend uh, ethanol at the maximum uh, allowable limits into all of our fuel cells. Mr. Moncrief, you're around? I actually don't know enough about that issue to really comment. Oh, wow. Well, you're all investing in biofuels. I can see that here today. Mr. Sheffield? We do not own retail. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, my time is up, so uh, I will yield, and thank you for your time. Thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the ever-patient Mr. Armstrong, who's been sitting here all day for five minutes. Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. Let's be clear what the title of this hearing should be. It should be called Gaslighting Americans About Gas Prices. In July of 2019, when asked if there would be a place for fossil fuels in his administration, candidate Re Biden responded, no, we would make sure it's eliminated. In January of 2020, when asked about stopping new pipeline infrastructure, candidate Biden responded, yes, yes. In February of 2020, candidate Biden stated, we are going to get rid of fossil fuels. In March of 2020, candidate Biden said no more drilling on federal lands, no more drilling, including offshore, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period, ends. In October of 2020, candidate Biden stated it has to be released, replaced by renewables over time. In October of 2020, candidate Biden said no fracking and or oil on federal land. And in order to prove that his words were not just campaign rhetoric, on the day of his inauguration, President Biden killed the Keystone XL pipeline and halted oil and gas leasing on federal lands. And in February of 2021, President Biden inflated the social cost of carbon to justify more regulations of fossil fuel production. On March 2nd of 2021, Democrats, including some on this committee, introduced a bill to increase the cost and time of oil and gas production on federal land. And on March 19th of 2021, Democrats introduced a bill to place an excise tax on American energy companies to produce oil and gas. April 1st of 2021, Democrats proposed a national carbon tax on oil, gas, and their byproducts. And on June 1st, 2021, President Biden proposed a budget that would increase taxes on U.S. energy producers by at least $35 billion. August 11th, 2021, President Biden asked foreign operators in OPEC, not domestic producers, to increase supply to, to address rising gas prices. On October 29th of 2021, President Biden and congressional Democrats, again, some on this very committee, proposed a methane tax on U.S. oil and gas production. November 17th, 2021, President Biden tried to redirect the blame from rising gas prices by requesting that the FTC investigate oil and gas companies on trumped up accusations of illegal activity. On February 17th of 2022, President Biden's FERC chairman pushed through changes, making it next to impossible to build or upgrade pipeline infrastructure by requiring both upstream and downstream carbon mitigation plans before permits would be approved. On March 12th of 2022, Democrats who seemingly missed the president's memo requesting energy companies increase production introduced a bill that would implement a massive new tax, destroying any incentive for U.S. producers to produce more oil. And on March 21st, 2022, the SEC, in an attempt to morph into the Securities and Environment Commission, issued a proposal that would target carbon energy companies and empower activist shareholders. March 28th of 2022, President Biden, in the middle of an energy crisis, once again proposed a tax, to inc uh, tax increase on domestic oil and gas producers totaling nearly or $45 billion. And just last week, in the middle of all of this, asking for more investment in this industry, the FDIC chairman proclaimed that carbon-emitting sources of energy present risks to the safety of the financial system further starving off capital to a domestic energy production that is needed. In short, 
This administration and Democrats in Congress have done everything they can to disrupt, delay, and defeat domestic energy production, and then gaslight the American public by blaming producers for not immediately investing billions of dollars into the industry in which you are trying to destroy. So I have a couple questions for Mr. McMasters, and then I will end. Mr. McMasters, do you think our allies in Europe would like cheap, affordable American energy during what is going on right now? Absolutely. Do you know of any way to do, do you know of any way to export export renewable energy? Yes, I mean they're they're they're, I mean the the, the actual you know and of course you guys know that I'm I'm an advisor to Sempra Energy, which which has LNG uh, export capacity. But I mean, really, it is LNG exports that allows us to escape this dilemma of energy security or CO2 reductions and allows us to make up you know, for the gaps in energy supply uh, that, that uh, Russia is using for coercive purposes. I agree with you and on LNG. I agree with you on LNG. Let me be more clear. Do you know of any way to, renew or to export either wind or solar energy? No, 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 not on wind or solar, but it, it, you know the question is going to be battery capacity, the ability to store it, and there are some there are some you know advanced ideas out there about using cables that could go across the oceans and so forth, uh, but those are very much very far into the future. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Fletcher for uh, uh, five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman DeGette and Chairman Pallone for allowing me to wave on and participate in today's hearing. We are nearing the end of a very long day, and I want to thank our witnesses for your time and your insights during today's hearing. Uh, as the Chairwoman noted, this is an investigatory and oversight hearing, not a legislative hearing. And we are here today because people across the country are feeling pain at the pump, and we, are, we want to help. Right? We're looking for ways to help to ease the pain that inflation at the pump and elsewhere is causing for the people we represent. These are serious challenges for our people, for our economy, and for our policymaking. And that's why I'm so disappointed that so much of the questioning we've heard today has centered around scoring political points and blaming others, rather than taking a serious look at the challenges we face and their drivers, as well as how we can actually address them. Um, our energy ecosystem in this country and around the world is complex, um, as are the challenges that are presented in this moment. How we find our energy sources, extract them, move them, refine them into fuels and petrochemicals, and deliver them to consumers at home and around the world is vast, varied, and complicated. And in my district in Houston, we are involved in every single aspect of that work. And we are proud to do it. We supply energy to the world. For us, that means working collaboratively to partner with the people who produce energy, including our witnesses today, and with policymakers everywhere in charting a path for our energy future that understands the very real challenges of today, from supply issues driving up prices to climate change threatening our communities, to create a lower carbon future. I hope everyone here heard that from our witnesses today. In the five minutes I have, I can't possibly respond to everything that's been said here today that I disagree with, but there are things worth remembering as we move forward. Less than three years ago, at the end of 2019, the United States hit a new domestic production peak, just under 13 million barrels a day. More than 800 rigs were operating here in the United States. When the pandemic hit, demand for oil and gas collapsed under unprecedented demand destruction. And I cannot overstate the shock that we felt at home seeing oil trade for less than zero dollars a barrel. By the summer of 2020, only about 200 drilling rigs were active. Production dropped nearly 3 million barrels a day. In the US, more than 120,000 people, many of them in Texas, lost their jobs. Contrary to what we've heard from our friends on the other side of the aisle, our current rig count is not simply the result of some policy change from the Biden administration and Democrats. The rig count in the U.S. today is up to 673. That's up 243 from this time last year. Likewise, my colleagues know that I've been unequivocal in my support of the importance of new pipeline construction for energy infrastructure, but the claims many have made here today that President Biden caused these high prices by revoking the permit for the Keystone Pipeline are simply not true. The current crisis has its roots in a lack of upstream inventory, not a lack of transportation from inadequate pipeline infrastructure and bottlenecks getting to refiners. 
the oil that Keystone would have transported is still making its way onto the market through other transportation methods. My colleagues know that I haven't always agreed with the administration's policy decisions in this area, but when it comes to upstream production, the Biden administration has approved 34% more federal drilling permits in its first year than the Trump administration did. 900 more permits to drill than the Trump administration over its same period. And the Department of Interior approved 97% of all applications to drill submitted to the Bureau of Land Management in fiscal year 2021. On another note, there's not a meaningful connection between leasing sales and prices at the pump today. We heard as much from industry reps in a recent hearing before the Senate, Commerce, uh, Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. And finally, we've heard a lot today about the record $76 billion in profits that these companies have made in the last year, the record loss of $77 billion that these companies posted the year before in 2020, which some of the witnesses mentioned should not be discounted, as some of my colleagues have suggested nor should the more than 100 oil and gas companies, both E&P and oil field services providers that declared bankruptcy in 2020. It wasn't just 2020, it was 2014 and 2015 and 1982 in Houston, we have lived through it all, the boom and the bust. That is why we know that we need sound, forward-looking, durable energy policy that will help make more stable and predictable for businesses and consumers alike. We've heard today global demand for crude tops 100 million barrels a day. Questions about how we're going to meet this moment have caused the price to skyrocket. Recovery from the pandemic isn't the only driver, nor is this only a domestic issue. As we know, other factors in influence supply, including the decision to ban Russian crude oil after Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war in Ukraine. In this moment, President Biden and the administration are using the levers we have to confront the crisis head on. The release from the SPR of 180 million barrels will help close the inventory gap. The federal government should be using every tool we have to address this crisis, and we should do it all the time. It is worth noting that in 2020, I introduced a bill with Mr. Armstrong to purchase oil for the SPR when it was under $40 a barrel. Senator Schumer bragged about keeping it out of the CARES Act, calling it a bailout. But if we had these reserves today, our country would be in a much better position. As policymakers, we need to take energy policy seriously and stop using it as a political weapon. The stakes are simply too high. Gentlelady's time's expired. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back. Thank you. Well, we're coming into the home stretch now. People will be pleased to hear. And I'd like to recognize the ranking member if he has any final questions or thoughts. The words and deeds of the White House have exposed a fundamental misunderstanding of the operations of an industry it seeks to dissolve. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Biden stressed the short-term need to increase oil and natural, natural gas output and expedite LNG project development. The oil and gas industry does not operate well on short-term proposals. Due to the nature of the industry, companies like the ones before us today need long-term certainty. A temporary green light to produce oil from the Biden administration will not undo the layers of red tape and aggressive anti-fossil fuel policies driving gas prices to new highs. While President Biden should have been working to encourage domestic energy production, he went to OPEC to ask for more oil. Since that failed, the administration is reportedly considering lifting sanctions so the anti-American regimes in Iran and Venezuela can increase production. It has become painfully clear that President Biden's anti-American energy policies embolden Putin. <laughs> President Biden's rush to green agenda involves a whole of government approach that advises multiple federal agencies to play some part in making it more difficult for oil and gas production. For example, the administration has pressured companies to halt investments in fossil fuels. There is no denying the fact that the Biden administration has promoted an increasingly complex and challenging regulatory environment for energy companies. Mr. Sheffield, your company is the largest oil producer in Texas. You only operate on private land. You don't refine and you don't retail your product. But from your observations, what policies should the U.S. consider to truly unleash domestic oil and gas production. Uh, but Congressman, as I said in my end of my testimony, I wish both parties would come together in a bipartisan effort to look at alternative energy, nuclear, and more pipelines, more LNG plants. Uh, we need a combination of all the above. They're all long-term solutions. They are not short-term solutions. General, 
what are your thoughts? What do we need to do to get this, this ball rolling to truly unleash domestic oil and gas production in the United States? Well, I, th I think it was, it was some of the, the, the uh, fellow witnesses in the beginning just talked about an all of the above approach, right? There is no silver bullet solution to energy security and the interconnected problems that we've been talking about. The, cr the critical aspect of this is to, is to do all of the above, invest in renewables and so forth, but also to unleash the tremendous power that we have here to meet our own demands, but also to help meet the global demand and reduce the course of power of authoritarian regimes. I appreciate that. Madam Chair, we heard uh, from uh, Mr. Crenshaw earlier when he went through all the different things that would have to be mined around the world to continue to produce and continue to go in the direction of green energy. We need to do more with green energy, but we need to do it in the United States. And to do that, both for oil, gas, coal, nuclear, and for renewables, we need to make sure that if we're going to have the products to be able to do it in the United States, we need a better, a certain, regulatory scheme that lets companies know they can invest here in the United States for all of the above energy. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And I really do want to thank all of the witnesses for appearing today. Next time, we hope we will see you in, in person. I, I think that the ranking members' comments and, and Mr. Sheffield, what you said in, in general, it, it kind of shows what's been going on in this committee because we had a robust discussion about the different views of members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, about long-term energy policy. Okay, clearly we need a long-term energy policy. In fact, for some years, Mr. McKinley and I introduced legislation to come up with a long-term energy policy. From my perspective, what we need, and I think actually most of our witnesses would agree with this, we need a long-term energy policy that moves towards clean energy that will keep us independent from foreign oil. And, and that's what we need to do. But you know something? When my constituents went to get gas in their cars today, they paid $3.95 a gallon. And nationally, they're paying $4.16 a gallon. So we can have all the discussion we want about should we have increased leases, should we have more pipelines, should we eliminate regulations, those doggone regulations. But you know something, as all of our witnesses said today in their written testimony and some of them verbally, all those things aren't going to solve the problem that my constituents are paying $3.95 a gallon. And so what we're seeing today in a snapshot while we debate the esoterics of long-term energy policy, we're seeing production at existing wells going down, even though demand has gone up since the pandemic receded. We've seen profits exploding. We've seen shareholder buybacks up by 41%. M Mr. Welch asked the question, did any of you, any of your companies, talk about reducing these buybacks by even a little bit to reduce the price at the pump. Nobody had a response. And, and we heard Ms. Fletcher talk about the fact that we could increase output right now without all of these issues about wells and, and regulations and pipelines. We have the capacity right now. The reason why your companies aren't doing it, as, as you freely and honestly admitted, is because you're looking at your shareholder profits. BP in 2021, 12.8 billion. Chevron in 2021, 15.6 billion. Exxon, 23 billion. Shell, 20.1 billion. Devon, 2.8 billion. And Pioneer, 2.1 billion. So at the very beginning in my questions, I asked everybody, I told everybody, I was going to ask the question what can your company do? to help my constituents, Mr. Griffith's constituents, and all of our constituents be able to have the price of gas at the pump go down. And none of you could answer that question now. I said I was going to ask that question again, but I realized it's just going to be the same thing. None of you actually want to commit to going back to your boards and your shareholders and saying, you know, along with everybody else, along with many other major corporations, 
we are going to take a hit to our profits for now to help reduce the price of gas at the pump. So I'm going to ask all of you, do that. Go back and have that conversation. Do it tonight or tomorrow. Because in the meantime, everybody else is making sacrifices, but your profits continue to skyrocket. And so I want to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by witnesses who have appeared before the subcommittee. I ask that the witnesses agree to respond promptly to the questions if you receive them, including the questions I just asked. There are several documents that we would like to put in the record, and with, at, with unanimous consent, I would request it. Mr. Duncan requested a number of regulations and agency actions related to American energy, and Ms. Barragon requested an article from Barron's re regarding variable dividends published November 3rd, 2021. And without objection, these documents will be entered. And with that, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you.